Good morning, Quang An. Good morning. This is Fung, Vietnamese interpreter. Can you hear me well? I sure can. Thank you. Have a great meeting. Thank you. You too. Good morning, Megan. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Roger. Hi, Wanda. Have a great meeting. Good morning, Martha. Good morning. Sorry, I got my tech all mixed up today. Good morning, Rhonda. No worries. Have a great meeting. Good morning. This is the clerk. The meeting is now live on the meeting portal on YouTube. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. Okay.
Good morning, Rosario. Good morning, Rona. Have a great meeting. Thank you, you too. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Kavita. Good morning. Can you hear me? I sure can. Have a great meeting. Thank you. you Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a wonderful meeting. Thank you. Good morning, John. Good morning, Rhonda. Can you hear me? I sure can. Have a wonderful meeting. Thank you. You too.
Good morning, Supervisor Ellenberg and President Wasserman. Vice President Ellenberg and President Wasserman. Good morning, Rhonda. How are you today? Wonderful, thanks. You guys have a wonderful meeting. Thank you very much. Good morning, Sheriff Smith. Good morning, Eureka and Pond. Good morning. Uh, good morning, this is Lori Smith. Good morning, have a great meeting. Good morning, Supervisor Chavez. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Good morning, Supervisor Simidian. And Rhonda, it looks like we have everybody. Yes, sir. It does look like we have all five supervisors. All right, everybody. Let's begin our March 9th Board of Supervisor meeting. And welcome, everyone. I look forward to a great meeting. Rhonda, would you please take a roll call? I'm going to turn that over to your clerk, Nancy. Nancy, would you please take a roll call? Thank you. Good morning. Yes. Supervisor Lee. Present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. I'm here as well. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank now we're going to we have, have the Pledge quorum. of Allegiance. All of those that are able to please stand and do our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And my apologies, Supervisor Ellenberg, I had my notes right here to call on you to uh, start our pledge off. And we'll get that right next time. All right, we're now going to move on to invocations. It's my honor today to be able to give the invocation to this meeting. And I'm going to tell you about our invocator, Janice Lobo Sipigo. She's a daughter of immigrants from the Philippines. She is the author of two books of poetry, Microchips for Millions and Like a Solid to a Shadow. She was named one of San Francisco Bay Area's Women to Watch in 2017 by KQED Arts. She is a Vona Voice and Kundiman Poetry Fellow. She earned a Master of Fine Arts degree in writing from the California Institute of the Arts, Cal Arts, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Ethnic Studies with honors and a minor in Urban Studies and Planning from the University of California. Oh, University of California, San Diego, excuse me. 
She is currently an assistant professor of English at Skyline College in San Bruno, California. The 2021 Santa Clara County Poet Laureate, which is perhaps the most important thing on your entire resume, <laughs> and a Poet Laureate Fellow with the Academy of American Poets. Janice is going to recite Home by Warsan Shire. Janice, welcome, and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to President Wasserman for inviting me, and thank you to Stacey Greenwell for organizing my reading. Uh, today, I will be reading a poem by Warsan Shire, who is the former Young People's Poet Laureate of London. Um, this poem is for International Women's Day. It was yesterday, and it's not just a day of celebration, but for over a century, it's been a day to claim social, political, economic rights for women. And this poem um, troubles notions of home and what it means for women around the world to experience their homes. Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you. The boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind an old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one would leave home unless home chased you fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought about doing. And so when you did, you carried the anthem under your breath waiting until the airport toilet to tear up the passport and swallow each mouthful of paper, making it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Who would choose to spend days and nights in the stomach of a truck unless the miles traveled meant something more than the journey? No one would choose to crawl under fences be beaten until your shadow leaves you, raped then drowned, forced to the bottom of the boat because you're darker, be sold, starved, shot at the border like a sick animal, be pitied, lose your name, lose your family, make a refugee camp, a home for a year or two or 10, stripped and searched, find prison everywhere. And if you survive, and if you are greeted on the other side with sayings like, go home, Refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, dark with their hands out, smell strange, savage. Look what they've done to their countries. What will they do to ours? The dirty looks in the street are softer than a limb torn off. The indignity of everyday life more tender than 14 men who look like your father. For now, forget about pride. Your survival is more important. I want to go home but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home tells you to leave what you could not behind even if it was human. No one leaves home until home is a damp voice in your ear saying, run now, I don't know what I've become. Thank you everyone for listening and may we all become brave enough to do what unsettles us for greater change. Thank you. That was magnificent. I Thank you. you. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. We now move on to item number four, which is going to be announcement of adjournments in memoriam. And I would ask anyone wishing to speak on public comment today to please register between now and then. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn things over first to Supervisor Chavez and then to Supervisor Smitty. Thank you very much. Um, I am really honored to get to adjourn um, in honor of Gemma Abel's uh, today. She passed on December 12th, uh, 2020. Gemma was the youngest of four children born September 14th, 1967 in Lewisburg, West Virginia. After getting her master's of arts and English degree from the University of Dayton and her master's of arts and education degree from the Ohio State University, Gemma moved to the Bay Area where she has worked as a public school educator for over 25 years. 
She started her career in the classroom in Morgan Hill, teaching English at Martin Murphy Middle School and later an English teacher at Live Oak School. Teaching was Gemma's passion and her students were her inspiration. As a fierce advocate for public education, she guided and inspired students to become informed citizens and revolutionaries. She also worked as a mentor for new teachers. Gemma eventually moved on from the classroom and took up the torch as a labor leader and community activist. She was elected president of the Morgan Hill Federation of Teachers and served until her illness forced her to retire last year. She also served as first vice president of the executive board of the South Bay Labor Council, working with other unionists to advocate for workers' rights. Gemma dedicated herself to being a social justice activist and advocate. She was elected a California Federation of Teachers vice president and served as on their racial equity task force. In 2016, Gemma was a co-recipient of the California Federation of Teachers Women in Education Award for her work to promote public education. She was also active in causes such as uh, showing up for racial justice, the fight for 15, and working with Camp Everytown. She was often handed a bullhorn at rallies, eager to speak truth to power. Gemma's favorite simple pleasure in life was curling up with a good book and her dog, Lily, and reading for hours. She loved to write, and she participated in San Jose Area Writing Project. Throughout her life, she turned exercise into keeping herself in balance. She ran the Big Sur International Marathon and several Silicon Valley turkey trots and the Teal Run to benefit ovarian cancer research. Even after surgery, chemotherapy treatments, she diligently went to the gym for kickboxing classes and workouts. And of course, she loved to go for long walks with Lily. Gemma was a diehard fan of The Boss and as a fifth grade uh, memori memorized all the lyrics from The Darkness on the Edge of Town and Born to Run. It is truly a comfort, this is her notes from her family, it's truly a comfort to us that Gemma's beautiful spirit and accomplishments are remembered by those she touched. She was a dedicated labor leader and community activist and committed to public education. But last but certainly not least, she was a wonderful friend and sister. She was an incredible force for good and justice in our county and in our world. I want to say a very special thank you to Gemma's family for letting us close in honor of, of their sister and brother-in-law and, uh, and auntie. I want to thank her sisters, Katrina and Maria, brother-in-law, Bill, brother-in-laws, uh, Tim and Bill, beloved niece, Emma, and certainly but not least, Lily, who's better known as the Union Dog. Thank you for letting us recognize her today. And she has already been deeply missed and will continue to be deeply missed. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and colleagues. It's, um, it's my privilege today to ask our board to adjourn in honor and memory of uh, a really extraordinary woman uh, named Crystal Gamage. And uh, you may not know uh, of Crystal. She um, focused um, much of her good work uh, on Palo Alto, her longtime hometown. But let me just tell you that when uh, we say of someone they have lived a full life, uh, that doesn't begin to do justice to the full life of Crystal Gamage. Uh, Crystal passed away last month at the age of 101 years old. Uh, uh, she um, celebrated her 100th birthday by going to the gym, uh, which um, is a, a sort of a no surprise if you know uh, Crystal's uh, life story. She grew up in Chicago in the 20s and 30s, uh, was uh, clearly an extraordinary young woman even uh, in, in uh, her school days, uh, ended up uh, being the valedictorian, uh, was uh, an alternate to the uh, Olympic swimming team, uh, was a statewide uh, champion in uh, fencing, uh, and uh, went off to college where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, ended up moving to Palo Alto in 1944 uh, with her husband, Walt, uh, who was a sports writer and editor for what was then the Palo Alto Times. Uh, and there really, uh, it sounds an overstatement, but there really wasn't a community building activity, exercise, or organization that didn't benefit from Crystal's hand. Uh, whether it was um, 
the Historical Association or the League of Women Voters or AAUW or the Senior Coordinating Council uh, or the La Comida uh, program for uh, nutritious meals uh, for uh, commu older community members. Uh, she founded Friends of the Library, as I recall. She worked in the United Way. Uh, and what uh, happened along the way was that people said uh, time and time again, Crystal, why don't you be the chair of our group? Why don't you be the president of our board? And Crystal just stepped up uh, to do that. Uh, she played a significant role in the fabric of the community uh, and uh, was a sort of a self-appointed mentor to younger people uh, coming up in the community, including myself and my late friend, Gary Fizzino. Uh, Crystal uh, had opinions about how we should go about our work and she shared them with us uh, in a way that I think today might be described as, uh, as tough love. Um, she, she really was uh, a person who lived a full life, not just in her 101 years, but uh, as a, a professional woman as well. She um, uh, managed to squeeze all of that community activity in while she was uh, the director of allocations and uh, special gifts for the United Way or the financial secretary for the Harker School or the executive director of downtown Palo Alto. So. Uh, when you have 101 years, uh, a loving husband, three daughters, uh, a series of uh, fulfilling careers, and uh, a lifetime of contribution, uh, that, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, is, is truly um, a full, full life. Uh, she will be missed, but more than that, uh, she should be appreciated. Uh, and I wanted to communicate that appreciation today. Thank you very much. Thank you, excellent words. I, I hope each of us is at the gym at 100 years of age. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Walsman. That reminds me that I need to hit the gym after the meeting tonight, <laughs> if they were open. But in the meantime, obviously we're working out at home and whatever we can do to keep ourselves uh, healthy these days. Uh, and today I'm very honored to have the opportunity to adjourn in honor of a very special lady, Guadalupe uh, Muniz. Uh, she happens also to be Vanessa Turner, a uh, grandmother, and Vanessa is the District 3 staff member. Uh, Guadalupe Muniz passed away on February 6, uh, 16, 2021, a few months shy of her 100th birthday. Born in 1921 in San Benito, Texas, Guadalupe and Modesto moved the family to California in the 1950s. She was preceded in death by her husband, Modesto, and her, two, her sons, John, Modesto Munoz III and by great-grandson John Munoz III. But she survived by three daughters and one son, Norma Ritland, Alva Cornell, Leticia Tennyson, and son Roland Munoz. She has 12 grandchildren, 25 great-grandchildren, and eight great-great-grandchildren. Guadalupe admired tremendously our Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren for her work. She was also very involved and her friend Carol would attend her neighborhood watch meetings at St. John Vianney's church. She was a patriotic and instilled the same civic pride to her children and grandchildren. She later had a career in interior designs in the Bay Area. She was an extraordinary artist in sculpting, oil painting, and drawing, inspiring her children, grandchildren to also pursue artistic endeavors. Her life was filled with grandbabies, arts, books, music, ornamental elephants, and her signature homemade hot chocolate and her annual white flock Christmas tree. She was a matriarch and celebrated centerpiece of her family, and she will be remembered for her warm smile, laughter, and love. Thank you. Thank you very much, Supervisor. Those, those were all amazing people. Absolutely amazing. Thank you for that. We are now going to move on to Item five, which is accommodations and proclamations. Um, I'm honored today to have one to share with all of you and all those listening at home and abroad. I want to, this is a proclamation in honor of Women's History Month. And I wanna welcome the following members that are with us today virtually. Uh, I'll read the proclamation and then uh, Protamin and Meredith will have a few words to share with us afterwards. So we've got Protima Pandey, director of our Office of Women's Policy, absolutely amazing person. Rose Luera, community outreach specialist, the Office of Women's Policy. 
Cecilia Carrillo, Administrative Assistant of the Office, Quetzal Gomez, Management Analyst of the Office, Laura Kim, also a Management Analyst, Karen Mestizo, the SSA Intern, Intern and Earn, I need to find out what that means, the Office of Women's Policy, Katie Robles, the Senior Management Analyst, Division of Equity and Social Justice, Rocio Luna, Dep Deputy County Executive, Congratulations on that new position, Rocio. Betty Duong, Division Supervisor, Division of Equity and Social Justice. And Meredith Curry, the current chair and of the uh, Commission of the Status of Women. The proclamation reads as follows. Whereas women of every race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, and immigration status make historic contributions to the growth, strength, and safety of our nation, state, and county in countless recorded and unrecorded ways, as well as being at the front lines during the COVID-19 pandemic. Whereas despite these contributions, the important role of American women in history has not been recognized. And women have often made, been made subjects of sexual exploitation, objectification and abuse. Whereas for the first time in the history of this nation, a biracial African-American South Asian American woman was elected president of the 100th, in the 100th year anniversary of women's right to vote, coinciding with a record 141 women in Congress, but still just 26.4% of the membership and a long way to go towards equity. Whereas for the first time in history, a woman served as an official at the Super Bowl in 2021 a year after an openly gay woman assistant coach led her team to the Super Bowl, a significant first to build upon. Whereas the pandemic has wiped out the economic progress made by women with a total of 54.6% of all jobs lost held by women, many in unorganized sectors paying less than minimum wage, making it imperative that workforce development for pandemic recovery be rooted in gender equity. Whereas women in Santa Clara County are of great value and should be reflected in historical documentation, leadership roles, employment opportunities, and decision-making spaces. The Office of Women's Policy continues to work towards policies to improve workforce participation, ensure equity in education and schools, and empower future leaders, and strives to put gender equity at the center of policy programming, practices, and legislation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara does hereby join with other counties around the nation, proclaiming March as Women's History Month, and invites the residents of Santa Clara County to join in attributed programs, ceremonies, and activities, celebrating the achievements and contributions of women to our great history. Passed and adopted by the Board of Supervisors, County of Santa Clara, State of California, on this ninth day of March, 2021, by unanimous vote. And now I'll ask our Director Protima and our Commission Chair Meredith to say a few words. Ladies. Thank you. Thank you, President Wasserman, and thank you, honorable members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm honored here to say a few words as we begin this historic month during an unprecedented time in the history of our nation and of the world. I want to begin by saying that each of us at the Office of Women's Policy are working as pandemic response workers, disaster service workers, and EOC staff, along with 66% of my colleagues from the Division of Equity and Social Justice. Our work in the community is a testament to the fact that the County of Santa Clara recognized 23 years ago that centering gender equity in county leadership, county government, and county policies is going to forward and help each one of us to thrive. The Office of Women's Policy calls one half of its population as our stakeholders. And together with the other offices in the Division of Equity and Social Justice, we continue to work alongside county administration during these difficult times. In 2020, the Board of Supervisors 
recognize the value of gender equity by walking the walk and not only talking the talk. Expanding paid family leave, providing for subsidized and free childcare, funding free access to period products, creating a pilot program for new young mothers are all ways in which our county has demonstrated that during these difficult times, when we call on the community to make a sacrifice in the name of public health and protecting everybody, that we county government will stand by our community and protect our community as well serve on ways they have to eliminate barriers that might come in their way of participating and assisting us so that we can get to the corner and we can turn the corner on this pandemic. More than a hundred years ago, this country arrested, quarantined, released, and re-quarantined Mary Malone. Mary had to make a choice, a difficult choice. And today, women are leaving the workforce in droves. And I ask county government to continue protecting and preserving the abilities of our community to ride these difficult times. And I hope that the Office of Women's Policy is counted upon as, as part of the policy making and programming that this Board of Supervisors has demonstrated during the pandemic. I would be failing in my duty if I didn't mention that ours is one of the few county governments that's working alongside the community. And it is in that spirit, I want to invite the chair of our commission on the status of women, Meredith Curry. The, the commission is one of the oldest in the nation. And it is the commission that responds and provides assistance to the board in ensuring that gender equity is centered. Meredith. Thank you so much, Pratima. Thank you, Board President Wasserman, and thank you, honorable members of the Board of Supervisors. Good morning, community. My name is Mary Curry. I reside in District 2, and I am humbled and proud to serve as the chair of the Santa Clara County Commission on the Status of Women. I want to start off with a huge thank you to the Office of Women's Policy, to Pratima and her team for their incredible contributions to the community and to our commission. This partnership enables us to build a stronger, more equitable, more diverse, and more resilient county together. I want to also thank fellow commissioners that have joined us this morning, like Dr. Jennifer Briscoe and Lisa Lydell for their commitment to the community and their service as volunteers. Since I've taken over as chair, the commission is now nearly fully seated with two out of the 15 seats open. Seat number one in District 3 is up for vote today as part of the agenda, and I do hope the Board of Supervisors approves this appointment as part of today's meeting. I highly encourage community members to consider applying for the other available seat in District 1. When this commission came together early last year prior to the shelter in place, we reorganized our priorities into three subcommittee, uh, subcommittees. First, justice and advocacy. Second, equity and emerging issues. And third, outreach and development so we can continue to engage and learn from our community. When we could not host an event in 2020 to celebrate Women's Equality Day, we pivoted to prioritize mental health. On January 23, 2021, the Commission on the Status of Women in partnership with the Office of Women's Policy hosted the virtual COVID Community Cares Mental Health event so that our community could learn more about mental health, hear from the community about their needs and challenges, as well as hear about the ongoing local efforts to address mental and behavioral health in the county. As a commission, we continue to focus on community engagement and how our many grants can address the needs of women and girls in the community. Thank you again to the Board of Supervisors and President Wasserman for your commitment to our commissions and committees and to your continued appointment of volunteers. And a huge thank you again for this morning's proclamation. I'd now like to send it back to Protema to announce upcoming events for the Office of Women's Policy. Thank you, Meredith. And as we conclude, and as the Office of Women's Policy traces, translates, and tests out in the community, I invite the community to join us on March 17th and March 27th for our virtual Strong Girls, Strong Women Conference, the ninth conference. And all the details are on Office of Women's Policy social media and on our website. 
as well. I invite the community to join us for a hearing on the task force for the Convention on Elimination of All Kinds of Discrimination Against Women at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, March 17th, where we'll hear about leadership opportunities for women, girls, and gender expansive individuals. Thank you very much. I turn it back to board president. Thank you, Director Pandy. And uh, thank you, Chair Curry as well. Thank you. You do a fabulous, fabulous job. Thank you. We now move on to item number six, which is public comment. And let me just see here. If you wish to speak, you need to raise your hand and Nancy, let's do one minute each okay. for our speakers. Let's go right ahead. Sure thing, sure thing. Our first speaker, first speaker is Paul Soto. Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, my name is Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, it's International Women's Day every day at Conexion. I make sure that I celebrate Rose Amador, Lori Chavez, and Quasihua for the work that they do. They have been doing so much work for that community that experienced the jungle. And they have been holding it down for decades. 44 years Conexion has been in operation dealing with the inadequacies and the incompetencies of city and county government's failures to address the social, economic, political, and spiritual issues that are in this county. So I don't need a day on the calendar to tell me to celebrate the señoras and all these nonprofits that are really doing the, the hard work. They are bearing the brunt. So it is to them that I lift up and use my public comment to dedicate my life and my energy to Las Señoras. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rose Candia. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good day, I am Wisdom. I am calling on behalf of the House of Israel to accept the forfeiture from office by the county executive and county recorder in accordance with the United States public statutes at large for the concealment of public records as published and acknowledged willful act since November 5th, 2018. The County of Santa Clara acting as Santa Clara County has affected the recording process to deny the liberty up for imparting notice. The courts have ruled that the benefits of a recording statute are not available to one who takes title with actual notice of a previously executed unrecorded instrument. Despite the recording statutes and the assurance they give about the status of title, a prudent purchaser is denied the liberty to inspect the premises using records in custody of the, dis of the designated trusted agent. The obligation to allow public inspection of records prevents false claims of title to real property imparted by lack of actual notice because of the concealment of records. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. I, uh, is behavioral health just broken? It, it, did you guys just pull the plug on that place? I talk about how it's on life support. Um, hundreds of calls are going through dispatch um, and, and no services are being provided. No fire trucks, no ambulances, no police. Um, as people just lay and, and just die in the middle of our streets. Um, St. James Park is absolutely out of control. Every single one of you should be ashamed of yourselves. Um, this is all of you should. Uh, Sheriff's Department handles the court contracts, the light rail contracts. Why don't you get out there in that park and start arresting people? Why don't you start helping people and pull the poor black woman out of traffic that's been there for the last three or four days? Okay, no one is doing anything. Her tatas are out, her beavers hanging out. I mean, it's unbelievable to see that stuff. And, and the woman needs help. And, and, and guys, come on, it, it, it's about time to do something. Our next speaker is Athena Flores. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking.
Athena, can you unmute yourself, please? Good day. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm calling on behalf of the House of Israel to accept the forfeiture from office by the county executive and county recorder in the accordance with the United States public statutes at large for the concealment of public records as published and acknowledged willful acts since November 5th, 2018. County of Santa Clara has abandoned an essential concept of California law by denying the liberty to search for records that secure the repayment of monetary claims or performance of an act typically in connection therewith by a lien. These criminal acts to conceal and impair ownership liberties to freely enjoy the benefits of the use and ownership of the property. These deprivations constitute evidence of indebtedness for the failure to perform official duties and resulting injuries. Deprivation against the House of Israel's members' liberties are charged at the rate of $100,000 per day. Should this violation be by error or mistake, we grant a 72 hours grace period for the immediate restoration of online search with our next speaker is Galaxy A21. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Greetings. I'm calling on behalf of the House of Yarsrael to accept the portrait office from by the county executive and recorder in accordance with the United States public statute at large for the concealment records of public records and published acknowledged willfully since the act of November 5th, 2018 should be a shame. But my father said, but if you will not hearken unto me and you will not do all these things as I command, if you shall despise my statutes, your soul, abhor my judgments, well, I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and burning. And if you will not, for all this hearkening to me, I will punish you seven times for your sins. Our next speaker is Aaron Lewis. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good day. I'm calling on behalf of the House of Israel to accept a forfeiture from Office of the County Executive and County Recorder in accordance with the United States public statutes at large for the concealment of public records as published and acknowledged willful acts since November 5th, 2018. These deprivation, uh, these deprivations constitute evidence of indebtedness for the failure to perform official duties and resulting in injuries. Deprivation against the House of Israel's members' liberties are charged at a rate of 100,000 per day. Should this violation be by error or mistake, we grant a 72-hour grace period for the immediate restoration of online search without restraint of restriction or restriction, excuse me. Should these facts be intentional and and access not be timely restored. In addition, $100,000 per day per county agent will be billed at each saint injured, saint injured by deprivation caused by your unlawful color acts extorted liberty. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. I wanted to thank yourselves for uh, the city of San Jose is looking into a surveillance and technology ordinance and a privacy advisory commission. This is over, uh, you know, five or six years of work and efforts of people. Uh, I, I think there will be a real important step. And I wanted to thank your early efforts uh, in, in these things. Um, I've been writing letters to you guys lately. I wrote a letter uh, and the importance of uh, interstate uh, guns, uh, gun trafficking it actually can be an interesting way to address gun uh, sales and gun trafficking issues at the local level. And, and it doesn't blame people at the local level so much. Uh, and to conclude, um, just uh, informational items of the day, uh, can you be open to the idea that HVAC, uh, new HVAC systems in local schools, does that have the capability of aer aerosol vaccines and can that be an open subject to talk about? Thank you. 
Our next speaker is House of Israel. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good day. The Sovereign Lord said, if you walk contrary to me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make a few few in number and your highway shall be desolate. Again, we call on the, for the acceptance and acknowledgement of the forfeiture from office by the county executive and county recorder, as well as all of those who have been given notice and knowledge and participate as a principal to the ongoing conspiracy to conceal public records. This is a felony and you are aiding and abetting a felony. So all of you who have earshot of this, including the district attorney's office, the court county council's office, the board of supervisors office, the office of the sheriff, the Office of the Superior Court and County Court Executive, and all of these unfor unregistered foreign agents who are exercising legalized constructive fraud are put on notice this day, March 9th, 2021. Our next speaker is Thomas. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good day. Good day. Good day. Today, can you hear me? Yes. Please continue. Calling on the behalf of the House of Israel. The Santa Clara County Recorder has blocked the ability for I or anyone to search county records. Since November 2018, they've concealed, impeded, and blocked my ability to search county records, meaning if I wanted to search a property, I can't. What if I've been trying to move or simply purchase property in Santa Clara County? Since 11 5, 2018, the county executive and county recorder has been operating outside of their official capacity. <clears throat> I've created an invoice for $100,000 for, for depriving me or I, a member in the body of the House of Israel, from accessing the county records, maps, books, documents, papers, etc. This is the shameful evidence of indebtedness embezzlement and sadly our next our next speaker is anthony lee i am unmuting you please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak the timer will start when you begin speaking all right thank you so much for this time um my name is anthony lay spells l e but pronounced lay um wait can you all hear me yes okay i did see the timer start so i wasn't sure uh, thank you. Um, I just want to call just to acknowledge there's a rise uh, in anti-Asian sentiment. Uh, it's been going on for a very long time, but we're just seeing a lot more happening. And I just want to call in one, two parts, right? One is that I seek to ask the county to support in condemning the racist attacks uh, and the sentiment and to push for greater equity. Um, at the same time, there's also an agenda item that's coming up uh, where it talks about condemning Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander hate crimes and violence. Um, and I encourage the county's board of supervisors to uh, approve that and also continue doing the work to push for greater equity, not just for Asian Americans, but for everyone else too. Thank you. Our next speaker is Doug. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, I'm attending a new church and it's open for indoor seating. I see young kids and families laughing and talking with facial expressions seen and without mask. I mean, it's odd to see it at first, but then after about five seconds, I realized that this is normal. We are now allowed to open, we are now allowed to open with some severe capacity restrictions, but it's too little and too slow. And we may have to lock down yet again. So I mean, lost employment and livelihoods and increased anxiety and suicides in young adults, restricting healthy outlets like going to school, church, sports, music, et cetera, is not working. It's inhumane to athletes pursuing a scholarship or underserved students falling behind because it's easy to skip a Zoom class if your parents aren't home. Where's the equity in that? It should be equal opportunity, equality. That's what Martin Luther King promoted. We need to open up now, do as other states have shown possible. Thank you. Our next speaker is caller whose number ends in 854. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking.
caller whose number ends in 854, please unmute yourself. Hello. Yes. Hi, my name is Audrey Cordova. Thank you for letting me talk to the members of the board today. I'm calling because as behavioral, as the pandemic continues, behavioral health needs in our community skyrocket and our county is turning their backs on the people that need the help the most. Across their departments, I work for county behavioral health. Across their departments, all of our workers are being completely overloaded with cases and it doesn't seem like anything is getting done. One such case, I'm doing everything I possibly can through all existing channels to get help, to better help and serve our community. And it feels like we're being ignored. Workers across the department are asking for help in so many different ways and nobody is listening. Scott Largent mentioned something earlier that really, it hurt my heart because we're supposed to be there for a community residents and we're really not. Um, one such process is the assessment for intervention process where we do um, assessments for kids under the age of five. Our next speaker is JL. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good day. I'm calling on behalf of the House of Israel to accept the forfeiture from office by the county executive and county recorder in accordance with the United States public statutes at large for the concealment of public records as published and acknowledged willful acts since November 5th, 2018. What authority and specific regulation did the Board of Supervisors, County Recorder, or County Executive exercise to obstruct justice and deny the liberty to search land records during COVID shutdown? Has the county created a private non-transparent system like MERS for registering mortgages and permitting assignments? The County of Santa Clara Recorder and county executive have abandoned 370 years of precedent by acting ultra-virus to deprive the liberty to contribute by negligence to the residential foreclosure and homeless crisis. The criminal ultra-virus acts of concealment by the recorder and county executive demonstrates that the Santa Clara County land title system has been hijacked by the county of Santa Clara operating ultra-virus intentionally destroy the system. Due to the time restrictions, this testimony has been sent by fax and email. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mark H. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Mark, can you unmute yourself? There you go. Oh, you've muted yourself again. Hear you this. I pray ye, ye heads of the house of Jacob and the princes of the house of Israel that ye abhor judgment and pervert our equity. I bring grievance today from the house of Israel that you are found in judgment this day and you were held accountable for your actions that you have done unjustly towards the people. Not only of the house of Israel, but the house of the people of the populace of the county of Santa Clara. For the county of Santa Clara that is doing business at Santa Clara County has exercised ultra various authority by denying the liberty to verify documents recorded against property by inspection for authenticity and relevance by those involved in the transaction or the ability to trace the claim of title. For this critical system of real property ownership to work, all documents that have ever been recorded must remain open to the public inspection. If even one document has been removed from the records, the entire system is compromised. These depositions constitute an evidence of indebtedness for the failure to perform official duties and resulting injuries. This deprivation against the House of Israel our next speaker is Doria. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good day. I'm calling on behalf of the House of Yaya Israel to accept the forfeiture from office by the county executive as well as the county recorder in accordance with the United States public statutes at large for the concealment of public records as public and acknowledged willful acts since November 5th, 2018. By what authority does the Board of Supervisors, county recorder or county executive have to declare public records available for private viewing only? As well as to deprive the body in the House of Yaya Israel from accessing public records. This public agency exists to aid in the conduct of the House of Yah Israel, public business transactions, and are bound by an oath that your actions and deliberations be conducted openly 
Since November 5, 2018, the County of Santa Clara Executive Office instructed the Santa Clara County Recorder to disable access to the public records without authority under color of law. So this grave breach against the California Constitution undermines the standards of moral conduct and established civilized society by destroying the precise and consistent accounting of the public business. Our next speaker is Terrell Greer. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Terrell, can you please unmute yourself? It appears that Terrell is unable to unmute themselves. I'm unmuted. Can you oh, hear me? Yes. Good day. I'm calling on behalf of the House of Israel to accept the forfeiture from office by the county executives and county recorder in accordance with the United States public statutes of large for the concealment of public records and published and acknowledged. Willful since acts since November 5th, 2018, office holders acting as the County of Santa Clara for the Santa Clara County demonstrate disgrace for established principles of law universally admitted as being just and consonant with reason. Deprivation against the House of Israel members. Liberties are charged at a rate of $100,000 per day. Notice is given of the sum now due and payable $100,000. Knowledge is given that in 72 hours grace period is extended should be an error or mistake. Immediately correct the issue and restore online search without restraint or restriction. Every day beyond the 72 hour period indicates willful intent subject to additional costs billed at the daily rate, $100,000 per day for injuries caused by your unlawful colorable acts to deprive liberty. That concludes our public comment. President Wasserman, you are on mute. Thank you, Nancy. We're now gonna move on to item seven, which is approval of our consent calendar and changes. I encourage anybody who wishes to speak on any items on the consent calendar to register now electronically so that their hands are is raised. Hands are raised. Um, that said, Nancy, can you please read our consent calendar update? We have a request from Supervisor Lee to add an adjournment in memoriam of Guadalupe A. Muñiz. Item number 4C is to adjourn in honor and memory of Guadalupe A. Muñiz. We have a request from Supervisor Lee to consider items, item numbers 10 and 22 concurrently. Item number 10 is to receive report relating to framework and next steps to support the county's justice involved clients. Item number 22 is to approve an increase in the supplemental work allowance for the main jail south abatement, demolition, and temporary provisions project. Contract number 18-30 awarded to Road and Builders Incorporated, increasing the supplemental work allowance by $800,000 from $6 million to $6,800,000 for a new total contract encumbrance of $16,911,258. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to consider item numbers 16 and 17 concurrently. Item number 16 is to receive report relating to the employee child care needs survey and feasibility assessment. Item number 17 is to receive report relating to feasibility of dedicated space at the county government center and Silver Creek campuses for child care, including tenant improvement costs and a projected timeline. We have a request from administration to hold item number 19 to March 23rd, 2021. Item number 19 is to consider recommendations relating to implementation of the Federal Emergency Rental Assistance Program. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Chavez to remove item number 43 from the consent calendar. Item number 43 is to consider recommendations relating to the fiscal year 2021-2022 budget process. We have a request from Supervisor Simidian to refer item number 65 to the Housing, Land, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee prior to board consideration. Item number 65 is to consider recommendations relating to final civil grand jury report. Why aren't there more female firefighters in Santa Clara County? That concludes the report. Thank you very much, Nancy. 
board members, if it's all right with you. Um, no, actually we should see if there's any other additions and deletions, then we'll go to public in case they wanna speak about any changes not noted already on the update. Do any supervisors wish to make any comments? Supervisor Chavez and Ellenberg and Smitty. Supervisor Chavez, go right ahead. I don't see you're muted, but you sound, you sound muted. Still, you're still muted. Can you check the sound on your laptop to make sure you did not mute your sound? Nope, you're muted there. We're gonna move on to Supervisor Ellenberg for a minute and we'll come back to you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I just wanna make a comment on uh, item 62, but not remove it uh, from consent, please. Mm -hmm. In our budget discussions um, last August and then later at Health and Hospital, we've discussed concerns about the costs of BMC capital projects. And I continue to be particularly concerned about expanding costs of existing projects, even more so than approval of new projects. Uh, separately, on the referral status report on the agenda, I see that the off agenda on VMC capital projects is now uh, promised for March 19th to provide information on processes to determine project contingency plans, historical data regarding estimated and actual costs for capital projects, and identification of administrative controls currently in use or planned to increase the likelihood of staying within the budget. Given uh, that I've been asking for this information for about six months, I, I really want to emphasize that I expect the off agenda to be on time and to be thorough. While $22 million may not be much in the scope of our major capital projects, it is still a significant right. sum uh, when we've had to make really difficult uh, budget decisions this year, um, difficult decisions around budget reductions. And I just wanna be assured that we are doing everything we can to manage costs on all of our capital projects. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank Supervisor you. Robbins, go right ahead. Oh, you're muted again. We heard you for a second. We'll come back to Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Smitty. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, asked that item 65 uh, be referred uh, to and through our Housing, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee for report back and uh, presumably uh, action by our board at a later date. I have now, however, been advised uh, by staff that uh, there is a deadline for the report uh, back to the grand jury. Uh, let me just first say, uh, I find that frustrating. This is a conversation we've had repeatedly at our board, which is that uh, items that come back, uh, presumably for board evaluation, assessment, judgment, and decision-making, which we are then told, oh, you have to pass this right now at this meeting, uh, the way we've presented it to you, um, suggest that that's um, more form than substance, I guess is what I would say. But let me turn to both uh, Dr. Smith and um, Mr. Williams. Uh, my thinking, uh, looking for a workaround was that we might simply change our response to the grand jury since we are the board, uh, change our response to the grand jury and say, uh, our response is that we have sent this to uh, committee for further discussion and it will come back to our board, but that uh, hopefully providing at least that written response would be sufficient to meet the letter of the law. I, I do not know, so let me just ask uh, Mr. Williams and Dr. Smith if that would suffice. Yeah, my recommendation would be to just send a letter to the grand jury saying that the board's requesting additional time and that the matter has been referred to committee. I think that would be sufficient uh, to provide a formal response. There are certain uh, criteria that have to be met. So I think that's probably the best uh, course of action. And I think that would probably work. All right. Well, I'm happy to uh, make that motion, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, or amend rather my request as part of the consent calendar motion, I guess, uh, and uh, send such a letter to the um, 
uh, to the grand jury and then refer, have the item referred to Hewlett for discussion, I, I should just um, uh, be transparent here and say I, I did not find the um, prepared response particularly uh, robust or rigorous. Uh, I think this is an area where progress can be made if there is a commitment to make progress. And uh, I'd like to have some more discussion about how we do that. Uh, in fact, I know we can because it was an issue I looked at 25 years ago in the Palo Alto City Council. Uh, and uh, here we are all these years later uh, confronting the same lack of progress. So that would be my amended consent calendar request uh, pursuant to the advice of County Council for which I say thank you. Julie, I, do, I do recommend that the committee have some date picked. It's, I think the request was date uncertain. I would say the next meeting or the meeting after that, something like that, so that that can be in the letter to the grand jury. Thank you. And through the chair, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you are, of course, the chair of, of Hewlett, so I don't want to presume or assume, uh, shall we say, uh, no later than uh, uh, the second Hewlett meeting after today's date. Would that uh, satisfy all parties? Sounds good to me. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to try Supervisor Chavez again. I'm so sorry, and I may repeat some of the discussion because my sound and everything went out on my computer. Um, so on item 46, this is the report from the county executive related to the equity principles in the RFP and contracting process. And I, I just wanted to really acknowledge um, how appreciative I am of the staff, uh, you know, doing such a really robust job. Um, so procurement in particular, you know, when we adopted the equity resolution uh, that I that I think that I brought forward, I can't remember with Supervisor Cortezi or not, um, but that we were really looking to impact the budget and policy decisions. And really there's no better way that to do that than procurement. So I really wanted to just thank the staff and I didn't want it to just go on consent without uh, celebrating their their good efforts. Um, the second thing I wanted to do is weigh in on the issue that um, Supervisor Samidian just weighed in on. And I am also very interested in the, you know, really um, deepening the response to the grand jury relative to Central Fire and the um, recruitment of women. I'd like to ask if my colleagues are amenable to it um, to also have it go to FGOC um, at, just for also for discussion before it comes back to the full board and really appreciate Supervisor Samidian's uh, comments uh, and wanted to just reinforce them. Thank you. Super, thank you. All right, that concludes Supervisor, oops, Supervisor Samidian, you still have your hand raised. Just to say, I'm happy to include in my request, uh, if it's needed for parliamentary reasons, the referral to FGOC as well. I'm not sure that it is, but I wanted to get that of record. Thank you, Joe. Thank you both very much. We're now gonna to move to public comment. And just for the public watching, you need to have your hand raised and please register by raising your hand within the next few minutes because we're gonna move on from there. We're gonna hear 10 and 12 concurrently, which doesn't change anything, 16 and 17 also. We're holding 19, we're removing 43 from consent, meaning that it's being heard and the response for 65 there's gonna be a letter going to the grand jury asking for extra time. It'll be heard in Hewlett within the next two meetings. So for members of the public who find all that confusing because you don't do this all the time, the bottom line on all of that is that 43 will be heard as an item, not on consent and 19 is held. With that, Nancy, I turn things over to you, two minutes each. Right. Uh, we currently have four speakers in their queue. Our first speaker is Scott Largent. Scott, I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. And you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Speaking. Good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. Largent. Hearing this uh, information about the, ooh, I think we kind of have an echo going over here. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Ooh, um, should we skip over me and I'll put my hand back up? Or is yes, it, uh, we'll, come, we'll, come, we'll come back no to you, worries. Nancy. Okay, our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. 
uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I want to thank uh, Supervisor uh, Lee for um, pulling those items with regard to uh, the jails and uh, uh, justice impacted uh, citizens of our county. Um, we, we have to get to a point where we can talk about being responsive to the need rather than reactionary to the problem. Responsive to the need instead of reactionary to the problem. And what government has done uh, over the past 30 years has been reactionary to a problem that it has created. Gary Webb, Gary Webb did extensive research and put out that the CIA was putting uh, drugs into our communities at the same time that the say no to drugs uh, propaganda was being sold to the public. And that was the onset of the acceleration of Duke Majin. And then when we had the poly class murder here, and it was tried here in Santa Clara County, that ballooned this just this bestial animal of what we now call CDC. And so no county can really actually be considered civil if they were content sending a human being to prison for 25 to life, which is the equivalent of a first degree murder sentence for having a bag of dope. I mean, this is this is this needs to be confronted. I really believe that in order for you to be effective in what it is that you are trying to do, we first must go back and reckon to rectify the injustices that men like myself have experienced at the hands of this county. Now, I'm willing to participate in that. I'm willing to participate fully in that. But asking a consultant to come in to talk about what my lived experience has been with regard to um, the justice system in this county, I think it's a futile uh, exercise. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, thank you. Uh, to our own good practices and experiences. Uh, I, I'm interested in items uh, um, 45, 46, and 49 uh, in the consent calendar. With item 45, um, I just simply wanted to offer that, uh, you know, you're looking into new electronic voting ideas that I'm starting to grow more comfortable with. Be careful in how you uh, measure and work with electronic voting. And from that, I've just been overall learned important lessons since the, you know, the, the, the Capitol incident uh, in uh, January 6th that we our voting process may actually be pretty good. <laughs> and, and everyone actually did a, a fairly good job uh, in, in a considerably strained time of COVID. And that needs to be, you know, just openly, you know, talked about. And uh, so thanks to everyone for their efforts. And that's how we're going to grow, I think, in the next decade. Um, about item 46, uh, I'm interested to learn what exactly procurement and equity can mean. And I can write a letter and ask about that in the future. And with item 49, uh, I just wanted to offer, how much time I got? I got 42 seconds, great. I just wanted to uh, uh, remind that uh, with your first five programs, and you know this is uh, digital inclusion issues, uh, bridging the digital divide is incredibly important. I, I, I just can't stress enough that the ideas of open public policy really should be included in, in bridging the digital divide issues. I think open public policies for 4G and 5G invites, you know, a community participation and a, a community morale and spirit that's hopeful and positive towards this whole process. And uh, I just wanted to remind everyone of that. Everyone of that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. Hopefully, uh, I don't hear an echo now, so I think everybody's kind of having technical difficulties today. Um, what I'm talking about on the consent calendar is the civil grand jury reports. And Normally, I mean, I, I do get how the process works. Those are the most important um, documents and, and for myself, civil grand jury reports, department audits, and public records requests. Now, I, I 
I am very excited that these the civil grand jury um, reports are being discussed. I understand this is a consent calendar item. Um, I, I, I would like all of these civil grand jury um, reports um, discussed in an open forum. I, I would prefer not to have this stuff buried. Um, so the public understands you can get these off of the uh, Santa Clara County Court's website. You can get them off of the uh, county's uh, website also. Uh, the county's been getting a little shady with things. They're denying access to a lot of these records. You notice that there's people that have been getting on public comment. Um, they kind of sound a little out there, but they are talking about something that's legit with our county of kind of hiding things from the public. Now, we have other audits that were out there. So the public understands the supervisors have to respond, the county council's office, the DA. And when you kind of dig through those reports and you get to the back, you can kind of see their excuses for uh, not doing things right. Uh, we've got to figure out this problem with the public, public records requests right now. Um, I am currently going through uh, pretrial motions right now. And the county is just balking on providing basic information to my attorney. We've subpoenaed uh, the county council's office several times. Uh, the best part is, is when you want to serve a county employee. Uh, they just send you in circles. They won't let you know where to serve them at. Everybody's working remotely from home. Uh, it's very shady. And it kind of reminds me of our behavioral health uh, system here. Um, have we sent everybody home? Uh, I think we must have done that in the county council's office. Figure it out, James. Our next speaker is House of Israel. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Every appropriation by definition is in a claim or use by claim for use of exclusive right of my father's private property. To sever an ecclesiastical benefice and annex it to a spiritual corporation, soul or aggregate, being the patron, 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary. There's no opt-out system as a surety in the system. We do not consent to surety ship. No one is presumed to have given a gift. We did not gift the sovereign authority of our Lord for criminal acts by public servants. No one is presumed to be wicked. We've given multiple notices and they've been ignored. So once the presumption is given, if you don't discontinue your criminal actions, it means that it's intentional. When a man steps on another man's foot after notice who refuses to stop stepping on another man's foot, the intent is established beyond dispute. We have been denied testimony. There were many that were waiting to provide testimony because we've already given you that, that information. The lack of transparency proves your honest service fraud. So before you do any further appropriations, Operating in the unclassified civil service as private protected civilians from the executive branch outside the office of the president as government sponsored enterprise, principal executive officers and saints of the most high, we need to see your anti-bribery statements and your foreign agent registration statements prior to any further appropriations. We need to see your evidence of your US citizenship because you're taking actions that are contrary to the United States laws. So prior to any further actions, we need to have those, prior to any further appropriations, we need to see evidence of your authority to take the actions that you're taking. Because we have the certificate from the Internal Revenue Service that says that the county of Santa Clara does not exist as a non-exempt tax exempt entity. So your taxation authorities and your assumed sovereign authorities are void. Thank you. And Nancy, I'll just make it clear to anybody else speaking. This is item number seven for to speak about any of the items on the consent calendar specifically. Public comment is over. Go ahead. Our next speaker is Neo. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good day. I'm calling on behalf of the House of Israel to accept the forfeiture from office by the county executive and county recorder in accordance with the United States public statutes at large for the concealment of public records as published and acknowledged willful acts since November 5th, 2018. This grave breach against the California Constitution undermines the standards of moral conduct and established civilized society by destroying the precise and consistent accounting of the public's business. Excuse me, Neil. To the Nancy, Nancy, please stop Neo's time. Neo will let you conclude. But again, for anybody else, this is the time to speak on items under the consent calendar. Public comment has concluded. Thank you. Go ahead, Neo. Neo, you will have to unmute yourself.
This grave breach against the California Constitution undermines the standards of moral conduct in established civilized society by destroying the precise and consistent accounting of the public's business. This is a key important factor to the guaranteed Republican form of the government operating in our father's commandment and will. Deprivation against House of Israel member liberties are charged at a rate of $100,000 per day. Notice is given of the sum now due and payable, 100,000. Knowledge is given that a 72 hour grace period is extended. Should this be an error or mistake, immediately correct the issue and restore online search without restraint or restriction. Every day beyond the 72 hour period indicates willful intent subject to additional costs billed at the daily rate $100,000 per day for injuries caused by your unlawful colorful acts to deprive liberty. All right, thank you. Nancy, does that do it? Yes, that concludes our public comment. Thank you, I appreciate that. Board members, to summarize, we are gonna hear 10 and 12 together, 16 and 17 together. 19 is being held, 43 is being removed from consent and will be held. And item 65, a letter will be coming forward, I assume from County Council to the grand jury. And the item will be heard in Hewlett within the next two board meetings and Supervisor Simidian and Chavez's comments are duly noted. Board members, any other comments or I'll ask Nancy to call for the a roll call vote. Seeing none, Nancy, please go ahead. You mentioned that 10 and 12 will be heard concurrently and that's actually 10 and 22. Oh, thank you. Go right ahead, Nancy. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasterman. Aye as well. Thank you very much. That concludes our consent calendar item seven. We move on to now public hearing item number eight the creation of a service zone three at NASA Ames Research Center. And we are, we're gonna open the public hearing now and receive any testimony. And each individual here, Nancy, will have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Our first speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Oh, I, I think you guys accidentally had my hand up there. I, I, I can, I don't have anything to say, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, very much. <laughs> thank you. I can keep quiet. <laughs> Our next speaker is B Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I hope uh, my words can be in the purview of this item. Um, you know, this is issues about, you know, uh, national security, basically. And I feel that, uh, you know, local, there's been a, a procurement process in, in the last, uh, about five years ago, that wanted to invite, uh, you know, different countries of the world <clears throat> to develop a um, uh, policies with, around uh, the internet and software engineering and you know just overall just a sense of a uh, you know cooperation a cooperative process i don't know if this will be connected to uh what this item is offering but i you know with it's an important issue to to develop that cooperation that you know things like the surveillance and technology ordinance have really worked to help create and you know there, there used to be cybersecurity. Uh, open public policy ideas with the surveillance and technology ordinance that I hope you can learn to bring back. They're really important and helpful and cooperative and I think can very much address uh, this item, <laughs> the future of this item and what uh, the research center will be needing in, uh, in, in their lives and in all of our lives. And, um, you know, so good luck in, in, in opening up to, you know, how cybersecurity issues can be public. It can be a public process. It doesn't have to be a secret of warfare, which is uh, the whole purpose of the surveillance and technology ordinance in the first place. 
it, it can just do amazing things for our future, I think. And I hope it will help uh, with this process we'll be talking about today and the future of uh, Ames Research Center. Thank you. That concludes our public comment. Thank you very much, Nancy. Members, we have opened the public hearing. We have received testimony. I am now closing the public hearing and I am looking to any comments or emotions. Supervisor Simidian, I see your hand. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm gonna need to, to uh, identify some outstanding issues here and uh, ask staff for a little help in terms of the timeline. Um, I, candidly, I'm not sure that I think it's appropriate uh, to take action today, and let me explain why. I, I think the um, underlying rationale for creating Service Zone 3 is um, a pretty well expressed, actually, in both the uh, referral we have as well as the resolution itself. Um, however, uh, there is a reference on half a dozen occasions in those two documents to either alternative revenue sources or additional revenue sources being necessary uh, to uh, address the fire safety needs of the affected area. Um, but what we don't have in either of those two documents is an indication of or answers to the following three questions. What are those alternative revenue sources? In other words, if we're gonna create a zone knowing as we go into it that uh, property taxes will be insufficient to meet the fire safety needs uh, of the developed property within the zone, and we're going to rely on alternative revenue sources, what are they? The second question is, how much or money are we talking about? And the third question is, who's going to pay it? Um, so before I would feel comfortable taking action on the establishment of service zone three. And again, I think it's very well uh, and logically argued in cases made, but I don't think we could um, sitting in our role as directors of the Santa Clara County uh, Central Fire Protection District. I don't think we could or should uh, take such an action until we have the answer to those three questions, which is um, what are the revenue sources? How much are they and who's gonna pay them? So let me see. Uh, if staff either wants to try and respond to those today or simply refer this item to Hewlett, forgive me for my second referral of the day, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, refer it to Hewlett where we could have that conversation at greater length there uh, before the matter came back to the board. Thank you very much. James, Jeff? I, um, you know, I think the, the, the issues, I guess what I would say is I, I think they are uh, somewhat distinct. Um, the creation of the service zone and potential other revenue sources, um, you know, in the event that, for instance, there is any attempt to create some kind of other revenue process, it would have to go through its own procedural mechanisms and be vetted and worked through. Um, you know, I think that, it, that, you know, the what those could look like, what the scope would be is something that would necessarily require a lot more information, including a lot that's unknown still at this point regarding what the federal government is exactly intending to do. Um, I think that creation of zone three itself, however, um, allows for some separation in treatment regarding this geographic area. But, you know, whatever the, the board's pleasure is related to that, I just think that probably some of the questions, Supervisor Simidian, you're getting at with respect to revenue, um, which may likely include, for instance, discussions around contractual arrangements, are just probably not going to be knowable to the level of um, um, specificity or detail or um, certainty that would make sense for quite some time. Yeah, I'm, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, respectfully, uh, I, I understand what uh, County Council is saying, but I, uh, I don't think it falls into the legal realm so much as uh, um, an observation that we won't know what we don't know until we find out we don't know it. And uh, that's problematic. Uh, creating a service zone, knowing as it says on the face of these documents, that we will have insufficient funds to fund firefighting capabilities there 
without having some thoughtful and informed discussion, even if all things are not knowable, uh, is not a path I think we should be going down. Um, we, we, uh, we had a rather lively and extensive conversation about uh, fire protection in a relatively small area uh, not too long ago, and candidly, all hell broke loose. Uh, it seems to me that there's the suggestion here in the documents that some kind of residential and commercial development is expected uh, in this area. There, the uh, without knowing what the alternative revenue sources are, I, I don't know if we're planning to pass the cost of service along to those uh, commercial or um, residential development residents, uh, property owners, uh, or whether the retrocession is going to preclude them from paying or whether that's why we need the zone in order to find other uh, alternative revenue sources, uh, which are not laid out in the document that uh, can uh, be uh, lawfully and appropriately imposed. So I guess uh, given all that, maybe the easiest thing to do for me at this point is to say, um, move to refer to committee, Hewlett. No, a motion to refer to Hewlett. I noticed you didn't say health and hospital or FGOC, that's fine. Going to Hewlett, which is where it belongs. Do we have a second to his motion? I'll second it. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Smitting, you've, as, as have we all, read the documents. I don't know if we have anyone here from County Fire um, to answer any questions, but it, oh, it looks like we do have our acting fire chief there, Chief Glass. Thank you very much. Um, Supervisor, Supervisor? Yes. Yeah. Chief Glass, is there any comment that you have? The bottom line is, I don't think we see the detail on where the funding would come from, which I understand is the question from Supervisor Smitty and how much funding, where it would come from, who it would apply to, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have any comments you wish to make? Hey, good morning, President Wasserman, Chairman, members of the board. Uh, thank you for having us today on this topic. At this point, it is uh, a little bit premature, premature uh, to, to discuss where that thing is going to come, come from. We feel that the cre creation of Zone 3 sets, sets county fire, uh, uh, central fire in the county and in a good position to be able to protect, the, protect that area from uh, any of the sub subsidies that may occur from the other service zones that are within the county. We have service mm -hmm. zone 1 and service zone 2 now, and those funding sources go to fire protection services within those jurisdictions. Um, this gives us, gives us a, a, a plat platform to be, begin uh, discussions with NASA, NASA on how to fill that gap, as well as look at the alter alternative options uh, you know, that, that, that may be avail available to us. Um, obviously, that funding will need to be um, secured from the recipients and or the receivers of the service within an area fee. Um, and this keeps us from having funds uh, allocated for service zones into subsidized zone three. Uh, as we wait to see what NASA does, whether it's rest, retrocession or, or concurrent recession, uh, this puts the county county in, we believe in a good position. Uh, and it was the best recommendation that we, that we could make uh, with council. Thank you, Chief Glass. Supervisor Smidian? No, I, I've said what I need to say, but I'm going to say it one more time, Mr. Chairman. In other words, we don't. Uh, we, we don't we don't know who's going to be there. Uh, at least we aren't being told. We don't know what tax revenues we're going to try and obtain or in what amount. And we're going to go ahead and uh, sort of jump into this without any indication to the board who is obliged to make the decision what the consequences of the decision will be. And let me just say two years or three years or five years or 10 years from now when all hell breaks loose because people are suddenly looking at a tax that nobody told them about. Um, um, people aren't going to think that this was premature. premature. So uh, I'm, uh, I stand by my request to refer to committee, and I appreciate the second of Supervisor uh, Lee. And I think we need yeah. answers to these questions when it comes to committee, because I don't want to be sitting in committee having the same conversation about what we don't know. I want to know what we set this up for a reason. What's the reason? And I understand that we need a platform or a vehicle, but it's because we anticipate something. So, you know, let's hear what it is we anticipate. We anticipate what kind of growth that won't pay what kind of taxes, which will require what kind of taxes and what kind of an amount to be paid by whom. Those are the questions that, even if we don't have uh, certainty about what the world will look like, we should be getting some indication of what the thinking was on all of those fronts that led to the creation uh, of a service zone, or at least the proposal for such. Thank you. I was hoping you'd repeat, we don't know what we don't know until we don't know what we don't know. But you, uh, you did that well. I did we another. 
We have a Thank motion you. by Supervisor Smithian. We have a second by Supervisor Lee. Is there any other discussion on this item? Hearing none, Nancy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? You're muted. Vice, Vice President Ellenberg? Sorry, yes. And President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Thank you very much. And Chief Glass, thank you for being here today. Uh, please convey this message as needed. We'll have this come back to Hewlett when we receive notification from you, your office, your department, that you have some additional information that you can share with at this time so that uh, we, we can address these questions and then move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now move on to item number nine, which is a public hearing, the purchase of real property located at 1020 North 4th Street in San Jose. Let me just flip over to item number nine. I am now opening the public hearing and Nancy, we will look for any speakers on this item. I don't see any, do you have any? I, I do not see any now. Thank you. Oh, I do see one now. You have one, please have that speaker yes. speak for up to two minutes. Uh, B. Beekman, I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you for noticing uh, my late hand. Um, yeah, uh, oh, oh, you know, if it should be noted, do, do people need to turn off their microphones? Because there's been an echo that's been going on. It was hard to hear the police, uh, the fire chief in the last item. And I don't know if that's happening, uh, if that you need to do that. But I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that uh, I am from San Jose area and that I work on San Jose issues. So, you know, th this, this is an item that is of interest to myself. And um, I, these are, these are, hopefully these will uh, eventually involve uh, housing issues uh, and that can, that can house, uh, be affordable housing issues. And the importance of affordable housing is, is uh, I just wanted to remind the importance of new ideas in very low, extremely low and uh, mixed income housing ideas that, uh, you know, can really help at this time. I think CASA has, has done some really interesting work over the past few uh, years and that we're, we're at kind of a next stage of how to address those sort of questions. And that can really include how do we use the term affordable housing in the first place? And, um, you know, I don't mean to be tough, but it, it is a time we can question those things. And uh, thanks for your time to just, and your patience to let me speak uh, on these past two items. Thanks. And that concludes our public comment. Thank you. So again, we open public comment. We've received testimony. I'm now closing the public hearing. I'm sorry, we opened the public hearing, received testimony, and I'm now closing the public hearing. And I will turn to supervisors for a motion. I need somebody. So move. Supervisor okay. Chavez. Motion made. Thank you. And second. Thank you. Supervisor Lee is a second. Any further discussion? Hearing and need, seeing none, Nancy, please call a roll vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice Supervisor Simidian, did I? Yeah, we did not hear Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian, Supervisor Simidian says aye, thank you. Vice President Ellenberg? She said yes. Yes. And President Wasterman? Yes as well from me, thank you very much. We now move on to item 11, which was held um, from February 23rd. It's to be heard no soon, no earlier than 11 o'clock. It's 11.01. So we will call that 11 o'clock. And uh, let me flip over to 10. This is to receive a report relating to the framework and next steps to support the county's justice involved clients. And anybody wishing to speak to this item, please register now so that we can see your hand raised. And so, item number 10, Dr. Smith or Martha? 
I think I will start with this. Um, thank you. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Oh, excuse me, Doctor. And we're hearing this with item number 22 concurrently. And 22 reads, approve an increase in the supplemental work allowance for the main jail south abatement demolition and temporary provisions project. Contract number 1830 awarded to Ro Rodan Builders, increasing the SWA by 800,000 from 6 million to 6 million eight for a new total and contract encumbrance of 16 million 911 258. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Yes, I will uh, start by talking a little bit about item 10 and then Martha will take over with 22. Excuse me, Dr. Dr. Smith and Martha, I think I'm gonna go with speakers first so you can hear any concerns that may be raised that you might wanna address in your presentation as well. Okay. Nancy, Nancy would you please uh, go to speakers and one minute each? Sure. Our first speaker is Kiana Rodriguez. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is Kiana Rodriguez. I'm here to ask you to place community input front and center in considering how to re-envision the county's system. In particular, individuals and families who have experienced the current system have knowledge and experience, which is vital to this process. At this moment, you have the opportunity to take leadership in offering alternatives to incarceration based upon principles of compassionate care. By implementing such a plan, you could offer solely or sorely needed mental health and substance abuse treatment to members of our community and make Santa Clara County a model for other jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jose Valle. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. How do you do it? Hello? Yes, Jose. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Um, this is Jose Valle, Silicon Valley Debug. Um, the report back on framework for the county's justice involved clients is a plan that conflicts with our shared goals to construct a new jail rather than a cultural a non-cultural structure. True community engagement means the community is also constructing the framework that drives and guides the care first, jail last vision. We urge the board to return to the original plan approved in November 2020 to protect our people, to engage the community in a robust process to create alternatives to incarceration and not just put care first and jail last, but the community first and jail last. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kevin Ma. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Kevin Ma. I live and work in District 5 and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, part of the Care First GLS Coalition. At this moment, you have the opportunity to take leadership in offering alternatives to incarceration based upon principles of compassionate care. By implementing such a plan, you can offer sorely needed mental health and substance abuse treatment to members of the community and make Santa Clara County a model for other jurisdictions. As former Surgeon General David Satcher said, too often our mental health problems will have to play themselves out in the nation's streets, homeless centers, and prisons. Once again, I call on you to prioritize the needs of our community in creating alternatives to a new jail by returning to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 by engaging the community in robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gordon Freyschlad. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Gordon Freischlad. I live in District 5 and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, part of the Care First Jails Last Coalition. In November, we cheered the board's desire to look into non-carceral alternatives to a new jail, putting community input front and center. Those who know firsthand how destructive mass incarceration is are the key to finding more humane approaches. But now the community's starring role is shriveled down to that of a bit player the voices of incarcerated people muted yet again. 
If we are to fulfill our potential as a model for other counties, community engagement must be the foundation for every step we take. We urge the board to return to uh, the original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 by engaging the community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Matsuida. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I'm Karen Matsueta. I live in the third district and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, part of the Care First Jails Last Coalition. I'm here to advocate for a truly open-minded and creative reimagination of alternatives to incarceration with no foregone conclusions. I urge the board to make sure decisions are based on a Care First Jail Last principle, prioritizing treatment and compassion over punishment and confinement. As a sister of a man who has struggled with severe mental illness his whole adult life, I know firsthand the difference receiving caring treatment rather than jail time can make in addressing the very real and human needs of so many in our community. Again, I implore you to reimagine alternatives to incarceration with a wide open lens to help build the strong community that we all want and that so that we can thrive together. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ralph King. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. I'm Ralph King with Surge at Sacred Heart and the Care First GLS Coalition. What does it take to envision a future without incarceration? Well, it starts with a willingness to ponder that question, to set aside preconceptions and platitudes, and to entertain untested solutions. This is something that's never been done before, a process that is decades overdue. But every time we raise that tantalizing process, the county slaps back with the same old refrain, we must build a jail, we need locked facilities. Your foregone conclusion ignores the care first jail last principle and frustrates our goal to replace this broken, ugly carceral system with something better. We urge you to listen to the voices of those most impacted by incarceration and return to the original plan approved by the supervisors last November for a community process to explore non-carceral alternatives to jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, my name is Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I've been in this jail for over 30 years that specific county jail i was in it practically every single every single calendar year all of my entire adult life so i know what goes on there now d team when you say d team d team doesn't mean anything to anybody but i experienced the brutality of d team and so and d team was the one that killed michael tyree that's why we're having these conversations michael tyree was locked up because there was no place for him to go and that's what put him in a position, in the most vulnerable position that he could have ever been in. And these deputies savagely killed him. And this county did not protect him, nor did they protect me from D team. I expect there for the community, the impacted community, to be there at that table and to inform you on how to structure this jail. Anything less, you would be forfeiting your responsibility and duty to the community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tina Brown. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. My name is Tina Brown. I am a mother with a son currently inside the main jail. I am also an advocate with Silicon Valley Debug. I'm here again to show my support for the CARES First Jail Last approach, which is not presented in item number 10. Her report is illogical and counterproductive to the process that was agreed upon. Every single one of us must ensure that all of our community members have the opportunity to help reimagine what public safety is for justice involved persons and we should not presume it to be a carceral setting. My loved one inside has never asked to be in a new jail. What he agrees with is the need 
for positive change that should be alternatives to incarceration to include the mentally ill. I want to remind you that we have already failed many and any type of incarceration only further promotes trauma and is not just for anyone, nor does it equate to public safety. You must hear our pleas for change because the people that are impacted. Our next speaker is Alamide Abios. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is Olamide Aviose, and I'm a law student at Stanford University and a member of Abolish Stanford, part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I'm here to call upon you to place community input front, front and center in considering how to re-envision the county's carceral system. In particular, individuals and families who have experienced the current system have knowledge and experience, which is vital to this process. The board is at a crossroads with respect to community trust. And as student activists, we want to believe that the board means what it says when it commits to following the community's lead. I worry that the board is locked in a carceral humanistic response. The board is only able to conceive of nicer and better jails instead of freeing people. Envisioning a future without incarceration starts with a willingness to entertain previously unimagined untested solutions. We are coming upon the one year anniversary of George Floyd's killing and the board's lofty commitments to black lives and racial justice. The original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 was a, an important first step. We urge the board to return to that plan by engaging the community in a robust process. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julia Mangione. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, my name is Julia Mangioni. I live and work in District 4 and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I share the concerns raised by Supervisor Ellenberg's letter that the report from the county executive fails to include an authentic community engagement process with no predetermined outcome. As county supervisors, I hope you are all familiar with Sherry Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation, as outlined in her 1969 paper in the Journal of the American Planning Association, a foundational text in planning theory. The original plan agreed upon by the supervisors in November 2020 was firmly on the partnership rung of the ladder of citizen participation, centering those most impacted in a robust and democratic process. Now you're quickly slipping down the ladder, excuse me, the ladder onto the rungs of tokenism or even non-participation. I call on you to do what you were elected to do and develop an authentic collaborative community engagement process to courageously explore a care first approach to public safety and create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Our next speaker is Catherine. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is Catherine Ono. I live in District 4. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, part of the Care First Jails Last Coalition. In November, we cheered the board's desire to look into non-carceral alternatives to a new jail, putting community input front and center. Those who know firsthand how destructive mass incarceration is are the key to finding more humane approaches. But now the community's starring role has shriveled down to that of a bit player, muting the voices of incarcerated people yet again. If we are to fulfill our potential as a model for other counties, community engagement must be the foundation for every step we take, including the creation of the framework. We urge the board to return to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 by engaging the community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carol Stevenson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Carol Stevenson. I live in District 4 and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I'm here to call on you to put community input front and center in considering how to re-envision the county's carceral system. In particular, individuals and families who we're hearing from today and so many others who experience the current system have the knowledge and experience that is critical to this process. We share the concerns expressed in Supervisor Ellenberg's letter. The Board of Supervisors has repeatedly stated they do not want a predetermined destination of a community-driven process, but the report is a predetermined detailed plan. I urge the Board to return to the original plan approved by the Supervisors in November 2020 by engaging the community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Alexis McNabb. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Alexis McNabb. I live in District 2 and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart, which is part of the Care First, Jail Last Coalition. In November, we cheered the board's desire to look into non-carceral alternatives to a new jail, putting community input front and center. Remember SVD bug member and original Santa Clara County Jail hunger striker Joseph Behar's vision when he said community can be the architects of our freedom. But now the community's starring role has shriveled. As Care First Coalition members have stated in their March 8th letter to the board on this item, quote, even the selected arena for the discussion of alternatives to incarceration, the Public Safety and Justice Committee, is carved out of most of the process, unquote. If we are to fulfill our potential as a model for other counties, community engagement must be the foundation for every step. We urge the board to return to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November by engaging the community in an honest and robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jen Meyer. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Jen Meyer. Can you? Hi, my name is Jen Meyer and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice, part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. What does it take for us to envision a future without incarceration? The tragedies of 2020 have asked us to imagine new alternatives. This process is decades overdue, but every time this humanizing prospect is raised, the county slaps back with the same old refrain, we must build a jail, we need lock facilities. We share Supervisor Ellenberg's concern as expressed in her letter that the report from the county executive ultimately suggests the construction of another lock facility. We urge you to listen to the voices of those most impacted by incarceration and return to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 by engaging the community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. The events of uh, this year tell, show us that now more than ever, we need more democracy, not less. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Molly M. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. And you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is Molly McLeod. I'm a District 4 resident. I'm a family impacted um, member and also um, sewing up for racial justice member. And, um, you know, I don't know what the solutions are. Um, that's why we need that robust community com conversation. We know what do that um, becoming the number one in locking people up, which is what the U.S. has invested in, um, isn't working, and that it has profound implications for um, inequities um, and, and racism and um, furthering trauma. What I am doing, though, is exploring those questions genuinely and with a community. So, for example, um, I found out about the Fireweed Collective, I am, which has an online presence and in-person. I found out about Project Let's which has resources for high school and college students. I am going to a people's hub um, shared support meeting. There's options, let's find out what they are. Our next speaker is Noah Alvarez. I am unmuting you, please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, good, um, good afternoon. My name is Melissa. My husband is in the San Jose main jail and I'm here today to say that um, if he doesn't get the help he needs, he will continue to circle back and and be in jail. And being in a new jail won't help him and won't help his children and will not um, bring him back to community, but he'll keep circling back to be in jail and if um, or a new jail, which is not something he, he asks for. You know, he really needs help and I'm hoping that Santa Clara County can feel like a beacon of hope if we can just have this alternative resource center that can really really um help people you know people um, are constantly circling back to to the jail that's currently there so whatever conditions um, you guys are seeing that's happening it doesn't keep people from you know going back there so they, I, I feel like people really just, um, we all need to help and community needs to be part of the framework. Our next speaker is Leslie Zeiger. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. 
Hello, my name is Leslie Zeiger. I live in District 5 and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, part of the Care First, Jail Last Coalition. What does it take to envision a future without incarceration? It starts with a willingness to set aside preconceptions and ask those most impacted. This process is decades overdue, but every time that prospect is raised, the county exec slaps back with recommendations for carceral facilities. We share Supervisor Ellenberg's concern, as expressed in her letter, that the report from the county executive ultimately recommends the construction of a loft facility. We urge you to center the voices of people impacted by incarceration and return to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 and to engage the community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel Kay. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Rachel Krantz. I live in District 5 and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I'm here to urge you to consider input from people with lived experience of incarceration and their families. I am a licensed clinical social worker, and I believe that people struggling with a mental health crisis should receive intervention by trained specialists who can diffuse a complex situation and connect them with ongoing treatment. This will happen most effectively in a community-based center, not a jail. In response to the November vote, Michael Tyree's sister Shannon said, having mental health support for people like Michael instead of a jail will change lives. It could have saved Michael. Once again, I call upon you to listen to those who have lived through incarceration and return to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 by engaging the community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Rendler. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is Diana Rendler. I live and work in Supervisor Chavez's district and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart, part of the Care, Care First Jail Last Coalition. I am here to call upon you to place community input front and center in considering how to re-envision the county's carceral system, in particular individuals and families who have experienced the current system and have knowledge and experience, which is crucial to this process. I am white and middle class. My privilege protects me from a lot, but we cannot depend on privilege. We have to build a system that protects everyone, especially because jails disproportionately traumatize low-income people and people of color. We or urge the board to return to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 by engaging the community in a robust process to create real alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julia Voss. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thanks. Hi, my name is Julia Voss and I live in District 6. My rep is Devorah, Va Devo is Devorah Davis and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart, part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. Like many of my colleagues, I'm here to call on you as the Board of Supervisors to place community input front and center when considering how to re-envision our county's cultural system. In particular, families and individuals who have experienced the current system and have knowledge and experience that it is vital to this process of re-envisioning. We at Surge share the concerns expressed in Supervisor Ellenberg's letter. The Board of Supervisors has repeatedly stated that they do not want a predetermined destination for a community-driven process, but this report is undeniably predetermined a detailed plan. The justice system is supposed to be committed to ensuring public safety, but increasingly, especially following the increase in activism around police and prison abolition in the past year, we're asking who's safety. In the past, that's been often defined as the richest, whitest citizens' best interests, what they think is their best interests. And the board had the board created a pathway for others, which they need to stick to. Our next speaker is Emma Hartung. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Emma Hartung. I live in District 4. I work in District 5. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, which is part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. 
I've seen firsthand how incarceration has traumatized my friends and trapped them in cycles of incarceration and made it that much harder for them to find stable housing and employment when all they really needed was stability and care and resources. This moment is an unprecedented opportunity to be imaginative, innovative, and to truly put communities care and racial justice first. And it makes no sense to put forward a locked facility yet again in this moment that would only subject communities to further violence. You as supervisors can choose something else. You can choose community input, non-carceral solutions, and a free and healthy and cared for Santa Clara. So urging you to listen to the voices of those most impacted by incarceration and to return to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 by engaging community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Larson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Brian Larson. I uh, live in District 2 um, and I'm a member of uh, Surge at Sacred Heart um, as part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. Coalition. I'm here to call upon you uh, to place the community input uh, front and center, uh, considering how to re-envision uh, re the county's carceral system, in particular, you know, families and individuals who have been directly impacted um, and have firsthand knowledge of this, uh, you know, I would like you guys to take those into consideration. And just anecdotally, you know, last year, uh, LA County Supervisor Sheila Cool said, we want uh, uh, people uh, who are more amenable to a treatment and then simply being locked up in a cell, which doesn't help them. They go out, they come back, they go out, they come back. Um, we need more services in the community in order to help those people get better. Um, LA County um, has since implemented a care first and jail last approach. Um, so we once again, uh, ask uh, upon you to uh, return to the. Our next speaker is Nicole Boaz. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, my name is Nicole Boaz. I live in District 2 and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and part of the Care First Jails Last Coalition. Uh, in November, we cheered the board's desire to look into non-carceral alternatives to a new jail, putting community input front and center. Those who know firsthand how destructive mass incarceration is are key to finding more humane approaches. But now the community starring role has shriveled down to that of a bit player, the voices of incarcerated people muted yet again. If we are to fulfill our potential as a model for other counties, community engagement must be the foundation for every step we take. We urge the board to return to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 by engaging the community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is the Shortino Foundation. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Shortino Foundation. Yes. Hi, my name is Kim Guptill. I work at the Shortino Foundation I, and I live in District 4 and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I'm here to urge you to look at the issues of incarceration and mental health through a new lens. At this moment, you have the opportunity to take leadership in offering alternatives to incarceration based upon principles of compassionate care. By implementing such a plan, you could offer sorely needed mental health and substance abuse treatment to members of our community and make Santa Clara County a model for other jurisdictions. Former Surgeon General David Sachter said, Satcher, excuse me, said, everyone in need must have access to high quality, effective, and affordable mental health services. Too often, our mental health problems are left to play themselves out in the nation's streets, homeless centers, and prisons. Once again, I call on you to prioritize the needs of our community in creating alternatives to a new jail by returning to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November. Our next speaker is Anna Zeiger. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is is Anna Zeiger. I live in Supervisor Simidian's district, and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. The Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors have repeatedly stated they do not want a predetermined destination to a community-driven process. 
this report is undeniably a predetermined and detailed plan. Therefore, we urge the Board of Supervisors to return to the original plan approved in November 2020, which we celebrated with you. What is vital to the integrity and credibility of this plan? Placing community input front and center in the process to imagine non-carceral alternatives to incarceration that care for people rather than harm them. Thank you. Our next speaker is Megan Sift. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, thank you. My name is Megan Swift and I live and work in District 4. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and I am dedicated to Care First, Jail Last. And I'm here to urge you to please address incarceration and mental health proactively using the innovation and compassion that Silicon Valley is known for. You can do better and you can do it today. You have the opportunity to take leadership in offering alternatives to incarceration based on the principles of compassionate care. Our community needs should not be met in jails and prisons. Implementing such a plan, you could provide mental health and substance abuse treatment to members of our community and make Santa Clara County a model for other jurisdictions. Please lead. Once again, I ask you to prioritize the needs of our community in creating alternatives to a new jail by returning to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November. Please. Thank you. Our next speaker is Samina Yusman, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, hello, my name is Samina Usman. I'm the government relations coordinator for the Council on American Islamic Relations. I urge the Board of Supervisors to, um, to, to listen to the Care First, Jail Last um, representatives who have been speaking today. Um, you know, to listen to community members who are um, really have their ear to the ground and who know what is necessary when it comes to um, finding solutions um, to the system that has been broken. The system has not worked. Um, it's uh, it's funny because I, I was thinking, is it a Band-Aid solution? No, it's not because it's like a toxic Band-Aid that's been put on the issue. What needs to happen is to look at the root causes to be able to find ways in order to find alternatives to incarceration because this is it's not working. It's costly and it's breaking families apart. So please listen to this coalition, listen to community members, and find alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Raj Jayadev. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. From the beginning of this process to move away from the construction of a new jail, county board and community members repeatedly lifted up how critical a robust community engagement process would be for care first jail last plan. The plan charted out by the county executive's office in this report is an explicit departure from this community centered approach. In the three part framework, it describes the scope of work, the roles of consultants and a timeline of how administration will inform board decisions. The role of community, which was originally intended to be the foundation of this entire initiative is so severely limited that it's hard to see how it has any influence in the direction or outcome of this plan at all. In short, this report feels cooked, it feels like a roadmap back to building a jail, but the activities laid out by the, by, for the county staff and consultants to report back on are not irreconcilable to the community engagement approach. A number of the activities can simply be absorbed into an expanded community engagement process. In this way, we are in agreement with Supervisor Elmberg's response to the county executive report and call for a return to community leadership. Our next speaker is Emily Hendon. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, my name is Emily Hendon. I live in District 4. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and part of the Care First Jail's Last Coalition. What does it take to envision a future without incarceration? It starts with the willingness to entertain previously unimagined solutions and to set aside preconceptions. This is a process that is decades overdue. But every time that tantalizing prospect is raised, the county slaps back with the same old refrain. We must build a jail. We need locked facilities. We share Supervisor Ellenberg's concern as expressed in her letter that the report from the county executive ultimately suggests the construction of a locked facility. 
We urge you to listen to the voices of those most impacted by incarceration and return to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November of 2020 by engaging the community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharice Domingo. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. My name is Sharice Namo Debug and the Care First Jail Last Coalition. We urge the board to return to the commitment you made in November 2020 that there be a robust community process that can imagine alternatives to incarceration. This process has been stalled for four months because the county exec's office keeps coming up with reports that make you have to revisit this decision over and over, despite the direction that the board has clearly stated to move towards these alternatives. And I'd like to emphasize to the board why we need to give community, not just the county administration, the space, the tools, and the meaningful roles we need to step into. To. We are not just bullet points in this framework. Joe Vehar didn't spend over two years in solitary confinement in this jail to have his voice be a bullet point. Michael Tyree was supposed to be free. What he was waiting for was bed space in the community, and his story should not be a bullet point. This is where the call for change came from, the families most directly impacted, and this is where the most innovative ideas can be birthed. Thank you. Our next speaker is House of Israel. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Incarceration is a form of torch that's prohibited a prohibited war crime. To obtain private shareholder beneficial ownership interests in the United States Corporation, we demand an audit of every bond traded against the Social Security account number, FTC, <laughs> administration, to claim each man or lady as a surety and each imprisoned the, for each estate's thrift funds for the embezzlement to use as appropriation. So therefore we demand an audit to produce the 8822B, the 2848, the 56 and the 56F from the IRS for each estate that you're holding in prison, as well the 1099s for the tax assessments for every year that you've held those estates for the reporting of the estate pillage. And that information needs to be provided via fax 888-878-6660 upon this request. And this is upon the official record and not public. Our next speaker is Lauren Renaud. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is Florin Renaud. I live in Cindy Chavez, District 2, and I'm a member of Surge of Sacred Heart, part of the Care First GLS Coalition. I call on you to place community input front and center in considering how to re-envision the county's carceral system. Month after month, families impacted by the current system have been showing up here and demanding alternatives, not simply a nicer jail. We share the concerns expressed in Supervisor Ellenberg's letter. The board has repeatedly stated they do not want a predetermined destination, but this report is undeniably a predetermined detailed plan toward a new locked facility. I implore you to come at this with a truly open mind and really listen to what your constituents say they need and want. Look at what they've been able to do in LA County. Alternatives really are possible. Be bold and be a leader for others. We urge the board to return to the original plan approved in November 2020 by you all and by engaging the community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cecilia Chavez. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good, good morning. My name is Cecilia Travis and I am in Otto's Lee's district and I'm speaking on item 10. The report back on a framework for the county's justice involved clients is a plan that conflicts with our shared goals to construct a new jail rather than a non carceral structure. True community engagement means the community is also constructing the framework that drives and guides this care first jail last vision. I don't know how many times I've called um, to speak on this issue. Uh, this is at least the third time that um, what seems to be a straightforward process where the community is speaking and asking the county to do a, an approach where we are healing the community rather than incarcerating and punishing. The county comes up with a whole new plan, swings it our way last minute, and then 
we we speak up and we bring this issue back again the community wants a our next speaker is Michelle Coleman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Michelle Coleman. I live in District 4 and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart. Creating a more humane future has always started with entertaining previously unimaginable solutions, things undreamt of in our philosophy. Community input is vital to this process. Heeding the voices of those who have been most impacted by incarceration is vital to this process. Families of those currently incarcerated have repeatedly shared the message from the loved ones inside that they are not calling for a nicer jail. They are calling for a reimagining of our system for a care first approach. I share Supervisor Ellenberg's concern that the county executive's report is suggesting the construction of a locked facility. The Board of Supervisors has repeatedly stated they do not want a predetermined destination for the community development process. Please stick with that commitment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrew Bigelow. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm an organizer for Silicon Valley Debug and work with families um, who have loved ones uh, who are currently incarcerated in Santa Clara County uh, in Maine Jail. Um, I just want to echo everything that's already been said that, uh, that, that this report seems to be predetermined um, in ending at the result of building a new cage facility. Um, and if I could add anything um, to what's been said, um, uh, community needs to be driving this, um, and that and that includes going back to that original uh, process that was voted on in November 2020. And community needs to be driving this process. It needs to be creating what this process is, and not a, a process that gets dictated to the community that will eventually end with whatever you know predetermined goals, uh, whether the county executive office has or or, or the board. Um, so when we say invest in the community process, really give into the community process. Our next speaker is Crispy. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Crispy. I live and work in Supervisor Ellenberg's District 4 and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and I strongly believe in Care First, Jail Last. I'm here to call upon you to place community input front and center in considering how to re-envision the county's carceral system. In particular, individuals and families who have experienced the current system have knowledge and experience, which is vital to this process. We share the concerns expressed in Supervisor Ellenberg's letter. The Board of Supervisors has repeatedly stated they do not want a predetermined destination of community-driven process, but this report is undeniably a predetermined detailed plan. I am a survivor of violent crime. I have seen firsthand the impacts of mass incarceration on the community and the data supports that punitive systems do not work to ensure public safety. We see time and again that those closest to the problem can help solve the problem. We urge the board to return to the original plan approved by the supervisors in November 2020 by engaging the community in a robust process to create non-carceral alternatives to incarceration. Thank you and have a good day. Our next speaker is Lori Catcher. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Lori Catcher. I live and work in District 2 and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and a part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I am also here to call upon you to place community input front and center in considering how to re-envision our county's carceral system. The individuals and families who have experienced the current system have the knowledge and experience which is vital to this process. I have been on these calls for months. Um, today, I heard um, voices of families whose loved ones are incarcerated or have been. Um, I heard Melissa speak earlier. I heard Molly speak earlier. Um, these families who are impacted should be your consultants on this issue. They are the ones who know um, how to 
reimagine what is caring and compassionate. Our next speaker is Colum Tresnan. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Hi, my name is Callum Tresnan. I am an undergraduate student at Stanford University and a member of Abolished Stanford, part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. We share the concerns expressed in Supervisor Ellenberg's letter. We've heard the Board of Supervisors repeatedly state that they do not want a predetermined destination for a community-driven process. But this report is undeniably a predetermined plan. The Board needs to center system impacted folks and their families in their decision making follow the community's lead and divest from incarceration. I urge you to make community input the center of your consideration in re-envisioning the county's carceral system. In particular, individuals and families who have experienced the current system, who have knowledge and experience, which is vital to this process. Please engage the community, put the community first, care first, jail last. Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. Uh, for uh, this uh, care first model to actually work in Santa Clara County, uh, we need the other agencies to function properly. Uh, you know, I, I, I keep kind of steering this back to our behavioral health and mental health system. Uh, you know, people only get put on holds for several hours, they get kicked back loose. Um, if we could take care of those people properly, you know, maybe we could focus on what we need to fix in the jails. Um, jail is also, and people might get offended by this, um, and I really don't mean any disrespect by this, but some people need to be in jail, and jail is jail. I, I, I mean, I get the innocent until proven guilty. I'm getting frustrated with watching so many things on TV um, that are just not holding people accountable. It really is not. And if we just let everybody loose and do whatever they want, take a look out your front door right now. We need a functioning jail. We need people held accountable, but we need people to be able to go to rehab, psych wards, and all the proper places. Our next speaker is Carmen Vaz. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. Unfortunately, Carmen Vaz is using an older version of Zoom and will not be able to speak. Our next speaker is Alicia Chavez, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is Alicia Chavez and I, I am in Auto Lease um, District. And I, I just want to reiterate everything that has been said already. Um, I just want to be mindful of people's time. Uh, but I also want you all to be mindful of our time. You know, we've spent countless hours waiting for this item to be heard on various different meetings. And please be considerate of what the community has been asking for since back in November. You know, we take this very seriously. We work with individuals who are currently detained with their families. Please hear out their voices. Um, Please consider what the community is saying. Well, not only consider, please do what the community is, is saying. We want an approach to mental health that is going to serve everyone, that is in everyone's interest. And that is not a jail. That is not a jail. Let me just leave it at that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Benay Vahar. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, good afternoon, um, Board of Supervisors. Thank you so much um, for having um, this. Um, my name is Benay Vihar. Um, I'm an organizer with Silicon Valley Debug. Um, you know, we've been going through this for a long time now, um, different, different um, areas of this. Um, I just want to um, ask you to for the framework for the county to just involve their clients is a plan that conflicts with our shared goals to construct a new jail rather than a non-carceral structure to community true community engagement means the community is also constructing the framework the framework that drives and guides this care first and jails last version thank you and that concludes our public comment 
Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate that. Board members, before we um, continue, again, this is items 10 and 22 being heard concurrently. And Dr. Smith and Martha will hear from you in just a minute. And I know Mr. Draper is on number 22. I wanted you all to know that after this item is concluded, we are going to move items 20 and 21 forward to hear them next, as we have numerous health and hospital and behavioral staff members waiting um, to answer any questions that the board may have. Jeff, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, before you is a product uh, that staff understood the board to be asking for at our last discussion of uh, this issue. Um, we uh, tried to frame it uh, as a um, three principles that we heard from the board pretty clearly and loudly. Number one, to minimize the um, incarceration of individuals as much as possible with services before incarceration to prevent that ha from happening with services for re-entry and for expansion of behavioral health services. Um, the board is aware that we've been embarking on many of those efforts for 10 plus years. Um, and I can't uh, say that without pointing out one real positive thing that's happened over those 10 years is that pre-adjudication clients um, used to be monitored or still are monitored by pre-trial. Used to be only about 500 individuals. These are individuals who were not incarcerated because um, they were able to be monitored in their homes, in the community, uh, without incarceration, pre-adjudication. Um, now, as of the day before yesterday, the count is up to 2,601. That's 2,100 individuals who were not incarcerated after they were booked. Um, that's a big success, as well as a number of efforts to get people with behavioral health problems out of jail. Um, consistently. Um, but the second big issue that we heard the board say is that they wanted to find a way to decommission Main Jail North and parts of Elmwood, which are currently substandard and require um, operations that um, keep people in their cell for 23 hours a day. Um, and the third principle that we heard was to improve behavioral health services for those individuals who ultimately do end up incarcerated because of decisions made in court. So we're suggesting those three principles as guiding lights. And we came up with a proposed schedule based on what the board discussed at the last meeting, uh, referring the issue to public safety and justice, suggesting expertise uh, be hired from the outside to give uh, the committee and the board further information. So with that, I will uh, stop and be appropriate, take appropriate questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll look forward. I'm also trying to work in 22 with this, but I don't see that happening right now with Mr. Draper and what you've just present, prevented, <laughs> presented, Dr. Smith. Do you wish? Martha to, can give us an update. This is a supplemental Martha. allowance to um, finish the demolition related to additional problems that were identified in the demolition. But Martha, you want to give them more detail? Martha, do you have any comments? I have no additional comments. Uh, I'm going to invite Pon Chavance from FAF just to make a brief comment to um, add to what Jeff just said. Okay. Anything beyond the report? Looking? No, nothing beyond the report. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisors, I turn the conversation to you now. Anyone wish? Supervisor Allenberg. Thank you very much, um, and and thank you to the the 
the many speakers that, that took time this morning to share their uh, thoughts and responses um, with the board and with our administration. I was concerned that this item didn't address the request from the board uh, for a process for selecting a facilitator uh, for the community conversations. And attached uh, to the uh, agenda is the letter um, that a number of people referenced that I submitted to my colleagues regarding these concerns. And I'd like to direct administration to coordinate with my office, please, and report back to the board with the information requested before the next board meeting on March 23rd. Uh, I have some additional questions regarding the report. I'm curious first to understand whether, um, Dr. Smith, in your view, this plan coincides with or supersedes the plan to discuss jail construction at the main jail south site. Dr. Smith. Our understanding from staff to try to address both questions was that the board wanted to set up the community involvement discussion themselves in public safety and justice. So we specifically excluded trying to um, make a specific recommendation about how that should be done since the board made it clear they wanted to do that. And number two question is, um, no, I don't see this as superseding any discussion. I see this as a step back to look at a big picture and to treat um, our incarcerated clients in a continuum of care mode. So the board has the opportunity to look at as many options as they would like. Um, what we heard from the board last time is that there was a time limit. So we tried to uh, suggest that we get some outside uh, expertise to help the board, but we're not trying to decide for the board what they should end up deciding. <laughs> so I, I, the, the first part is, is not quite right. We specifically did direct you to come back with a plan for community engagement. And in fact, you had mentioned some of the, the possible facilitators. So we can, we can relook at that language uh, together, but uh, that that was that is not my understanding of of what we had agreed to, and in fact, we were holding off on our end, particularly waiting for the recommendations uh, from administration. But it, we can move forward um, now. It, as the demolition of Main Jail North and sections of Elmwood occur, where would the existing inmate population be housed? I think that depends on what kind of approach the board wants to have in the future. Um, I know that there are a range of considerations. Some individuals from the public suggest that uh, the board not have an incar a carceral facility whatsoever. So if that was the decision and it was able to be done, then, uh, then I don't think the question would be a problem. If uh, the board decides that a carceral facility is necessary, they would need to decide where, when, how, what it looks like, and all of those issues related. Mike, I, I, I agree, but my question is about the timing. Um, if Main Jail North and parts of Elmwood are begin to be demolished before this process is finished, I worry that that... For, for, yeah. Our four-legged friends. <laughs> he has an opinion too. I am so sorry. Um, but what I'm concerned about is that a premature demolition might then de facto necessitate the construction of a new jail. Well, we clearly could not demolish uh, the jail until we emptied it. So I don't think the goal that we heard is that the board wanted to have um, get rid of the main jail north and get rid of some sections of Elmwood that are substandard. But of course, you know, we have to get the current inmates out of there. Fair enough. 
Fair enough. Just wanted to con confirm that. Thank you. Uh, the report mentions the creation of a first rate assessment center. Um, having not, I didn't hear about that before, and I'm interested to know what you envision that would look like, its purpose, and proposed location. And wondering if this is a, a redesign or a, or a reconception of the inmate booking um, that focuses on pretrial diversion located out of jail, or would this be a separate? no entry facility that diverts individuals from custody altogether. We tried to stay uh, big picture because um, my understanding from the board is they want uh, to decide and with input from the community exactly how to do that. However, you do point out some important issues that the courts um, and the law require us to do a booking process for certain individuals who are arrested and um, we do need to have some ability to do that and some location to do that. Currently, it's done in Main Jail North. And obviously, if Main Jail North goes away, we'd have to have some location to do um, booking. Um, it could uh -huh. be on this site. It could be someplace else. It just needs to be someplace. If, if the board accepts this report today as presented, I see three possible outcomes regarding facility construction. An independent locked forensic facility slash mental health treatment facility, a dedicated forensic unit within a new jail, an assessment center separate from custody, which diverts individuals entirely from entering the justice system, or restructuring of the inmate booking located within the jail. Can you say at this point, Dr. Smith, which of those three it will be? And is it possible that the outcome could be something that is not outlined in your report? Um, we got the clear message from the board uh, listening to the community input that there was no predestined results. So we tried to leave the options as open as we could think of. And so I don't think the um, conclusions that you spoke of are the only conclusions. It could be a number of different things, but um, I'm not, um, I'm clear that uh, the board does not design or desire to have a predestined decision. Just I'm having, I appreciate hearing that. I'm just having a hard time reconciling what you're saying from, from the report that we, that we got. Um, in my view, what I'm seeing is that administration has provided, provided us and the public with a work plan, really, that we, that we didn't ask for, and that includes options for approval that haven't been before presented to the board. And while the recommendation, recommended action today is, is simply to receive the report, in reality, it's understood that by receiving it, the board is really approving administration's plan to proceed in a particular direction. Um, and in my view, receipt of the report would be contrary to board direction from the February 23rd meeting where we agreed that the community conversations would proceed work in any of, the, of those directions. And the report to me um, feels like an explicit departure from the community-centered approach, which my colleagues and I agreed to. Um, I'm also concerned that the, this proposed work plan relegates community voice to really a perfunctory role and moves forward with, with one of these three predetermined outcomes. Um, again, including an option that we hadn't before considered. The work plan doesn't reflect the process approved by the board as a whole, that both facility studies and the master plan study be initiated only after completion of the community engagement process to reimagine public safety, so that both the study and the master plan would be informed by direction provided by the community. The board's commitment to center this process on the voices and needs of those impacted by these systems and by other community stakeholders who deserve to weigh in on this major public impact project, I think are being ignored. Um, 
or at very best, really minimized. While work has been approved for administrative staff in parallel to the community process, there's no acknowledgement that it, that administration will not allow their parallel work to supersede recommendations gained through the community process if the work isn't if that work is not supported in the report that will be produced at the conclusion of the 120 day process. Should the community report, which will be created by an expert facilitator with backing from medical and psychiatric experts and supported by best practices gained in other communities, not support any of the recommendations drafted in parallel by administration, what would happen next in your view? Well, I would say that the board at the last meeting asked us to um, give a work plan of what the administration would suggest as a way forward. And, um, and there was the commitment to have a, a parallel process with input. Um, obviously, nothing happens until the board agrees that it happens. Receiving this report really just receives the report. The board is free to change it, modify it, make additional um, comments. Um, you know, we're, we're just throwing a report out there that we think reflects the high priorities that the board had for minimizing incarceration and um, making sure that we treat our clients as um, receiving a continuum of care. Um, so, of course, I don't agree. I don't disagree with either of those end goals. Um, I absolutely want us to minimize incarceration. I absolutely want us to provide the very best uh, service and care at every level uh, at which people um, touch our system. But I see how the community heard this report. I know how I heard the report. And I can't, if I want to engage in these community conversations in a truly authentic way um, and say that we are open and listening, I can't support receiving the report um, uh, today because I really feel that it does direct us toward one or more. Um, capital projects. And because I really, really am cons committed to centering this work on the direction provided by those whom we've elected to serve, I'm not going to um, support receipt today. And I will look forward to working with administration on identifying a facilitator, getting these community conversations in place, um, and letting them know up front, based on where we where we all end up today, what uh, what range of issues they really are being asked to to consider, whether it's broad or narrow, I will be absolutely clear with with what is what is and what isn't on the table. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. Next, Supervisor, anybody have a hand raised? See, see, oh, Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you, President Wilson. I just want to uh, uh, ask some clarifying questions regarding the uh, current report uh, as prepared by staff uh, of the proposed uh, timeline. I just want to understand because um, certainly one of the most important thing we have uh, given the staff the uh, directions earlier is to make sure that we are doing uh, a lot of robust uh, community input. So I just want to make sure that the, the various things listed on the timeline uh, satisfy that, or if there's any other way we could do a better job to get more community-based input. I certainly want to you know, hear from my uh, colleagues uh, uh, on the board here. So currently the timeline, the way it's listed is first uh, March and April is to basically hire um, a facilitator to coordinate the community input sessions. So basically to get the process started, we're going to get uh, some facilitators to help out. According to the letter uh, of uh, 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 Supervisor Umber. Uh, Supervisor Lee, you're going in and out. There. Oh, I'm sorry. Can there I... you go. That's better. There you Is go. It, okay. I, I, my apologies. I'll get myself closer to the mic. Yes. 
has been the toughest. But, uh, no problem. I, we were losing you at according to Supervisor Ellenberg's letter. Yes, at least I don't have any bunnies or dogs running behind me. So I'm That's sure. right. <laughs> Sorry for Susan. Um, yes, the um, one one issue that she did mention, which I think is great potential partners that you mentioned, is the Haywood Burns Institute, the Bear Institute of Justice, Designing Justice of Oakland and Everyday Democracy, uh, and of course the other groups as well. I just want to check in with with uh, um, our uh, staff. Uh, are these the type of uh, non-traditional facilitators? Uh, we we're talking about in terms of engaging in March and April. I don't know that um, when you say non-traditional facilitators, I'm not quite sure what you mean. But um, I think a facilitator is just that. It's not a director. It's a person who has special knowledge of operations of the law of um, other issues that they can contribute to the conversation. They don't direct the conversation, they just facilitate it. Okay, all right, so uh, I apologize. So this is only just getting the facilitators on board and then we'll then decide who else will be engaged. Uh, and then the next step you said is um, uh, um, that the, the other part about the community input is uh, in April and May, there is the conducting the community input sessions in partnership with PSJC over a period of 120 days. It says starting in April uh, or May 2021, and that is dependent upon when the facilitator is being engaged. Is that correct? Those are just projections that we had based on the timeline. Um, you know, I don't think they're written in stone. It would basically boil down to, in my mind, right. once the board felt um, through the subcommittee that they had sufficient information and input. Um, those timelines are fungible. Sure. Um, and then uh, after that, we have all the way to August to uh, to potentially come up back uh, from the PSJC to recommendation to the board um, in approximately August timeframe. And then at the end, based on the input to come back to the board by September, 2021, uh, on those uh, issues, namely um, cost benefit analysis of mental health treatment center, accessing the efforts of reduced jail population due to COVID, jail population study, including analysis of mental health, um, reporting to the board committee, except Hewitt, facility needs assessment, county correctional systems master plan, the cost of facility improvements versus building replacement facilities, uh, report and findings relating to regional mental health facility, assurances related to compliance for sustainability master plan and present the service model or operational plan for Elmwood. So um, the idea is that we will have to get all those input first, right, before you go ahead and give us this report. That's the purpose of the whole community input, isn't it? The way we were envisioning it and hearing it from the board is they wanted the board wanted as much information as possible to give as many opportunities and options as possible. And so that's what we're suggesting. Of course, the board can do it in a different way if they'd like. Okay. All right. Now, um, I guess there's a concern from the speakers today that the, the feeling is that even though it says community input sessions that we're doing, uh, that this might not be sufficient in terms of how robust the uh, community input is and that there's some type of potentially predetermined uh, facility that we're talking about. When I read the, the process here, at least I'm not seeing that there's a predetermined facility we're talking about. Basically, we are opening up basically all options as available. I guess one the predetermined factors might be the fact that we need to get rid of Mangel North. We need to get rid of those dilapidated buildings in uh, Elmwood, that's been really, really old and in bad shape, and I, I believe everybody in this room agreed on that. But other than that, I don't believe there's there's honestly a predetermined facility that we're talking about, other than opening up the the uh, the community possession. So I, I just want to make sure the process is going to be robust, and that everybody, uh, whether those who have been incarcerated, whether those who are active in the community, like like the ones uh, cited in the. Supervisor Ellenberg's letter, um, 
people with like potential partners with relative experiences like the, the Hayward Burns Institute, Fair Institute, uh, Design Justice and Justice, et cetera. Those all will be engaged and be reached out to, am I correct, uh, 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 Dr. Smith? That would be our suggestion from administration, yes. Okay, thank you. Is that it, Supervisor? Yeah, and that's all the questions I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure I I'm not sure I entirely understood the the responses to Supervisor Lee's um, points, um, but but Dr. Smith, just if I if I could, um, and and Supervisor Lee, if this is if this is a different understanding than you have, I, I would want to understand. I would want to hear from you um, on on the on the um, on the report, uh, Dr. Smith. It, it appears to me that you're you're trying your very best to hear five people and um, navigate all the different motions and. Um, directives and perspectives of the board. And so I just to be very clear that the staff um, will be supporting uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's process through Public Safety and Justice Committee with Supervisor Wasserman and will be taking no additional actions outside of that process until the process is complete. Is Correct. that right? Okay. That was our understanding. Uh, our understanding was to support the process, provide some external expertise and as much internal uh, information as is available so that everyone has baseline information and can make the decisions of, that need to be made, whatever those decisions are ultimately made by the board. So, um, and when you say Dr. Smith, internal information is, does, could you say, and could you just give me a couple of examples of what that information is? Well, I'm, I'm presuming that the um, board and the public might wanna know issues like how many uh, individuals in, incarcerated are pre-adjudicated or post-adjudicated, how many have been sentenced post uh, AB 109 for longer terms than would typically be uh, in a county jail, how many individuals have a diagnosis of major uh, mental illness and how many individuals are in um, you know, maximum security and what the options are for um, a booking process and some discussion about administrative booking, which we've changed considerably over the last few months. I just mean, you know, everybody should, I'm anticipating everybody wants to know all that information. Got it. And so um, then, then, the governing direction for the for the the way the staff is proceeding is the November 2020 action that the board took to to have this robust community process. That's my understanding and intent. Okay. If then, we didn't get it quite right in the transmittal, I apologize. It's helpful to just to just get this cleared up, and I and I do just want to acknowledge that um, that one thing that was helpful for me reading the report was really to get a sense from you all of uh, the different um, direction that you've gotten, and I think that the board's attempt to collaborate with each other has made it less clear for you, and so I the reason I'm stating this to my colleagues is that if we're in agreement that the November 2020 um, board action is the 
is the direction, then the way I would look at the, um, the information provided here today and the way I would look at other information requests would be very simply that they are uh, information requests and, and not, not directives beyond requests for information. Is that how you understand it, Dr. Smith? Yes, that's how I understand it. Thank you. Subhat, were you continuing or was- No, no, thank you. You, you, you finished, thank you. I don't see a hand up for Supervisor Simidian. Um, I'll just say, as, as was said before, um, for me, this is clearly not an either or situation. Personally, I feel we need a new jail and we need to create a new mental health facility locally or regionally, and we need to pursue non-carceral alternatives. I think all those things are doable. I think all those things are worth further investigation. And that will conclude my comments. Any other supervisor? We're now voting on item number 10, and then we'll handle 22 in just a minute. If no I, other, I'm sorry, Supervisor Chavez? I'll, I'll wait till Supervisor Ellenberg. I saw her hand up before I... Sure, yeah. Supervisor Ellenberg. Thanks. And um, Supervisor Wasserman, I, I appreciate what you just said, and I, and I um, not necessarily agreeing or disagreeing with the content, but what I just want to be clear about, and Supervisor Chavez, I think, helped in establishing this clarity, that we are going to center com real community engagement in this process of deciding which of any of those three options that you just mentioned or other options that haven't been mentioned um, are going to be reviewed and discussed and considered by the community before we do anything in terms of taking down, decommissioning existing buildings, starting to build something new. And I, I specifically agreed to a 120 day process to keep this as tight as possible so that it wouldn't you know, go on for a year or more. But I'm, I'm asking for my colleagues to reconfirm their, the integrity of that process as happening first and then advising what goes forward. Thank you. I, I think you and I disagree on that, but what we're doing here is receiving a report. Um, my personal opinion is Main Jail South is down. Main Jail North and Elmwood need to be replaced. And as was said earlier in this conversation, we need to put the people that need to be in jail into an appropriate place. Um, I believe that'll be the new Main Jail South, but this is a discussion for another day. Right. Do you, do you disagree with the process or with the outcome? I just want to understand that because I believe that our board, as a majority of the board, which means that, that that's the direction, agreed to center the community process and not make decisions before that process is finished. Thank you. I personally disagree with not continuing with Main Jail South. We put out an RFP. We have an approved bid. And where the where people are living, where people are now, Elmwood and Main Jail North, are not where people should be. And the sooner we can rebuild a brand new state of the art Main Jail South, we can put the people that need to be in jail into an appropriate jail that is healthy and safe and everything else. And nothing can happen with Elmwood and Main Jail North until we have that replacement facility. But again, that's not what we're voting on here today. What we're voting on here today is we're holding everything up. We're going to have more public comment. Um, I've said before, I've been through this three different times in my 11 years, and almost a third of the speakers today mentioned how many meetings they had been to. So I know there's a lot more discussion to go. I know that's the direct direction, discussion, public input um, that we've given, and Dr. Smith, Smith said that he's going to do. Um, I think that the public is talking about all three facilities. Personally, I'm talking about two, but that's not to be decided today. That, that's, and I'm only one person out of five. 
So that, that that's that's not the issue today. I'm sure we'll have more discussions shortly. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I was just gonna, <clears throat> what I wanted to do is I was just gonna move um, the, I was gonna move, uh, make a motion that just reaffirms that we're following the framework of the November 2020 um, direction and that the report that accompanied, that the report that's before us um, be considered as background um, uh, information and research uh, possibilities, because that's really what the staff laid out for us. And that would be my motion. Thank you. Supervisor Sumidian. Um, <clears throat> before we get to a second, I would just ask Supervisor Chavez if she would consider amending the motion. We, uh, as the staff report indicates, we've had conversations and provided direction subsequent to that November meeting. So if you simply limit it to the November meeting, then that would mean that the subsequent conversations, clarifications and directions were perhaps no longer relevant or moot. I don't know if that's the intention of the motion, but I wouldn't be comfortable with that. And um, I'll, I'll just say, I, I am finding these conversations more frustrating every time we have them. Uh, and I think um, I understand the desire of everyone to nail down what's happening and how it's happening. But what I agreed to back in November, colleagues, was a proposal that said, you know what? We gotta give more thought to the importance of mental health facilities and services in lieu of yep. incarceration. And let's stop what we're doing while we give that issue the consideration it requires and deserves. I voted aye on that. I'm still an eye on that. But it doesn't mean that the world comes to a standstill, that we don't go about doing our work on a daily basis. And, you know, as I've said before, five, 10 or 20 years from now, we're going to need some kind of jail. We're going to definitely need to improve our mental health capacity for folks who are justice involved. And we've got an obligation to deal with the folks we've got currently in place. I, I have been supportive of the time out when we had our meeting, I believe it was in February. Uh, I said I was you know, sort of willing for the staff to uh, commit to not moving forward with any uh, decision making, but that I thought that they should continue to do their work and do the research and information gathering that would inform our opinion when the time came to make it once again. So <clears throat> that's where I am. And that's why I would ask Supervisor Chavez to perhaps give um, some thought to whether or not her motion uh, as initially uh, comp composed was a little too narrow because we've made other directions since then and that's reflected in the staff report. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, thank you. I, the way I interpreted the staff report was that most of the direction in here was intended to be research oriented. And so what I just said a minute ago, or I thought I said was that we treat the document as the way I read it, which is a series of requests for information, which if you want to add the word research supervisor submitting, and I, I, I think I intended it to mean the same thing. No, thank you. Through the chair, what I was concerned about, uh, Supervisor Chavez, was the specific reference to, and it sounded like limitation to what happened in November. And as the staff report indicates, we have provided um, direction uh, at subsequent meetings. So if we want to say pursuant to prior direction, mm -hmm. you know, at meetings in November through March, that's fine uh, that from, from my standpoint, but limiting it to one meeting when we've so clearly provided additional direction, I think would be um, a change of course uh, and not one I could support. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, I'm, I'm, so, um, so let me just say again, um, and perhaps I'll try to be more clear that the overriding discussion we had in November was to engage the community. What I'm trying to reaffirm for the number of people who came to speak, but also to confirm with my colleagues is that our primary objective over the next 120 days is to actually do community engagement as a 
a lead action that the board is, we're not changing direction on that. And one of the reasons I'm affirming that is that the way the staff report is structured is that it adds additional directives that I'm not sure were included in any earlier directives that the board gave. I'm not trying to undo any board action where the board took a majority vote, only to say that there are a series of recommendations that they make that I think can be rooted in research and information. So I was just reaffirming that we're having a public process and that the um, that the actions, that the additional actions that the staff is offering up be considered as information gathering, which I think they ultimately would be because people will want information about costs and other ideas. That's how I was interpreting it. And I would- be, Forgive me. Supervisor Smidian. No, Supervisor Chavez wasn't complete. I thought she had stopped, forgive me. I, thought... I, I can't remember what I was gonna say. Go ahead, Joe. Well, I was just going to say what, what I heard a minute ago was the desire to eliminate some of the items in today's staff report, uh, if I heard you correctly, Supervisor. So I'm trying to understand what that is. I, I I'm believe not that saying that. What it, here's what I'm saying. The staff gave us an information report that reflects both board action that was taken in the past, but some new and additional ideas. The way they structured those new and additional ideas, I don't, I don't want to say those are the ideas we should take forward, but if they're going to be doing, I'm assuming that they're going to be doing research on those ideas so that they can respond to questions like cost, timeline, and those kinds of things. So that's really what I was just trying to, to reaffirm so that it didn't look like the board was giving yet another set of direction before we finished the community process which is how, when I read this report, I found it a little confusing because that's how I interpreted it. Supervisor Smidian. No comment. Supervis any other supervisors? So we have a motion by Supervisor yeah. Chavez. Yeah. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, I, I was, I'm gonna second it, uh, Cindy, and, and uh, sorry, Supervisor Chavez, and, and let's see if I, we could work this out. I, I want to make this all work out at the end of the day as I've always tried to do. So your motion is uh, using the November 17th uh, referral as the foundation, right? And then the, the timeline as stated currently would be as an informational uh, approach going forward, which I, I think is, is definitely. Uh, one thing I do want to highlight, if I look at the timeline specifically, if you look at a lot of the issues mentioned on the September 2021, such as cost benefit analysis, assess the reduced jail population, um, the studies including mental health, uh, the facility needs assessment. Uh, a lot of those issues have been, those are exactly what was adopted in the November uh, meeting uh, as proposed by my predecessor, Supervisor Cortesi. And then some of the other ones that came through, which is the Correctional System Master Plan. Um, actually, no, the, the next one, the the the, the the same improvement versus building replacement that actually was in November as well. Um, and then uh, uh, the regional mental health, I believe, came in last meeting uh, with suggestion of Supervisor um, Smidian. Um, and the sustainability master plan is something I think I added last time. Uh, so, so I believe most of the ones that we're talking about really is capturing all the different meetings that we have tried to, and then staff, I think, has, has done the done a, 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 a yeoman's job to try to put all that together. Uh, so it seems to me that this does capture quite a bit of what we have progressed from November until most recent, the last meeting. Um, I just wanna make sure are, are we in the same page to make sure that we're agree agreement on that. Yeah, I, that's exactly right. The, the, thank you. The only point that I was making is that all most of this, or it seems to me all of it, has been is information mm -hmm. that again a public process would benefit from the board would benefit from right and, and I'm none totally of them trying to reaffirm that okay. reaffirm that we're still doing a community process that we're not giving direction to choose an option right yes that's right um okay. yeah so right. yeah I'll Second that motion, yeah. uh, as, as, as stated, uh, make, make, with that clarifying point, I'll go ahead and second that motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I was, Dr. Smith. I'm sorry, Supervisor Smith, is your hand? Okay, Dr. Smith. It is back up when it's my turn, Supervisor. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Smith and Supervisor Smith. Well, I would wait for uh, Supervisor Smitty, and I just want to, at the end of the um, motion, to go through exactly what the board is requesting, because I I want to be absolutely 100% clear what we're going to be doing as staff. <laughs> Understood. Supervisor Smitty. Thank you. Along those lines, uh, colleagues, uh, I, I'd like to ask the maker and the seconder, um, does the motion as it now stands include and incorporate and continue the January 26 items of which there are three at packet page 60 and the February 23rd item at packet page 61 which has seven bulleted points as direction, are all of those incorporated in the motion or did they get um, uh, eliminated as a result of the motion? So that's the, that was the issue I was trying to get to uh, earlier when I was expressing my concern about the November uh, reference point. Supervisor Chavez. Uh, this motion does not change any previous direction given by the board. So any actions that the board took, it, it doesn't it doesn't withdraw them. And it, the, the only point I was trying to make, clearly not clearly enough or not in agreement with my colleagues, was this. I wanted to assure the public that we that in, in none of this that I read, did we give direction relative to an outcome? Most of, in fact, the way I read all of this is that we were really asking for more information. That information could be available for the public process. Some of it won't be done in time. Some of that information would come back to the board in due time and whatever that timeline is. So I'm not recommending we undo any previous action only to affirm to the community and reaffirm with my colleagues that this was information gathering, not direction. And, you know, and that, that was it. And so if, the, if that's not clear and you, I, I'm more than happy to withdraw the motion and, and have another motion come forward because I, I'm not trying to be unclear. I'm trying to relate to the public and reflect up with my colleagues what I think the intent of the series of requests for information that we've given, not direction to outcomes, which I don't think we gave. Thank you. I, I, I now have three requests of the maker and the seconder for friendly amendments, which I hope they'll be willing to incorporate into the motion, which I hope we'll be able to support in a moment. The first request is that as we direct um, uh, staff and refer items to public safety and justice, particularly with respect to a, um, a public process for garnering input, that we specifically uh, direct that, pro that that process will be countywide in its scope. Okay. Yes. The second, the second request is that we Ex explicitly, explicitly uh, request and direct that the process seek out a range of views. That's all. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And the yes. third is that the administration look at the utility of doing some survey research, as we've done on a host of other issues. <clears throat> um, to uh, determine uh, views and values on a countywide basis. And uh, I think that might be a way to uh, ensure that we have a broad range of views about what the community voice is. Um, we, we've all been parts of processes where one yes. point, one point, uh, well then I'll stop there and take yes for an answer. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. And the only thing I would add to that is that I, I think focus groups in particular would be of assistance in different languages. So, yeah. If it's helpful to put it on the record, I think both survey research and focus groups would be useful tools. 
Correct. Thank you. And you did say survey, Supervisor Smidian? Survey research and focus groups would now be the request. And I believe that that was consistent with the yes and yes from my two colleagues, for which I say thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I, that I heard the survey. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, anything else? No, thank you. Nope. Supervisor Lee, you're, you're good. I don't see a hand. You're good. Dr. Smith. So um, just so staff can be very clear, uh, I wonder if we can go to page four of the transmittal. If you'd like, I can put it up on the screen. Please. That'd be helpful. Yes. Um, I think this is the substance of the process that um, has been discussed, and I'm looking for clarification if that's un incorrect. I think number three is the main most important part is to conduct a multiple community input sessions uh, with the cooperation and leadership from public safety and justice um, committee. Um, I'm understanding that the committee will give us direction about how they would like to structure those sessions, how many of the sessions would be, um, various other details about sessions. Um, in preparation for those, number one is to expedite a procurement process since we have to contract with uh, facilitators and um, expertise. Um, two would be for us to, as administration, explore partnerships with uh, regional and multi-county um, agencies. And then um, the um, list of input would be uh, details of how we as staff should move ahead with cost benefit analysis, um, re how to assess re efforts to reduce population, uh, jail population study, report to the board at Hewlett regarding uh, facilities and all of the other issues listed here, plus the referrals on the next page, plus what the board is asked for us to do so that our job as staff would be to inform the uh, public process done through PSJC and then ultimately the board as the referrals and recommendations come to the board from PSJC and the public. I hope that is what I understood. Thank you and I, I heard Supervisor Timidi and I reiterated uh, adding uh, survey into as far as getting community input from north to south. Right, right. Thank you. Supervisor Sumidian, your hand is still up. My apologies, that's uh, leftover. No worries. I'm sure that's crystal clear where we're at. Supervisors Chavez and Lee, do you wish to call the question or have further comments to make? Uh, the only thing I wanted to say is, well, thank you to my colleagues and the public for sticking with us through another uh, discussion of this. And I just wanted to affirm with Supervisor Ellenberg that the process aligns with the, her understanding of the process of what will be going through her committee. Uh, yes, the, the process that is being uh, described here is um, is absolutely consistent with with what I envision moving ahead with. I, it probably was unnecessary to spell out that it will be countywide. It will incorporate um, a, a wide range of, of visions. Um, I would like to think that's a given. But um, I, I still, in spite of the fact that I, I agree with, with so much of that, the report itself it still feels problematic um, to me because it, it did things that I didn't think we asked for. So for that reason um, I'm not going to I'm still not intending to support a receipt of the motion a receipt of the report but I'm absolutely committed to the engagement process that we've we've talked about and described here thank you okay Nancy I just I'm yeah. sorry was that supervisor Lee 
Yes, please. Sorry, you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, staff for uh, coming back with the report uh, of trying to incorporate so many different uh, uh, motions and amendments and meetings that we've had for the past few months. Uh, this has certainly been very educational for me as a new member of the board uh, and starting with the, the, the very uh, important uh, uh, leadership of uh, my predecessor, uh, uh, Supervisor um, uh, Cortese, then that uh, moved toward this direction. The need for mental health uh, and also substance abuse is something that's long overdue you know, uh, in carceral facilities. And we really need to think outside the box, whether we're talking about in carceral facilities or non-carceral facilities, because at the end of the day, uh, if we remember anything that I can remember about Michael Tyree when I was the Bruin Commission was that he was placed in the wrong place and he was murdered because of the fact that the mental health facilities on the eighth floor was full. Uh, that's something that we cannot afford happening again. And I think it's so important that we are going to go through a robust community input with community based uh, 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 input that is going to be available and the reason why we're having so many of these dialogues and these inputs uh, through PSJC and all the community partners is so important. I encourage everybody who attend this meeting today to make sure that they actively participate during these community input sessions that we're going to be holding for the next 120 days uh, because we do not want to have those type of mistakes again. And that's why we're doing a, a countywide plan. We're looking at everything from top to bottom. And this is a really exciting time that we could really bring uh, the, the need for mental health, substance abuse, and all those into our next phase of, you know, the alternative for incarceration is so important. I'm not gonna make this as a motion, but I really want to advise staff to take a look off the LA County's alternatives incarceration report as a basis, it has a lot of great ideas in history of incarceration in California. And I think these are some good ideas that we could down the road help input uh, into our community input process to come up with a, a, a fully uh, envisioned new way of looking at incarceration and come up with the solution that we long need in this county. And I want to thank staff for putting together a very thorough report and my, my colleagues for working so hard on this so important issue. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to be looking at jails, mental health facilities, non-carceral options, men, all, all the above, and having public input to receive on all of those issues. And uh, then we'll go through what we hear and have more discussion. Nancy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? No. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. We now jump on to item number 22. There were no additional staff comments. Do I have a motion to approve or any other motion? So moved. Thank you. I'll be happy to second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. We'll yes. call. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, Supervisor Simeon. Sorry. Um, this is item 21, sir. 22. 22. 22. Forgive me. Thank you. On that item, I'm good. Now that I'm clear which item we're on. Sure. You got it, okay. Nancy. Roll we'll call. Quick question, uh, uh, President. Oh, Supervisor Lee. Yes, I, I, I wrote down some questions. Um, uh, this question for staff is that this is increasing uh, of the work by $100,000. It talks about putting in uh, cameras. And, uh, and, uh, and other things that are adding to the contract. If I understand correctly, it's a contract for demolition. So why are we putting in things for a demolition project? I just want to, to understand. So, so this is, hi, my name is Pan with, um, I'm chief construction with the uh, facilities and fleet here. I can, I can take that uh, question if nobody Thanks, else wants please, to Pan. take that. Okay, so the, the camera is where, yes, it, it does say demolition. However, we created, because the loading dock was part of the old main jail south. So we created a temporary loading dock in the breezeway. Therefore, you know, there's no eyes in there for security. So we had to include more security and the locking system so that main control can um, see who's coming in and out and for delivery. So that's hence the, um, the cameras. Yeah. 
All right, just uh, just uh, caught my eye, but thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, uh, President Wilson. Thank you. All right, 20 on 22. Twenty-two done. We're there. Yes. Sorry, yeah, I made a motion. I don't know if I had a second. I seconded oh, your motion. Right. Supervisor Sumidian had a question. We resolved that. He was on board. Supervisor Lee. So we call for the question. Nancy, please. Supervisor Lee. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Sumidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you very much. We're going to jump to 2021, then we're going to break for lunch. Supervisor Simidian, do you have any comments on 20 or 21? Yes, sir. We have a couple of issues, and uh, I know you're trying to move us along, but we got a couple of issues, and sure. we need to work through them, and I think we can. I've been working with staff uh, on item number 20. Mm -hmm which involves the receipt of uh, anticipated impact reports uh, and uh, findings that the benefits uh, outweigh the costs, uh, benefits broadly and costs broadly defined, not just financial. Uh, we've got items A and B uh, to that effect. Then we've got items C and D to that effect. And then under E and F, we have a um, slightly different set of conversations around different kind of technology known as real-time location system. Uh, all of this, I think, um, looks fine. The one uh, the issue that uh, I did identify uh, working with staff was that uh, there really does need to be a requirement uh, for an explicit and regular auditing mechanism. We have approved language previously to that effect uh, and Supervisor, we lost you for a minute. I apologize. That would entail is. Um, Supervisor, we lost you again. Can you hear me now, Mr. Chairman? Yes, we can. All right. I will uh, look straight at you. I promise, even though you can't see me. Uh, so I'm prepared to move the staff recommendation, but with the addition of a requirement that the uh, use policy for real time location systems include the following language. The CSCHS facilities department director or their written designee shall also be responsible for auditing compliance with this policy at least annually. It's my understanding from working with staff that that language is not problematic. Move approval with that amendment. Thank you. That's on item 20. Do we have any speakers on 20, Nancy? Yes, we have one person uh, waiting in the queue. Thank you. Let's have, hear that person for two minutes. Sure. The next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Hi. Uh, Blair, Beekman. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, to save time, hopefully I can uh, uh, combine my two, the public comment for 20 and 21 to this item. Um, I just like to thank, uh, you know, Supervisor Simidian's really, you know, good work on the surveillance and technology ordinance to uh, work on this issue and ask questions about this issue. Um, it's my feeling that the city of San Jose, uh, they started with a sunshine ordinance back in 2006, 2005, 2006, 2007, that I think was kind of uh, predated and brought along what eventually developed into the surveillance technology of 2014. And I think before 2014, Supervisor Simidian was working on uh, public poli open public policy ideas for uh, closed circuit television cameras. So, you know, um, this should be, you know, his good work, his good stuff, and he can know what to do with this issue. I wanted to comment that um, there there is closed circuit television television issues with uh, VTA buses at this time, a newly bought system that I just wanted to remind that I hope Supervisor Submitting will be looking into and how there can be open good public policies for those closed circuit uh, televisions on the, on the VTA buses as well. Uh, good luck on this issue and uh, thanks for your time. 
Thank you, Blair. Appreciate it. No other speakers, Nancy? No, that concludes our public comment. Supervisor, you made a motion. I'm happy to second it with your uh, added clause. Any other comments? Supervisor Chavez? You're off my, oh, you're okay. So we're all good. We've got a motion by Simidian, a second by Wasserman. Nancy, could you please do a roll call vote on item number 20? Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Thank you. Aye, yes. That concludes 20. We'll go to 21. Supervisor Simidian? Thank you. On item 21, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to need some help from staff and or county council because uh, this is a request for us to take action in connection with the use of video security at two uh, locations, one in San Jose, one in Palo Alto for the ALCO program. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a use policy here because uh, county council is working on a singular unified surveillance camera policy that incorporates all of the most recent uh, language and uh, which I think is a good effort, but uh, I am frankly loath to uh, approve this without uh, without the policy in place. And in fact, the ordinance specifically provides that we may not. Uh, I'd be happy to consider use of an interim policy uh, if that was a practical solution. And then the other issue that's a little more complicated is that uh, the proposal has been for video security both at the entrance of these two facilities and inside in what's known as the flex space. And I think there are some concerns, uh, some of which come from folks uh, running the program, some of which come from uh, the youth advisory groups that are constituted to make sure these things are youth centric, uh, some of which comes from me, uh, which is uh, I, I, I've not yet been convinced that we need the second camera inside. Um, and it may be that the security situations are different at, at the two different locations. Uh, and it uh, also, in my view, is a reminder that security cameras are not a security plan. They're just one part of a security plan or program. So I guess if we get a little input from staff. Uh, I'm told one possibility is to simply put the wiring in place but not to move forward with the cameras at this time on the interior side. I could live with that if uh, the uh, commitment was made that the cameras would not actually be put in use without coming back to our board. Why don't I stop there? Understood, thank you. Is Mr. Draper here? I am, this is Mr. Draper from Facilities yeah, yeah, yeah. To To answer uh, you all, I would say the answer is, is the intent is just to put the uh, cameras at the ent entrances, the exits, and the lobbies for the moment from a security perspective. And Supervisor Samidian is correct. We would allow for the wiring to go ahead and be put in place and for us to have to come back to the board to implement the cameras further into the spaces, if you will. That's Thank our commitment. You. Supervisor Samidian, what do you think about what you just heard? I, I think as long as there's a firm commitment that uh, folks would come back uh, for approval on the placement of the cameras inside, that's an acceptable outcome. I would ask Mr. Coelho or Mr. Williams, however, to weigh in on the fact that we do need some kind of uh, policy in place. Their, their suggestion is that we authorize the acquisition and installation before we have the policy and they'll get back to us with the policy uh, and that use of these would be contingent on the policy. I, I think that's a good faith effort and I appreciate it, but it's not what the ordinance requires and, and I'm not comfortable with it. The whole point of this exercise is to say we're going to sort this stuff out before we spend taxpayers' money and make commitments to use surveillance equipment. So um, if there's a, uh, we've we've certainly got you know a great many uh, surveillance camera policies that we've previously approved. I think one of those could uh, be in place in the short term while we're um, awaiting the uh, new and improved uh, policy that I think is forthcoming. Thank you, Rob. Who do we have? I don't see Rob okay. on. I don't know if if he is on, but um, in the absence of that, if the board's not comfortable, I recommend the item be deferred. I think we could easily continue this just two weeks, get uh, one of our off the shelf at this point, surveillance camera policies in place uh, and uh, use it for this purpose. 
until such time as uh, we have the new policy, Mr. Chairman. And I'm happy to make that as a motion uh, with the earlier direction on um, the exterior cameras uh, and, and the wiring only for the interior with any uh, hookup at a later date subject to review and approval by the board. So you're okay with the exterior cameras at this time? No, I, we, we also need a, a, um, a policy for those as well. And okay, let's bring it back. Uh, okay. I, I think that's a good point. Supervisor Chavez? Yeah, I just wanted to ask the staff um, what the impacts are. It may be nothing of two weeks, but I'm interested in knowing what the impacts are for both for the opening. And then I have a, a separate couple questions. Uh, there could be a little bit of an impact because of you know constructions underway at both sites, and I'll have to see how this lines up in terms of a task that needs to move forward. Just that's just to, to be aware of that's a possible impact. The other thing is I'm under the impression, and of course we'll have to check it uh, that the alcoves are covered under the hospital policy. This is Doug Feliciano, Security Director. I, I believe that's that was our intention when we wrote the anticipated impact report for both sites that this, the foundation of it would be the uh, approved um, uh, surveillance policy for the hospital and the clinics. Supervisor Chavez. Um, just to make sure I understand that, if does that mean that the the paperwork um, that's required by the, the policy was, was completed and used the hospital framework? Yes, the hospital and clinics were all covered under that one policy. So um, I want to I want to go back to Supervisor Samidia, and I know this is something that's near and dear to him. I, I'm I, but let me just ask this: What I'm interested in understanding is if if that if the policy if I, I just can't remember if that required then a written. Um, report just for these two locations, or if you're, what you're saying is that the policy was already completed and you followed the policy guidelines for these two locations that were framed by the hospital, I mean, using the hospital's policy. That, that's correct. The latter, which is it, nothing specific to these two, but you followed the framework? We, we followed the foundational guidance that was approved with the hospital camera policy, but then the anticipated impact report gets into the specifics of the two alcoves themselves. Okay. May I make a suggestion, Supervisor Please. Chavez, that I think might work, which is why don't we continue this item until the end of the day? I know Mr. Wasserman was trying to, to get things. I, I am not prepared to accept a further delay on the alcove project, full stop. It has taken too long. The delay to date is inexcusable. I believe this property has been under contract since October of 2019. And to be told now that when someone shows up with a camera proposal that doesn't have a uh, policy required by ordinance, that that's gonna delay the project, just wholly unacceptable. And if it sounds like I'm pretty frosted about that, it's because I am. So in an effort to uh, sort the problem out, if people wanna come back before the end of the day, using one of our previously approved um, uh, policies, I would be happy to review that in real time. And I think then we could have a policy on the books and we could also uh, take the step that we discussed uh, earlier about uh, allowing the wiring uh, and not the uh, actual installation. Unless someone is telling me, and this is was I think to your question, Supervisor Chavez, and I didn't get the answer clearly, um, unless, someone is making the argument that these cameras in these locations for these facilities are somehow covered under some broader policy that we've previously approved. But I don't think that was what I heard. Um, supervisor, um, let's um, take some time to get uh, Rob Coelho back who can give us an authoritative answer. My understanding was that these were covered under the prior approval but we need to have legal to give us the definitive answer. And since he's not available right now, we'll, we'll ask, staff will ask that you delay the issue rather than uh, acting on it at this point. Let's delay it, it later let's in the delay day. It to the, 
to the end of our meeting uh, under item 23, where we're gonna hear item 43 that was pulled off consent. And then we'll hear 21 after that. Is that acceptable to supervisor? Supervisor Chavez, your hand. Yeah, thank you. I'll, just to finish my, my question, since the staff will be coming back today, I'd, I'd like the opportunity to do that. I think um, one thing I just wanted to affirm um, is that I, I am not comfortable with uh, cameras in the flex space. So I, I just wanted to go on record there. Um, and second, I, I think that the, um, you know, the, the, the one other thing I'd really like to ask um, Jeff a Draper through the chair is whether or not they've done an assessment of the, when they did the safety assessment of the current location, if by the time you come back, if you could also give us feedback on the availability of using um, a door buzzer and a, a for the, the San Jose, uh, the Key Street um, uh, facility, particularly for the, the front door and and I understand the door is glass, so you can see through it, but I think that actually may increase the safety at the um, at the Key Street location. So thanks, and I'm, I'm happy to hear this at the end of the day, because I, I really don't want to see this slow down and appreciate um, Mr. Feliciano's uh, feedback, and we'll look forward to getting the paper on that. Thank you. Thank you, I agree with the suggestions made as well. And without objection then, we will, defer this to the end of the meeting. We will come back here at 1.40. We'll start with item number 11, which is our standard placeholder for COVID items. Supervisors, any further comments to make before we adjourn until 1.40? Seeing and hearing none, I will see you all in 30 minutes. Thank you. Thanks.
All right, Nancy, how are we looking? Let's see, I don't I, see Supervisor Simidian. That's the only one, I think you're right. And when Supervisor Simidian returns, Nancy, could you please take roll call? Sure. Thank you very much. I had hot dogs and mustard and potato chip and sour cream and onion dip, and I dipped my hot dog in the sour cream and onion by mistake, and I dipped my potato chips in the mustard by mistake. But the dogs liked it, so it was all right. All right, there's Supervisor Smitty in the roll call vote, please, Nancy. Supervisor Lee. Present. Supervisor Chavez. Present. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Allenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you very much. And everybody, welcome back to the second half of our March 9th Board of Supervisors agenda. We are going to start, as was mentioned previously, at uh, on item number 11. We also have 12 that's COVID related. Now I'll turn things over, I assume, to our Dr. Cody. Actually, I'm going to start. Um, there's been uh, some question about the uh, problem with the TPA or the Blue Shield contract. Yes. So I wanted to just go over a few issues <clears throat> for the board. Simple <clears throat> explanation, uh, the state has entered into a third party administrator agreement with Blue Shield to delegate to Blue Shield the responsibility for distributing vaccine throughout the state. <clears throat> we have significant concerns about this process because of the following. First of all, it's a significant risk to the health and welfare of residents in our county because it's adding another layer of administration between their opportunity to get uh, vaccinated and our opportunity to give them vaccinated vaccinations. There's no increases in allocation associated with it. As a matter of fact, there seems to be a decrease and we've had problems in the last week uh, such that we need to decrease our uh, allocations to sites that would be able to, in other situations, offer first and second doses. What the TPA agreement would do would be to force us into a new appointment system and a new way of accessing appointments, um, which would be a statewide system and have no control over, we would have no control over it. Um, also, it would mean that a private insurance company would be collecting all the pub protected health information and personal information for all residents who are vaccinated. A significant problem with confidentiality and trust because many of our um, residents uh, do not um, trust government or others to treat their information with care and security. So as I mentioned before, it eliminates local control, puts our local equity efforts at risk, means that uh, we would not be able to operate as many small pop-up and um, focused sites on particular communities and would put statewide priorities over local needs. Recently, it appears that um, the state may be giving up on the concept of asking counties to contract with directly with Blue Shield, although they still are forcing other providers like Kaiser and PAMP and others to continue to um, contract with Blue Shield directly, which brings up legal concerns and I'll turn it over to uh, James to talk about that. Welcome, James. I guess uh, what I would add on the 
uh, legal front. Sorry, I'm hearing an echo. James, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I guess what I'd share on the on the legal front is, you know, I think there are a number of challenges with basically contracting out a core essential state function to a private entity, but in particular, a private health insurer. Um, we have a number of concerns uh, about potential conflicts of interest that that can raise having a private insurer, which is otherwise responsible for, for example, paying claims on a uh, vaccine that's administered um, and being also responsible for determining how that vaccine itself is distributed and working with health systems, private or public, in that respect. Uh, it raises concerns certainly under a number of uh, statutes that affect contracting, but more generally is a, a challenging type of approach to take. Um, and so those are all items that we're certainly looking at. Those are all items uh, that, um, you know, I think are important considerations, but, you know, but, um, you know, a contract between the county and, and Blue Shield would certainly um, potentially raise those kinds of issues, um, uh, especially given that the county health system obviously has separate contracts, for example, with Blue Shield as an insurance provider um, for delivery of healthcare services, including vaccination. Um, but I think I, I kind of will leave it that for now. So now we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Cody. Thank you. And Dr. Smith, if I can just pause for one moment, what is the justification the state's giving for changing what we've been doing, what everybody's been doing? Why is Blue Shield involved? Well, I can... Uh... I, I think I think I think that is um, that's the key question. Maybe is the best way to put it. You know, um, the the biggest issue, and I think the state would wholeheartedly agree. The biggest issue is vaccine supply. Uh, there's a lot of capacity, obviously, here in Santa Clara County, but I think that's true across the state. Uh, and you know, getting the vaccine supply is absolutely, I think, the most critical issue. Um, you know, in terms of what problems, uh, you know, the third party administrator will solve, uh, I think that's a, that's a pivotal question for us here in Santa Clara County. We have, through the SCC Facts website, an easy, accessible way for people to sign up for appointments. We have the front end and back end systems we have the data reporting in a robust manner, and we have the data mandated reporting from all those providers uh, that are working with the county. Um, and all that information is publicly posted and updated daily as the board and public knows. Uh, so we have that infrastructure in place. Uh, and so at least with respect to Santa Clara County, our impediment and our issue is purely one of vaccine supply. Uh, and there's no indication that in any way that supply issue is addressed uh, through the TPA. In fact, um, this week, our supply situation has gotten precipitously worse. Thank you. And there is a happy customer from today that just texted me from Levi Stadium. Thank you. Please continue with your report. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the board. Um, I will start off our presentation with a broad overview our, on where we are in the local epidemic, and then I'll uh, hand the presentation over uh, to the many colleagues um, working on the response here in the Emergency Operations Center. Thank you, Dr. Um, Cody. I I, Dr. Cody, I apologize. I missed it. Supervisor Ellenberg had her hand and had a question. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Ellenberg, Vice President Ellenberg. Thanks. I just wanted to ask a question to, to James. Um, by the time we hear the rest of the public health report, I'm afraid that the TPA issue may be forgotten. Um, I, I think it is to the credit of, of 
county councils across the state, um, including your office, that the that um, the administration has backed off on the requirement for counties to engage directly with Blue Shield in contracts. Um, what is the what is the downside or the risk to us? Um, let me ask it differently. Do we have an option, frankly, to continue as we as we are right now with our own systems without using my turn um, or or any of the these additional new um, new tools? Or will this just be imposed on counties regardless? Well, you know, we've heard, I think, different things from the state. But, you know, at the end of the day, the state has a lot of discretion here. And I think, you know, what we all hope is that the state will exercise that discretion in the best interest of all Californians. And for Santa Clara County, I think that means uh, not breaking things that are working, and but instead focusing on where the greatest needs are. And Thanks. So, and do you... No, what I was going to say, for us, you know, with the capacity, with the the outreach that we're doing with what you'll hear, I think, later in this presentation about the extraordinary happening on the vaccination front, that clearly is our need to have a um, increased and dependable and noble supply and uh, really should be where the focus is. Agreed. And and if and if this question is going to be answered in the presentation, just um, let me know that. But do you, is there an update on uh, the state's other uh, recent um, direction that 40 percent of vaccines are going to be reserved for uh, communities that they have designated as um, as low income and at higher need, although very, very few of them are in the Bay Area? Yeah, we have not gotten any uh, any update from the state on that. I've seen some of the same uh, press materials, I think, that you're referencing. The bottom line is right now that 40% allocation does not include any community in Santa Clara County. And of course, that masks uh, the many census tracts that have been disproportionately affected here in Santa Clara County um, that have been hit very hard by COVID-19, which is data, you know, shared so many times now with the board. Um, so it's it's concerning. Um, I, I We hope that the state will re-examine that so that, you know, these, these communities are not made invisible through that distribution. My, thank you. I appreciate your, your efforts and your advocacy on, on all of that. Dr. Cody, please proceed. Supervisor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to. I, I thank you. I, I just um, I wanted to also just thank our staff for being bullish on the on the TPA. And I, I do think that the risks um, for our community are are more um, inclined to come true if if Blue Shield um, continues to play the same role it's playing, because I, I, I just want to point out two things that one um to me the introduction of this third party um has had two dramatic impacts already and one is it has negatively impacted our ability to be flexible at a local level and you know and i think that um you know i understand at a state level that that having a command and control is is beneficial from a state perspective but from a local perspective, having flexibility with partners we've been now working with uh, since March of last year is really an imperative to me. Um, and the second is that I think that the, the, uh, the, the strategy of trying to create statewide frameworks instead of looking at the assets of each of the regions and really being able to apply resources in a much more strategic way um, and resources and supports is really um, gonna negatively impact our community in particular because of how much um, of a local investment that we've made. So I just wanna reinforce that I, I think the staff's direction is really um, is right. The only other thing I just wanted to add is that I do think that 
um, our partnership with our community clinics and um, our community partners is is pretty advanced, perhaps relative to other places. And again, I think the problem the state's trying to fix is not a reflection on problems we're having here, but I think the repercussions are so negative that I really appreciate the staff um, holding strong. And I just want to reinforce um, what Supervisor Allenberg said about you know, our gratitude to County Council for being so so thoughtful about this. And also, um, Supervisor Allenberg, I wanted to just acknowledge that something folks may not know is you're our, our um, representative for the California, um, for CSAC, I'm sorry, that I can, our California County California State Association of Counties. Um, and really appreciate your leadership on the, uh, the Urban Caucus in particular and highlighting the needs of our, our community. So thank you for that work. Thank you. All right, Dr. Cody. Thank you, President Wasserman. So I, um, as, as always, I'll start out with an epi overview and then pass the presentation to uh, my colleagues. I wanted to just note that today is March 9th and it was exactly one year ago today of the first health officer order to prohibit gatherings greater than a thousand people. And it was also on that day that we reported uh, the very first death in our county. At that time, we had 43 cases. And today, one year later, we recorded over 112,000 people infected and 1,830 uh, people who have died. So if you look at our epidemic curve and you follow that orange line is always a seven day rolling average, um, you'll see that our case uh, case counts do continue to decline. Uh, however, you will also note that the, the rate of decline has really slowed down. Um, and in some little sections, it in fact uh, is flat. So we're now at just under an average of 200 new cases reported each day. Um, and that's not back to the baseline we were on October before the surge where we were hovering around 100 cases a day. And the conversation uh, that we were just having and that we'll continue to have about vaccinations and the critical importance of getting vaccinations out at scale, particularly uh, to communities that have disproportionately suffered uh, from COVID could not be more important. And at this point, we're really at a, in a race between uh, the vaccine and new variants of concern that are emerging. Um, and we have already documented um, at, at least two of these variants of concern uh, right here in our county. I also want to note that similar to uh, a year ago when the surveillance and um, detection of cases was this an infancy, so too is surveillance for these new variants. And that's because uh, only a small proportion of cases get sequenced. And if you don't look, you won't find. So um, that's a significant concern. Uh, I would say that here in our county, um, compared to other counties, we have a much, much more robust surveillance system to look for these new variants. Um, uh, but it's, uh, again, just a proportion of cases that end up being uh, sequenced. Next slide. This shows the disparities in case rates by county uh, section and, and all of uh, rates in every part of our county have decreased since January, um, but rates are still highest in Gilroy, the blue line, followed by East San Jose, the orange line. Next slide. And disparities in case rates have been also decreasing since January. Uh, these are, this slide shows the disparities by race ethnicity. Uh, and what you can see is that while they've been declining um, uh, over the last month, those declines are beginning to slow. Um, and the rates among Latinx still remain significantly higher uh, than other groups. The next slide shows the um, uh, death from COVID uh, by week. And you can see it separated out in the dark blue are deaths among people who died 
uh, while living in a long-term care facility, and the light blue are those who died not in a long-term care facility. And the good news is that the deaths um, in both groups uh, each week are declining and continue to decline. And we are seeing now very few deaths among long-term care facility residents. The next slide is just a little preview of what Dr. Kamal will share in more detail. And that's um, the, the top line message is that the number of um, patients with COVID requiring hospitalization continues to decrease. Now we're at around 150 COVID positive patients in the hospital each day. And that's about where we were in mid-November at the beginning of the surge. Um, and in say mid-August when we were coming out of the summer surge. The next slide shows where we show up on the California blueprint for a safer economy. Um, the dotted line is the unadjusted case rate and the the solid line is the case rate that the state uses to place us in a tier. And again, that's adjusted depending on our testing rate. So we are still in the red tier. Um, and those, uh, the currently as of today, our metrics, our unadjusted case rate is 8.4 and our adjusted case rate is 4.2. Uh, so still in the red tier, remember that you need to be below four uh, to drop into the orange tier. The next slide shows the testing rates, um, both in the state, which is in orange, and in our county, which is blue. You can see that our testing rate is declining, but it still remains higher than the state uh, median. So we are still getting a 0.5 discount in our case rate. And the next slide shows our testing positivity rate, which Dr. Fensterscheib will also share in more detail. I believe our test positivity rate has now dipped um, uh, just below two. And finally, this is the slide that shows the testing positivity rate among the lowest uh, quartile of the Healthy Places Index. So those would be census tracts in our county uh, where the most vulnerable populations are living um, and our HPI metric um, as of this morning uh, was just below uh, four, just below four test positivity rate there. So that's um, uh, the, the top level overview. And now I'll pass the presentation to uh, Dr. Marty who will provide an update regarding uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Cody. Good afternoon, everyone. And there's our first slide. So I'm gonna start on the vaccination, some of the epidemiology overview, and then we'll have the discussion of outreach and our equity program. So a few of us will be presenting on vaccine this afternoon. So this, this is good news. Um, it's showing you information from our dashboard, but basically of all of the residents in our community 16 and older who are eligible, for vaccine, we have already vaccinated 21% with at least one dose of vaccine. And we've done very well on the 75 and older also um, at 60, nearly 65% having received at least one dose. And also on the 65 and older receiving at least one dose at 60%. But as we'll see in some of the additional slides, um, there are still some gaps um, that we have to look at on the equity scales. Next slide. And speaking of that, this is the vaccination uh, proportion of those who are 65 by section of our county. And you can see the highest rate, the highest um, percentages of vaccination by area of our geographical area are in uh, the top blue and green areas, which represent the Los Gatos, Saratoga, the west side, and Los Altos, Palo Alto, Mountain View on the north. Um, again, that's the equity gap. And, the, um, and at the bottom of those curves is the kind of rust colored, which is East San Jose. Um, yes, on the bottom. So again, everyone is doing pretty well, but um, again, there's just some still disparities in the percentages of those vaccinated by area of our county. Next slide. 
And so now we're looking at the same idea, uh, cumulative percentages of populations, but we're breaking it down now by race and ethnicity. And the highest, again, at 65% um, of, again, 65 and older, um, with at least one dose, um, are in the uh, Asian Pacific Islander population. Um, again, we don't have this broken down uh, by the, the various subgroups, but in total, we're at 65. And then at the very bottom, uh, which is at about, oh, a little better than half um, at the Hispanic and Latino portion um, of our ethnic breakdown and African, African ancestry at slightly higher to 41%. So still definite disparities that we are all working on very hard uh, to improve. Next slide. So in general, and we talked about some of these already, the challenges continue for us. The, as we all have said over and over that we have tremendous capacity for our vaccinations and um, we're not getting enough vaccine. And we've, um, we basically have increased our capacity in this county probably to 12 to 15,000 doses a day that we could do, but because of the decreasing amounts of vaccine that we're receiving, we have now dropped down to probably seven to 8,000 doses a day. So we just don't have the vaccine. We've already talked about the Blue Shield role, and we've also mentioned somewhat about the 40% of the vaccines into, sport, into the 400 zip codes, and we are not included in that. So again, our equity efforts are jeopardized with the insufficient vaccines and the, um, the focus that the state has everywhere else but us. Next slide. So again, good news, Johnson & Johnson has been approved. Um, and I should say, I keep saying, approved, but it's really authorized. It's received an emergency use authorization. Um, this vaccine is a one-dose vaccine, those 18 years and, and, and older, and it, it is an excellent vaccine. It had, it had more experience in um, other places around the world, so it was up against uh, locales where there were already variants, such as in South Africa and the Brazil area in South America. So that, that shows that it was challenged um, even more so than the other vaccines. Um, it is protective against 100% of, of death and hospitalizations and otherwise an excellent vaccine, more stable and easier to handle. And on the next slide, um, basically same type of information, safe and highly effective vaccine. Um, and I mentioned the Time frame. it was actually tested after the other vaccines were tested. Um, and so it was circulating and being tested in a world where there were more variants. So it was up against a tougher, tougher virus, basically. And it still came out very, very good. It's one dose. And so one, one shot and you're done. And the transport and storage are very, very easy. So again, the best vaccine is the one that you can get when you're eligible. The next slide is just basically showing you how we're doing. The blue, the blue bars are, are our first dose, and you can see the second dose in orange um, is, is increasing, so that as we give our first doses, the second doses become um, necessary to give. And you can see that we have to, again, provide two doses for Moderna and, and Pfizer. Again, J&J &J is just one. But you can see that the numbers of doses over time have been increasing, which is nice. Uh, but uh, again, flattening off tremendously now that we're not getting the vaccine that we need. Next. For vaccine eligibility, um, you know, we've been through the phase 1A and um, we're in phase 1B. And we, just to remind everyone, the age-based over 65 was based on people living in our community. Um, but the new sectors that are the food and ag, the education sector, emergency services are based on live or work in Santa Clara County, and that was directed by, from the state. So you live here or you work here in one of those fields and that one of those occupations, you're eligible in our community for a vaccine. Next slide. So this is what's happening this week. We got this, the notification last week of these allocations and we'll be waiting tonight or tomorrow for the allocation which will take effect, which we will receive next week. And I wanna just, um, I know there's a busy slide here, but look at Pfizer on the left. We're showing you the, the amount of uh, Pfizer vaccine came into California. 
uh, the week before compared to just this week. And um, there was an increase in overall Pfizer vaccine coming into the state. Look down at Santa Clara County. We had a drop from 26, almost 27,000 to just over 23,000. Moderna vaccine in the next same idea. California got more and we got less um, during that allocation. The J&J &J has been added and we just received that vaccine this week, 7,500 doses of J&J. &J. So totally um, from the previous week, we did get 3,000 more doses, but it's really important to understand that those were really made up by the single dose J&J &J, and we needed um, the second doses, especially of the Moderna vaccine. And that's where we were shorted. So we um, had to really work hard to, to try to uh, deal with the Moderna second dose. In the, mean, in the meantime, by doing that, we had to basically uh, cancel um, uh, first dose vaccine clinics and, um, and not take any new appointments. Next slide. I think you know we, it's time for some good news. And as Dr. Cody talked about, the numbers of cases in the skilled nursing facilities and their staff, residents and staff, has been decreasing, but um, the, the red line, the red dotted line, or the red line uh, with the dots, basically is showing you the increasing uh, vaccination rates of the staff working in the SNFs. So as as the numbers have gone up for the vaccinations of staff, uh, and they do range. I mean, some are better than others, but in in general, you can see that we've gotten up pretty high. The numbers of cases um, in those SNFs has decreased. So this is exactly what we wanted to see. Um, this is this is great, great news. Um, it's, this is where we began our effort and, and why we began vaccinating in the SNFs early on. So this is what we wanna see and we're really happy about this. Next slide. We just pointed out one of these maps to show um, the health system, our health, county health system's um, coverage for vaccine um, throughout our county. And you can just see by the, by the, um, the, the various areas that are shaded, especially the darkest orange, red, um, are the most, the areas where we were providing the most vaccine. So we're all over the county very nicely in the South County. Uh, and on the east side and other locales. So we definitely are still doing the majority of the vaccinations in our county. Next slide. And just two slides here. And I just wanted to show you because we were able to map um, some of the sectors and by census tracts showing you where uh, residents who are working in those sectors live. Um, and these are the food service occupations and you can see um, by the heavily dark areas where the um, majority of residents working in that industry live, a lot on the east side in San Jose and in the South County. And again, that's, we're doing this because this is where we need to focus to meet the needs um, in these occupational sectors. And then the final one is also um, pointing out the areas where workers in agriculture um, are living. The numbers are much smaller, but again, we all would expect again that more in the South County. So with that, I will end and turn this over to uh, Dr. Luna, who will talk about the equity and update you on those updates. Thank you, Dr. Fenster Shad. Next, next slide, thank you. An important part of our vaccine equity strategy is to ensure that we are reaching the medically vulnerable residents in our county. As Dr. Fenster Shad noted earlier, we're making great progress in vaccinating residents and, um, and uh, uh, employees in skilled nursing facilities and long-term care facilities. The Public Health Department has also recently partnered with County Fire to ensure that any of the gaps that exist in the well over 600 facilities are addressed. The Public Health Department will focus primarily on the 52 skilled nursing facilities, while County Fire will focus on long-term care facilities and in-home vaccine delivery. They'll do this both by coordinating with city fire departments that have reached out about help, about wanting to help with vaccination of long-term care facilities and homebound residents in their respective jurisdictions, as well as delivering vaccination themselves. The public health team will work with hospitals to ensure that patients are vaccinated before they are discharged or transferred to a facility or in their home. Healthcare providers have been um, provided a request form that has already been shared with them that they can forward to the public health department and request um, home delivery for their patients. The public can also contact the public health department to request vaccine delivery, and those requests will be evaluated for eligibility. 
and underlying medical complexity. The public health team also provides vaccination at low income senior independent living residences throughout the county with priority given to those areas with high COVID rates. Next slide, please. This timeline uh, reflects the launch of the in-home vaccine strategy. Uh, this week, the public health department is uh, working with its teams to adhere, to uh, train to and adhere to the newly developed clinical protocols for the one dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is uh, particularly well suited for this, for this effort. The team has worked with IHSS and received a list of 145 homebound individuals and is working to schedule them um, for the week, for the following week. So the week of March 17th through the 19th, uh, Gilroy Fire will actually pilot the in-home protocol um, and begin vaccinating long-term care facilities in Gilroy and those that are homebound. On March 23rd, County Fire and Public Health will hold a countywide training with City Fire Chiefs to ensure basic standards for the in-home delivery of, Jan of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is complete. Thereafter, the service will be fully operational and available to those that need it. I'll now hand it over to Mr. Brian Darrow, who will speak to additional ways we are reaching our hardest hit communities. Thank you, Dr. Luna. Brian Darrow with the County Executive's Office. I'll be providing an update on our COVID-19 outreach efforts as it relates to vaccines. And as Dr. Fenstershad showed in some of his slides, we do continue to have significant disparities. I think folks are well aware in our vaccination rates as well as the impact of COVID. And those disparities are reflected in terms of race and ethnicity and in terms of geography. At the last board meeting, based on a referral by Supervisor Lee and Supervisor Chavez, the board had asked for a data-driven vaccine plan to help address these disparities, in sense, particularly in census tracts with, with both again, high COVID impact rates and then relatively low vaccination rates. You have a written report that discusses this plan, but we wanted to lay out some of the information that's in that plan here today. And as I think folks know, we're, with COVID, we're always looking very closely at data to inform decisions, including census tract data and zip code data. We have a lot more um, census tract level data now available on our website. But following the board's direction last meeting, we did do an analysis of all census tracts in the county, looking at vaccination rates, case rates, positivity rates. We also factored in the share of Latinx residents living in census tracts. And we also looked at the census tracts that are in the lowest quartile of the Healthy Places Index. And based on all of those factors, we identified the 90 highest priority census tracts in the county, and we broke them into four priority groups. So the first highest risk, highest priority group is shown on the map here in blue. It includes the 15 highest priority census tracts. And then if you look at the green, those are the next 15 highest priority areas. Sorry for the, all of the different colors here. Um, the orange represents the third tier of priority. So that's actually 30 additional census tracts. They're kind of in the third, third tier range. And then the gray represents the final uh, 30 tracts. So those are areas with some elevated risk and disparity, but it's much less pronounced than the, uh, than the other areas. So this map is being used to drive decisions about where we send our outreach teams. So for example, this past week, we sent our business engagement teams to the, uh, these highest priority 30 census tracts um, for business engagement. And our new expanded residential outreach, which I'll talk about in a minute, is going to be focusing again on those top 30 priority census tracts as they, as they get going. Uh, the map here also helps, helps inform decisions we make about siting of uh, mobile vaccine clinics and other sites. So just wanted to call um, the board's attention to some information you already know, but uh, since the last board meeting, actually on the date of the last, starting on the date of the last board meeting, the four red pin drops that are there are all new um, permanent vaccination sites that have been established just in those past two weeks. So it's Emanuel Baptist Church, it is um, Eastridge, which is in partnership with Stanford. Stanford's operating that site, but the county was um, instrumental in helping site that new clinic. It includes Gilroy High School and it includes East Valley Clinic. Next slide, please. So starting yesterday, we added an additional contractor to our community health and business engagement team efforts, and that is Groundworks campaigns. They started yesterday with their training and today they are out in the field with 30 full-time staff. This group is doing residential outreach. 
and they're closely coordinating with working partnerships residential team, which has been in the field now for several weeks doing residential outreach. So those two groups are splitting up turf and they're canvassing again in those blue and green census tracts from the previous slide. And, and they're going door to door and they are providing several things. They're providing general COVID-19 education. They are doing vaccine education and they will be doing vaccine appointment scheduling through our prioritized appointment slots as soon as we have enough vaccine to resume that program. They are promoting the ongoing importance of testing and they're also identifying household members who've already been vaccinated because we wanna know who we don't need to go return to to talk about vaccine again. And finally, they are asking residents for their commitment or their pledge that they will be vaccinated when it's their turn. <clears throat> Our stretch, um, as, and, and I should mention too that um, Community Health Partnership will also be part of the coordinated effort at the residential, uh, in, in residential outreach. So we obviously wanna make sure that everyone who's doing this type of outreach is all um, coordinated so that we're splitting, splitting up uh, areas and getting most efficiently to those areas we need to reach. Um, our stretch goal is to try to canvas uh, all 30 of those priority census tracts within the next six weeks. Uh, that's gonna depend some on how long the conversations last with community members, but that is our stretch goal and we're gonna, we're gonna try to read, reach it. And obviously we'll be um, tweaking the script as we learn more on the doors and um, evolving as that goes forward. Next slide, please. As, as the board knows, a big part of our equity strategy is trying to make appointment scheduling as easy as possible for our, our most impacted communities. So the county health system has established a priority appointment slot system um, that our outreach teams and other partners can use to schedule appointments. So we can bring appointments to those residents and, and workers who need it most. You'll see here, we've been ramping that effort up pretty dramatically in the last week or so. This chart shows the number of appointments scheduled by date. Um, so it's by when the appointment was created. It's not when the appointment is taking place, but when it was actually scheduled. In the first three days of last week, you'll notice uh, our partners were able to schedule hundreds of appointments. Uh, we dedicated all of Working Partnerships Outreach staff to do business engagement last week. So they were going to businesses that were all, all had newly eligible workers and were very successful at signing folks up. Uh, on day one, which was a training day, that organization alone did 237 appointments. The second day they did 400, and the third day they were able to do 417. The sad part of the story is that by Thursday, due to the low vaccine supply, we got very bad news on Wednesday night, we had to halt all scheduling across the board. So we, our, our outreach teams wait eagerly to con continue this work, but it has, had to be paused for the time being. Next slide. This slide shows the breakdown of who is being scheduled for our prioritized slots by race and ethnicity. You'll see that this program does seem to be very effective at improving access for our Hispanic and Latino residents. It's a little more than a thousand of the over 1800 appointments that were scheduled were among that community. Next slide. This slide shows that the prior, these, these appointment slots are also reaching residents in our most impacted geographies. So East San Jose had, had more than half of the appointment, residents living in East San Jose had more than half of those appointments, South County more than 10%. Next slide, please. In terms of age of these residents, our system appears to mostly be benefiting essential workers. Uh, so those who are, are eligible based on their occupation rather than those who are eligible based on their age, so 65 and older, and this has, something to do with the timing of when we really launched this effort and also the business outreach component of it. Next slide, please. Finally, this slide shows the vaccine clinic locations that were most common for those residents and workers using this prioritized scheduling system. So Emmanuel Baptist Church is by far the most popular site, but Berger, Gilroy High School, and East Valley Clinic were also popular sites. There's very little, you'll notice Levi's and some of our other sites were less less commonly chosen. It is worth noting that Emmanuel Baptist actually had the most appointment availability last week. So that was part of the story, but I think a lot of the story is also where we're geographically focusing our outreach. Next slide, please. Um, so at the last meeting, Supervisor Ellenberg had asked for some information um, on what the county is doing to reach workers who are newly eligible for vaccination. So I, I mentioned the working partnerships outreach teams all being dedicated to business outreach just this past week and all the appointments that were scheduled. We, um, we also brought vaccine to one of our 
higher risk communities that faces a number of challenges in, in getting to a vaccine appointment, and that is our agricultural workers community. We, uh, starting on the first day of eligibility, did a, a large event at Monterey Mushroom, and then we did another event later that week at that same location and two events at Christopher Ranch. Uh, just under 2,000 agricultural workers were vaccinated through those four days of vaccination, and that, so basically in the first six days, we were able to vaccinate um, that many workers. And we had planned this week to have several more events. And again, the, uh, the vaccine supply didn't allow that. So we are waiting eagerly for that as well. Uh, there's a few other partnerships that have taken place. We um, worked closely with two different service worker unions and connected uh, 400 individuals to appointments at the Eastridge site for Friday and Monday, so yesterday and then last Friday. And that um, we did a little bit of an analysis of, of who was, were in those groups. And it really was the communities that we most need to reach. Uh, we also did some worksite based outreach with a few DSW staff uh, who were focusing on uh, driving newly eligible workers to our pop-ups. So our, the Story Road and Eastridge also takes walk-ins. So we're doing a lot of outreach there. And we finally are partnering with our worksite investigations team um, to connect some of the employers that they have worked with over the past many, many months um, where they're, that have experienced an outbreak. And the strategy there is there's a number of eligible um, workers at those work sites now, and there's a trusted relationship with public health and those work sites. So the plan is to do a warm handoff to some of our uh, call centers that can contact those employers. And uh, when we again have the scheduling system set up, we can actually start scheduling. Uh, one last slide. And uh, Supervisor Chavez had asked for a little more information on what we're uh, partnering with in terms of our health plans. The Valley Health Plan is um, doing direct mail to all their covered California members try to no notify them of their eligibility focused on 65 and older. They're also dedicating 10 staff now to do scheduling of vaccine appointments, uh, focus on IHSS workers and eligible covered California workers. And they have an individual family plan that, um, that's very similar to covered California for uh, that they'll be utilizing too. And then family health plan has been partnering with us as well, doing direct mail and also doing scheduling with 12 dedicated staff. And with that, I'll turn it over to Betty Yoon, who's going to provide some information on paid advertising campaigns. Thank you, Brian. Betty Yoon with the County Executive Office. I'll be providing an overview of our COVID-19 paid advertising campaign. The campaign plan leverages local, regional, and locally zoned digital channels of communication, television, radio, out-of-home paid advertising, telephonic, and direct mailing, to ensure broad, effective engagement countywide um, and with communities disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Taking lessons learned from the successful Census 2020 Count Me In and Voters' Choice campaigns, with data derived from the most recent polling, the paid media campaign expansion plan will include launch of a branded COVID-19 campaign in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Tagalog across multiple platforms, including local television stations, and locally zoned cable channels. We'll also include continuation of our existing out-of-home campaign that is advertising experience outside of the home, such as those found on billboards, transit shelters, the side of buses, and gas station TVs. We've been purchasing every available billboard asset in East San Jose, downtown San Jose, South County, and digital billboards along all major highways. As more units become available, so does the addition of a grant, so, so does our uh, billboard purchases. The addition of a grassroots out of home campaign um, will also uh, be implemented in April. So, and this includes advertising on coffee sleeves, sidewalk posters, and takeout food containers. So same out of home experience, but much more on the ground level, literally. Uh, expansion um, of our presence and critical language markets, both on a regional and grassroots level is starting now. The county has been present in the largest Spanish and Vietnamese language markets with expansion currently underway. We're supplementing digital, radio, and television buys with Univision um, by adding the same package with Telemundo to cover broad ground. The PIO and language access teams are purchasing airtime on local stations as we speak. Although they may have smaller um, listenerships, they are local and homegrown. So there is a, a extra layer of um, local engagement there. Um, with, um, and through this plan, we're also adding long-form engagements, such as extended PSAs and interviews on air. We'll be taking this approach with other language markets that may not be on radio tele on television, um, but with strong presence on digital channels and platforms. 
the expansion plan includes continuation of digital ad buys and geofence ads with expansion and the number of buys and the addition of platforms with significant audience among the youth demographic, like YouTube, Hulu, Netflix, popular shopping sites, entertainment, and lifestyle sites. Finally, we are going back to basics and employing true and tested paid engagements, such as direct mail and telephonic engagement, including robocalls, teletown halls, and phone banking to reach those on the other side of the digital divide. I want to add that the EOC did a round of robocalls to 29,000 residents who had identified uh, Vietnamese language preference for the Lunar New Year and achieved a 74% connection rate. Uh, and of course, um, direct mail, the direct mail campaign will be starting in the coming weeks. Um, oh. um, I will turn this now back to Dr. Marty Fistershy. Thank you very much. And so we're going to have um, turn our attention now to testing and um, prevent, present a few slides to you to show you where we are. Um, so testing, again, is, is doing very well. Um, in general, though, the numbers are dropping, but I would just point to the fact that um, where we are now, which is plateaued and may even be going up, um, it, it goes back to where we were at the beginning of November when before all of the holidays kicked in. So we're still at a very high level. The red line you can see is exactly where, we're, um, where we are for positivity rates. And as Dr. Cody mentioned, it's, it's been just plummeting. And so we're at two, below 2% 2 actually currently. Next slide. <clears throat> and this is uh, showing you testing among county residents by, um, by site. And um, the, purple, the purple line is all areas of the county um, outside of South County in East San Jose. Um, and so the East San Jose and South County numbers are um, uh, lower in proportion to the um, rest of the county. However, you can see the testing is um, down, has a downward trend in all areas. Next slide. And then this is breaking it down by uh, race and ethnicity. Um, oh, I'm sorry, no, this is, this is breaking it down by area, but by positivity rates. And what we're looking at here is that the, um, East Side and South County numbers are much higher, at least twice as high or more uh, than the average or the rest of the county. And you can see we are at 4.8% and 4.46% for East Side and South County. If you take the South County and East Side out, you will see that we are at about one and a half percent, so extremely low at this point. Next slide. And as far as the rest of the providers, um, we are still doing, the county is still doing most of the testing um, in the county, but uh, much more activity uh, by our pro the rest of our providers in the community, especially Stanford, who is um, quickly moving up on the scale. Next slide. This again is a focus on just what we're doing as far as testing at the fairground site. And in general, you can see that the daily numbers look like they're dropping, which they are. Um, and the positivity is dropping too. So again, across the board, we're seeing less uh, testing being done in the community. Next slide breaks down a little bit more of the data at the fairgrounds. And in general, we're still doing a lot of testing. This is between February 10th and March 2nd, a three week period. And we did um, 37,000 plus tests. Uh, the positivity rate overall 4.4%, which is Again, about twice the average uh, of our positivity rate. But if then you just scroll, um, scroll down, you can see that the Latino and Hispanic positivity at the fairgrounds is higher than all of those other areas at 7.4%. And it, we've always seen uh, a high percentage of positivity at the fairgrounds in our Latino and Hispanic pop population, um, which, is, which is good because it's a good place we're getting um, the population that really should be tested. So that's a good thing. Um, San Jose is still, where the residents of San Jose still come in the largest percentages, 70% of those coming to the fairgrounds are from San Jose. But if you notice on the right that every other city is represented in, the, in those that are coming for testing at the fairgrounds. Next slide. And I always like to show kind of what is happening in the 
three in the in the last week versus the actual three week period that I just presented the data from. And you can see the top is just the same data I just presented. But if you look to the bottom, that's in the latest week, a one week period, um, and everything is dropping down. So again, just pointing out the Latino and Hispanic number that was 7.4 for a three week period is now at 6.6. .6. But again, still two, three times higher than the average positivity. So again, that's a disparity. And the next slide, just basically saying our message is testing is still important. Um, we're doing a lot on focus, a lot of focus on vaccinations, and that's wonderful. We've uh, vaccinated 20% of the eligible population already, but um, there's still a lot of people out there that are going to be waiting their turn for vaccine and who are still at risk and still need to be tested on a regular basis. So we want to urge people to continue utilizing our testing facilities um, and bring up, um, bring up our uh, improve on our capacity so that we can see more people vaccinated, excuse me, more people tested over the uh, the coming months as we continue to vaccinate people. So again, you can go on to sccfreetest.org um, or call 211 for information on testing. And then finally, the last slide has the appointments for this week and for next week as various uh, pop-up and permanent sites that we have around the county. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Kamal for an update on the healthcare system and preparedness. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fencer Scheib. Have a brief report today on healthcare preparedness. Our hospitalizations continue to decline, and hospitals have largely resumed their uh, pre surge um, service levels, and the situation in skilled nursing facilities has also improved. Uh, next slide, please. So this graph shows the number of hospitalizations broken down by the ICU and non-ICU. As we can see, we have come down from the peak in quite a symmetric manner. So unlike the previous surges where the decline was much more shallow, we have seen a rather steep decline. However, we are seeing some flattening, particularly in the ICU, um, COVID census, and many of these patients are very long-term patients who have been in the ICU or in the hospital for months, and they continue to um, be there. However, the number of cases being added has gone down significantly, so we're continuing to see some improvement in the strain that hospitals are feeling because of COVID. Next slide, please. Um, this slide here compares the decline in COVID to the increase in non-COVID. And as we can see, the number of non-COVID patients shown in the purple line on top is up to around 1,600, which is where it was before the winter surge started. So this indicates that hospitals have largely resumed their, not, their pre surge service levels and are able to take care of some of the elective procedures that were deferred during the worst days of the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. And here we see the percent of uh, beds available, both for the ICU and the non-ICU areas. And those percentages are hovering around 20% which is about where hospitals like to keep their availability because having too many empty beds is not good as is having too few, of course. So next slide. In terms of other issues, our PPE um, inventory looks good. Uh, we have heard recently that some hospitals have had minor issues with glove inventory. However, these are limited and we do have a su sufficient stockpile that we could provide uh, enough to bridge them over any supply chains issue that they are having. In terms of therapeutics, the biologic agents, uh, Bamla, Nivimab, and Regeneron, are now available directly from the manufacturers and the distributor, Amerisource Bergen. They are still free of cost, and we continue to work with hospitals in trying to connect uh, COVID patients to these treatments in a timely fashion. And our CICT group continues to work with anyone who is providing these uh, medications to make sure that people are connected to them in a time frame that uh, promises maximum efficacy. In terms of SNF, our staffing is good, and um, uh, there have been no SNFs that have been directed to avoid taking patients back, which further enables hospitals to take care of acute patients. And as has been said before, 
we are working with hospitals to vaccinate SNF patients who happen to be admitted so that their first dose is done and they are um, able to get their second dose um, after returning. And with that, I will end and pass it over to Mr. Balier. Good afternoon. We continue responding to complaints and concerns filed through our portal at sccovidconcerns.org. And as of February 28th, we received over 8,400 concerns. And again, remember that a prime, most of these being from uh, our eyes and ears, which has been the public. We've resolved, resolved over 8,000 of those and consistent with our past practice, a, a majority of those over 67% resolved by phone or email, where about 33% proceed to an on-site inspection. And this uh, number included about 140 uh, proactive inspections that we did over the last two weeks. Uh, we also issued 674 notices of violation. And of those, again, that's about 8% of the total number of concerns that's resolved. The reported sectors can remain unchanged. And you'll see that food retail, retail trade, and gym and fitness continue to be the top three. Next slide. Uh, the trend I want to point out on, on this slide is that we are uh, seeing a reduction in the number of concerns coming through, which is great news because that means the public's not seeing uh, potential violations that they're now reporting to us. And while it's gone up and down over the last few weeks, we are definitely on a continued downward trend. And uh, uh, next slide, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Consuelo. Good afternoon, members of the board. Hong Kao with the Office of Support of Housing. I will be providing you with the status of the isolation and quarantine support program. So from the start of the pandemic through March 5th, 2021, the IMQ program has helped nearly 1,799 persons to isolate or quarantine in hotels. We've provided supportive services and over $750,000 in groceries and other necessities to help over 3,700 households to isolate or quarantine at home. And we've distributed over $7.8 million in direct rental and financial assistance to nearly 3,800 households. Next slide, please. Since we last reported to the board between February 19th through March 5th, we have supported 87 persons to isolate um, in a motel. We have provided in-home support assistance to 307 households, and we have provided financial assistance to 356 households. And 98% of referrals received, 98% um, of, of referrals received support within the first 24 hours of their isolation and quarantine period. Next slide, please. We want to share a few trends we are seeing over the past year since the start of the pandemic in March 2020. If you look at the bar at the top, we have provided a total um, of uh, 1,799 persons to isolate in motel. 3,700 households receive in-home support or an equivalent of $750,000 and 38 100 households received financial assistance or an equivalent of $7.8 million. And you can see the trend line for motel support in blue closely mirrors the trend line for the number of cases um, in the county that is in the dotted black line. The in-home support and financial assistance lag a couple days behind, which makes sense. And this supports our goal to provide motel assistance within the first 24 hours so that clients can safely isolate or quarantine. Next slide, please. This graph highlights the number of referrals received by the isolation and quarantine program during the surge starting in December. The total referrals are broken into two categories. The first um, is referrals received directly from CICT and referrals re received directly to the hotline. And the dotted line represents the percentage of cases that are referred to IMQ for supportive services. And even though the total number of cases have gone down, we are still seeing a steady flow of referrals for assistance. And this is primarily because of our expanded outreach and engagement strategies with community partners that started in February. And we also allow the flexibility for clients to contact us for support after they've recovered from their um, COVID infection. Next slide, please. And finally, we've recently, uh, we've recently revamped our isolation and quarantine support program website 
The site is now available in both English and Spanish. It is um, community friendly and easy to access with information on what to expect when you contact our hotline, including the types of services that we provide, as well as the eligibility criteria. Thank you. I will now turn it to Dr. Smith. We're available for questions at this time. That's funny. I said, supervisors, if it's all right with you, I'm muted. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is ask if there's any members of our public that wish to speak first, then we'll go into our 10 minute uh, time periods. Nancy, I don't see anyone wishing to speak that's uh, registered from the public. Do you confirm? That's correct. I don't see any either. Okay, we'll start with Supervisor Lee. Let's let's do this uh, 10 minutes each and then we'll do another session as needed. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair Wasserman. Let me uh, get my camera back on. Okay, there we go. All right, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for staff for a very uh, uh, comprehensive report. I'm very happy to see that the trend is looking uh, very nice uh, where we want them to be and, and keep going down uh, in terms of our, both our death rate and our uh, infection rate. So uh, really, really amazingly uh, good work. I just want to uh, thank the staff for it, first of all. Uh, second of all, is, uh, I want to uh, ask about the uh, issue regarding the advertising uh, that came through uh, last time. Uh, and first of all, I, I, I thank you for the uh, detailed report on the outreach, both uh, in language and all these different languages and also for radio and also TV as well. So just real quick, uh, in terms of funding, I mean, I see this is pretty significant funding we're putting in. Um, is this coming straight from general fund? Doc Smith? I'm here, just trying to get uh computer to work. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay. Actually, um, with the change in the uh, federal administrative program regarding uh, FEMA reimbursement, um, we are counting that as a potential reimbursable expense now. I think the board's quite familiar with the fact that we charge FEMA and we get paid for reimbursable expenses. Then they spend the next 10 years trying to deny our payments. <laughs> so, but right now it's a reimbursable expense. Great. So the, the point is that we are going to pay for it first, but uh, the most important thing of course is getting a message out to the public uh, to make sure that we get the, uh, get the community to understand the importance of the uh, of that. Um, second thing I want to go back to is looking at some of the uh, uh, numbers shown on the chart, I forgot which page it was, which show that the, uh, specifically, it was kind of, kind of uh, amazing, Emmanuel Baptist Church uh, has a very huge number of uh, uh, folks signing up to get the um, vaccination uh, compared to the other east side locations that was uh, identified. Uh, is there any reason why that specific location gets so many more uh, folks compared to everybody else? If there's any um, uh, guesses, any um, um, idea how that happened? Yeah, thank you for the question, Supervisor Lee. So a lot of it has to do with the the way that site is structured. A, the, a much higher percentage of the appointments at Emmanuel Baptist have actually been put into our reserve. Oh, you lost me. Hello. Because the fact isn't reserved, that's you. the one that mostly. Go, go ahead, Brian. Finish up. Oh, can you can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Let me hear you. Yeah. yeah so so a, a lot of the it's just a higher percentage of the uh, percentage of the appointments at that site have been put into the prioritized appointment group. Okay. And when our good because when as our we all know that the East, uh, San Jose is certainly the the area where we have the highest number of uh, uh, infection. Uh, and, and clearly it's an area in the, in the zip code 95127. Supervisor Lee and Brian. Brian was talking, and Supervisor Lee, you were talking. Can you hear Brian okay? Supervisor Lee?
Can you hear? Can you hear me, Brian? I, I can hear you, Supervisor Lee. I cannot hear you. From the host point of view, it does look like Supervisor Lee has frozen, and now he has disappeared. Okay, we'll come back, to Supervisor okay. Lee. Am I back or no? Now you are back. Yes. Oh yes. Good. Thank you. Oh boy, today is really a technical day, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Um, I'm not sure how much I just said has been heard. Uh, so I basically was elaborating the fact that uh, it, it's good to see that uh, uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church is one that has been uh, uh, very well used. As we know that the East Side of San Jose 95127 is an area where approximately one out of 10 residents have been contracted uh, COVID-19. So I'm just saying it's very commendable that we're able to get uh, those numbers so high over there to get the vaccination up um, in such a short period. Um, and um, another question is relating to the, the sports uh, uh, regarding youth indoor and outdoor sports. Um, I just want to clarify, there was uh, some word that the outdoor, outdoor sports is now been uh, available. Uh, and what is the story regarding the indoor sports side as far as the state and the county rules at this point? So regarding uh, sports and any other sector specific activity for that matter, literally any other sector specific activity, there are no longer any applicable county level rules. Mm -hmm. um, so the only applicable rules regarding youth sports activities or adult recreational sporting activities, or for that matter, basically everything else uh, comes from the state's guidance. We acknowledge that sometimes that state guidance can be ambiguous or unclear, but unfortunately, since we didn't draft it, we're not in a position uh, to um, be able to help elucidate. But there is no county directive, for example, with respect to youth sports. Mm -hmm. um, the only locally applicable rules are the basic uh, social distancing protocol, um, yeah, case reporting, mandatory case reporting to the public health department uh, and those other kind of across the board, but there's no longer anything specific to youth sports or dining or travel or anything else. Great, thank you very much, uh, James. Um, uh, being a logistics background that I came from of the Navy, of course, my concern is regarding the supplies of what we have and uh, based on the report it looks like we are in pretty good shape on PPEs right now uh, on N95 masks. Uh, what I thought was interesting uh, to observe there as well is that the amount of uh, remdesivir and other type of uh, uh, treatment uh, drugs that used to be allocated in a very tight uh, fashion, looks like those are no longer tightly allocated. In other words, we have a sufficient um, dosage of those uh, uh, medications so that anybody who needs those medication right now should be able to get those yeah, uh, th th for the COVID patients. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct, Supervisor. Great. Okay, great. Wonderful. And that's all the questions I have for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you very much. I really... Um, appreciate not only the, the report today, but really the the content is so striking. It's seeing just how much progress we're making on, on so many fronts and really uh, how far ahead we are of so many other counties across the state. So I, I just want to express real appreciation and, and admiration for, for the level of work that um, that our staff is doing. Um, I have a couple of questions. Does the California Immunization Registry record uh, record re registry record employment sector, or do we have some way of tracking our progress in vaccinating the education and childcare and food system sectors, like we've been able to do for age groups? In other words, how will we know when we sufficiently reach these groups before expanding to the next eligible group? Hi, Supervisor Ellenberg. This is Rocio Luna. Um, so the CARE 2 registry does not collect um, employment information, but we are working to uh, to try to get some of that information through um, self-reported surveys. So, for instance, the County Office of Ed is uh, preparing a survey for all school districts. Uh, while voluntary, we are trying to get that information, and we do have estimates 
from um, from print mod that we can look at as well. So we can sort of cobble the information together, but there would be all proxies. There is no one clean way to get at that data, unfortunately, at the moment. What about when people come for their vaccines? Could that just be a, a question? They can presumably they they have to fill out an appointment form that says that they're eligible. So we know that they're in one of those categories. When they come to their shot, is it a any kind of violation to just say what exactly is your job? If somebody is answering me, you're on mute. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get the phone here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, supervisor. Um, yeah, that is a proxy, but um, we that's part of what we were talking about, surveys or collecting information at at the vaccination site. Okay. Um, clearly, we can only uh, collect that information at our vaccination sites, so that would not include all the people who are vaccinated at Kaiser or um, at uh, PAMP or other locations, but we do use the information that we collect at our sites to give us a proxy of about how many are vaccinated. Okay, thanks. And, and I, I really appreciate the dedicated Fairgrounds Clinic that in partnership with the County Office of Ed and the vaccination events at Monterey Mushroom and Christopher Ranch and the Chibet teams work to sign up employees at their work sites for vaccination employments. Are there also some targeted strategies in place for reaching childcare workers? I'm turn this over to Brian can tell you yes the answer is yes but not enough vaccine right now. Yeah, what, what, thanks yes is a good answer Brian what does it look like how are we targeting? So uh, a couple actually the worksite investigations team has worked with quite a few uh, daycare child care facilities so that's one strategy the one I was mentioning about the warm handoff. Mm -hmm. I know the Healthier Kids Foundation has also been doing some outreach. They have actually been um, excellent in helping with some of the um, scheduling I mentioned earlier, and they've been doing some of that with child care providers. Um, I also, um, also uh, the County Office of Ed is working to reach child care providers. They have, a, uh, as the um, resource and referral agency, they have a lot of, uh, a lot of the, I think they have all the providers except for, you know, some of our family day providers that are not, um, right. not on that list. And then, and then also, um, we're we're reaching out and need need to do a little bit more, but I know the the um, labor subgroup of our vaccine stakeholder group has been in conversations with 521 SEIU 521, who does um, work very closely with many of those family day providers, who some of whom would would not be on the list that, that um, I almost called them SCOE. I know uh, the, the Office of <laughs> Education they prefer that name, um, but uh, so those are some of our strategies related to childcare. I appreciate that. And I assume when um, County Office of Ed or Healthier Kids is getting information, it's coming back to us, correct? Yes, it is. I, and I, I believe that BMC is currently conducting a survey of employees to identify any outstanding concerns or questions among uh, county employees who have not yet been vaccinated. Can you tell me what we know about Courage le um, coverage levels, I guess courage levels too, but coverage levels, um, barriers or any concerns among healthcare workers, long-term care facility staff or other eligible groups? Um, I can't tell you right now uh, what the results of the uh, VMC survey are, but we can get that to you on an off agenda item. Uh, I know that we are finding there is some vaccine hesitancy uh, for all three vaccines. Um, there's clearly a messaging problem with uh, the J&J &J vaccine in terms of people believing that it's somehow inferior, which it's definitely not. It's a better vaccine than you know any of the flu vaccines that we normally receive. Um, but um, you know people have glommed on to the bad press. Um, and we have problems in the uh, custody setting with uh, communication, although we're, all of the departments are putting a huge amount of effort into 
vaccine education and encouraging their eligible employees to get vaccinated. And uh, that's about all I can say, I guess. Thanks. So I'll be interested to see the the report on what the what the barriers are. If if it's if it's just educa just education, that's probably one of the easiest things for us to overcome. Um, I'm interested to know what the other barriers are and to see if there are possibilities to break those down as well. Uh, and I, I certainly recognize that so many aspects of vaccine allocation are fluid and beyond county control right now. And I, I really do appreciate the continued efforts to resolve concerns about the state contract uh, with Blue Shield. On one specific issue, uh, last week it was widely reported that PAMF received fewer doses than expected and had to cancel a huge number of appointments. What processes at either the provider, county, or state level are being utilized to make sure that everyone gets their second dose with, within the required window, which I think is 42 days from the first shot? You're right, Supervisor, that last week, uh, state, statewide, uh, PAMP or Sutter had to cancel, we understand, about 90,000 appointments. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, uh, okay. So we're getting feedback over here. Yep. Um, we don't know how many that translated into exactly in uh, Santa Clara County, but at that point, uh, we did have some additional vaccine. This was before they shorted us. So we transferred 5,000 doses to PAMP in order to try to decrease the likelihood of cancellations for uh, Santa Clara County employees. Um, but that's obviously not happening anymore because we're short already. This was at a time when we were assured by the state that we were going to get sufficient doses to cover all of our second doses, particularly of Moderna, which as was described, we did not get. So uh, you talked about county, your reference was to county employees specifically whose appointments were canceled. I'm sorry or if I said employees, I meant county residents. Okay, sorry. okay, good. Okay, thanks. So my office over the past few days received several calls uh, from PAMP patients that can't get through trying to call camp, um, PAMP and they're gonna hit the 42 day mark this week. Uh, and at least one case uh, the individual is a senior who relies on family to transport her to uh, to her appointments and, and I, recognizing here that our supply is very constrained, but given the fact that we've been very public about our no wrong door policy, can we implement some mechanism to assure that these this specific group of individuals um, from PAMP who've had a first vaccine don't miss the window for that second dose due to either late notice by PAMP or their own mobility and scheduling barriers? Hi, Supervisor. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's been a problem all along. I mean, we have tried our best to take the priority for all second doses. And the CDC, as you know, has extended the time frame between first and second doses out as far as six weeks. Um, and perhaps it will even be extended more. Um, the, it, it's most important to get the first dose in. And then the second dose, which is just a, bu a booster dose, um, can be delayed. Um, we basically um, do continue to have a no wrong door, but sometimes that door is, <laughs> I don't know, closed or locked for um, because we don't have the vaccine. But um, it's, it's, this has been a problem. And then this is why, again, we are trying our best to try to get additional vaccine into our community so that we can meet the needs. So Right, I hear that. And, so is it, if they don't get the vaccine within the 42 days, Marty, do they not have to start again and get a first? Are we still telling them that they can get it and they'll be just as fine as if they received it within the 42 days? 
Right. So that's a good question. And, and I will be very, very clear. Um, the CDC's recommendation from the very beginning was not to restart a, a dose series, a vaccine series with either the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. And so it basically says try to get it during the time that it uh, was authorized for. If not, you can go out to the six weeks and then they go on to say, however, just get it whenever you can get it. Okay. Um, and don't start, don't, don't restart the vaccine. Absolutely not. All right. Thank you. That, that may be the best answer uh, we can give. I just have one more um, point that I want to make in, in alignment with the strategies that are outlined in the advertising campaign report, which I think is exciting. Um, I would encourage the team to enlist the help of and collaborate with local elected officials to amplify the messages that are developed, coordinate on any outreach mechanism in use by, by those officials already and leverage the communication staffs on their teams, especially in high priority neighborhoods uh, where elected officials have, have close ties with their neighbors. I know uh, several uh, San Jose uh, council members continue to offer support. And I think I I'm, I'm, would say pretty confidently that most elected officials across the county are ready and willing to actively support this campaign. And specifically with respect to the census track map shown today, I would like to offer now to partner in the outreach to the tier two priority census tract in my district and other pockets of high need, and would ask that staff follow up uh, with my office to see how we can be supportive. And that is all. Thank you so much. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. You know, um, Supervisor Ellenberg, ending on that note, one one request that I'll make of my staff is if um, we could forward to all the board the, and you may have seen this already, but the, um, the the video that Santa Clara did to highlight that Bigfoot wanted a social distance from other people. It's really hilarious. And if you can see it, it's really worth sending out because I think it makes the point about social distancing in a really fun way. Um, so anyway, I just that just popped in my head with your last comment. Um, I wanted to start by just saying to the entire staff, um, well done. And, and, and both the reporting is becoming even more refined, and but also just the incredible amount of work that you've done over the last year. And I think given the date and the time that we're having this conversation, it really is um, a moment just to acknowledge um, all of you and to thank you for your leadership. And I, I was... I was going to say sometimes when you get this much work done or you're at this particular uh, point in a in a struggle, you want to take sit down and take a deep breath. And I know there's no sitting down or resting because we're not done fighting COVID-19, but I do really just want to say thank you. Um, a couple of uh, observations and then a couple of questions on the um, on the aggregate data that we're still getting with the Asian community, I, I think it's really, really important that we're disaggregating the data, particularly on slides like slide 14, um, because it's really critical that we're able to understand the communities that are still in highest need. So I just want to re reinforce for the staff that um, getting aggregate data for that community isn't, isn't really as helpful as we need it to be in terms of the other work you're doing, especially as it relates to outreach. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is as it relates to the response to uh, Supervisor uh, Lee and my request, I really appreciate the, the prioritized information uh, by Census Track, and also just want to say how much I appreciate the feedback in terms of uh, how we're going to be spending resources with outreach. The question that I, I want to repose for all of you is, as we're learning about our outreach um, successes, I would be very interested in us taking a stab at a timeline around how we get to parity with vaccines in particular, based on all of the work that's being done. And what I was hoping is, is that by next meeting um, in a slide format, I don't, you know, no one needs a, a, a term paper here, but just on a slide format, what are the ma major th um, benchmarks that you're going to be trying to hit? Like, what are the goals we should be setting? And then I think it goes back to Supervisors Ellenberg and Lee's point about how, how the community can help. Um, 
will will be more evident and I think very helpful. Are there any concerns about that request? No, we'll we'll try to get as best we can. Um, um, as you well know, with the with the vaccine shortage, parity is probably not a sufficient uh, vaccination list because you know we need to get everybody increased. But um, we'll try to get something in terms of timing that we can um, give the board, uh, give them some sense of where we think success might be. And you know what, Dr. Smith, I think that is an excellent point that that the way a vaccine is being distributed today negatively impacts the overarching goals that the state has set forward. And I, I appreciate you illuminating that and, and probably, I mean, it's a really good point as to when and how you put a plan together. I think perhaps the way to do that would be to look at percentage increases in in um, effectiveness of outreach and then getting people to sign up to get vaccinated might be the benchmark versus the vaccinations themselves. It may help us understand that in, in part because even as vaccines become more available, we know there are gonna be these hard to reach communities and it may actually lay the foundation for how we keep doing that work. But I, I absolutely understand the point you're raising. Um, yes, we'll do that. Um, I also take the opportunity to address your question about disaggregating the Asian Pacific Islanders. That's a big problem that we've recognized. Um, part of the problem is that the data that's collected in CARES 2 doesn't um, disaggregate. So we have to do that again with a proxy with surveys, um, which uh, we think uh, we think we have proxies that roughly estimate the problem, but it's not super accurate. And as you're commenting, you're exactly correct. The different uh, communities within that are encompassed within Asian Pacific Islanders clearly have different susceptibility, um, particularly Pacific Islander populations uh, have a um, uh, risk pattern that's very similar to the Latinx population, whereas uh, Chinese, Japanese uh, do not. So it is important information. We're trying to figure out a way to get it consistently and accurately. That's good feedback, Dr. Smith, because I think that the, um, it's interesting looking at the census tracts, the way you all have illuminated them. If you know the districts, that's obvious, but I think your point is well taken, absolutely. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to, um, just, I, I had two questions. Um, one is for Dr. Kamal, and one of the questions I'm curious about is, as we're looking at the hospital data, both the folks that are being hospitalized and the folks that are staying um, in intensive care, are we also um, testing those folks for variants to better understand what we're seeing in the hospital itself and the severity of illness? Yeah, there is a sort of a systematic um, approach to testing for variants anywhere in this in in this country. In fact, but um, certainly whenever there are features in a case that are suspicious, um, those can be sent for full sequencing. Uh, what we have found is that really the patients who will have prolonged hospital stay it may not be they have a different strain of COVID. It has to do more with the underlying comorbidities they came in with that just have a, a, prog a poor prognosis, but certainly testing for variants if there's something weird, like somebody young who um, was um, has a prolonged hospitalization, or if there's a large cluster, could be part of that strategy. I just want to encourage us to, to learn what we can, because I, you know, I've seen Dr. Smith's presentation on the on the cycles of disease, and I'm I'm nervous about another uptick. And I, I think even if even if the federal and state government are having a difficult time doing something systemic, um, that at least with the folks who are in our care, um, that if we're able to uh, do the sequencing, that it may help us be more prepared uh, and frankly share that information with others. So, but thank you, Dr. Kamal, and appreciate very much the the work of the healthcare program. 
I mean, healthcare uh, hospitals. Thank you. Um, uh, Supervisor, if I could chime in, this is this is Dr. Cody. We, we are quite concerned about the emergence of uh, a number of different variants, um, as well as the um, the surveillance system across the state and country that's not standardized. And so we have we are building capacity in our own public health lab precisely for this reason, um, and looking at the various sources of um, uh, specimen so that we can somewhat approximate uh, a system that covers the population. Um, and uh, I, I am uh, quite concerned. I'm trying not to uh, go over the top expressing it to you all, but we really are in a race between emergence of these variants and our ability to get our population vaccinated. Um, and as you know, we do not have control over the su vaccine supply. Um, and it's really important for everyone to understand that absent continuing, you know, uh, masking, social distancing, avoiding crowds, um, we could be in a big pickle again. Uh, that's just the, the unfortunate um, epidemiological. That's very helpful, Dr. Cody, and thanks for jumping in on that because um, I think that, you know, we've we all in the community have been trying to make that that case, and I I hear what you're saying, and I hear the urgency, and I also think uh, appreciate that we're building on our own system. Unfortunately, I feel like that's what we've had to do quite a lot of throughout this uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, the last two things that I I just want to ask for next week, or I'm sorry, in our in our next meeting, is that we do have a slide on how we're doing with vaccinating the homeless. I think that's a, a, a really important uh, issue. And the second is going to be, I want to better understand, and I'll ask more of these questions as we talk about the permits, but I really want to understand how um, we're pivoting from compliance to recovery as a, as a primary um, body of work. And, um, and again, I, I, I don't know if, if, if it makes more sense to just in the next week, but we also have another issue, another item that we're going to hear later, so we can maybe talk more about that. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Simidian. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, let me just uh, go through Dr. Smith and let him be the air traffic controller that gets uh, my question landed in the right place with the right person. Um, Dr. Smith, we've talked at past meetings uh, i've asked i think um in early uh february and then uh, a little bit uh, perhaps in early march about uh the potential for both um you know mobile vaccination efforts and for vaccination efforts to reach uh, out to those who are housebound um and i just wonder what the status of those efforts is i know they were both things that uh, you and uh, our team were working on i also know and i should have said this at the outset uh you know all of these uh questions comments and conversations uh, sort of need to start with the understanding that if you don't have any vaccine there's not much you can do to speed its um delivery so uh with that said dr smith um uh, mobile uh vaccine uh delivery and or um uh, serving the homebound. What's your what's your current what's our current situation? Yes, I'll turn it over to Rocio, who's uh, working with uh, the mobile team. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Supervisor Smitty, and that program is officially launching this week. Um, next week, we have the City of Gilroy Fire Department beginning that work. We do have a list of 145 a homebound uh, residents that we receive from social services. And we are, the public can actually reach out to us by emailing us at COVID vaccine home all together, COVID vax home at PhD, sec.gov and ask for a request for homebound delivery for specific residents. So the medical uh, system, the providers, uh, healthcare providers have a form that they can use for to request homebound delivery of their particular patients. And then the public can actually email a request. That request then goes to a central location in the public health department 
and then somebody will contact that person and evaluate uh, again some eligibility medical eligibility and then make the, a schedule for for in home homebound delivery so that that program is now operational and we hope by the end of the month when other city fire departments that have reached out with an interest to help um, deliver vaccines to homebound residents um, that training is happening in a couple weeks actually on March 23rd um, that program will be fully operational everywhere in the county just to follow up if I may through the chair does that mean that if we have constituents who are contacting our offices uh, wanting to access a, uh, a home visit for the vaccine, we should refer them uh, to or assist them getting on the, uh, the uh, email address that you just provided? Or excuse me, the site address? Yes, that that's, you provided. Yes, that's correct. We okay. also have a phone number for you that I can, I can provide. Well, that was my next question, which is, you know, given the target population, uh, uh, particularly when we're talking about folks who are housebound, not, you know, many, not all, will be um, perhaps of very advanced years and may not be comfortable or proficient with online applications. Is there a phone number they can call as well? Or uh, at present, is the requirement that the uh, appointments be accessed online? No, actually, there is a phone number, and I'll, I'll provide that to you. It's 408-970-2818. Uh, residents can call that number, and uh, a public health uh, person will actually pick it up and talk them through the eligibility, assess eligibility, and then schedule a, a visit. Thank you. And then, if uh, forgive me if I missed it, uh, was there uh, some indication of if and when and where we would be Using a, a, a mobile van type uh, delivery system, I'm I'm thinking of sort of frontline workers, maybe folks in the uh, back of house restaurant world who uh, could be served if we had uh, a mobile uh, system rolling up uh, uh, up and down the main streets of our uh, 15 different cities and towns, as well as the unincorporated area. Do we have something like that in the offing as well? At this point, we have a shared bus with uh, San Mateo, um, but um, we have not embarked upon implementing a uh, roving bus uh, for ourselves merely because we don't have sufficient uh, vaccine to make that work. We're uh, still doing the pop-ups uh, so that uh, there's locations where there's easy accessibility, but um, we're limited hamstrung by our capacity at this point, our vaccine amount. Dr. Smith, um, thank you. That takes me to page 22, um, which shows uh, where we have, and if I could ask that that be up on the screen, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, page 22 in the PowerPoint uh, that shows the um, areas where we have uh, been had our own health system vaccinating county residents. Uh, and again, if I could ask that page 22 be up on the screen, please. Hopefully it's going up right now. The, I'm trying. Share the screen. This is the page, I think. Thank you. And if we can boost it up just so it's a little uh, easier to see, that would also be helpful. I know I'm asking a lot in the way of tech skills here, but. I just lost it. I'll find it again. Well, the. thank you. If you want to just leave it at that size <laughs> rather than risk it, uh, <laughs> I, I think we can make do. Well, that was okay. Let's just leave it there. The question I have is about um, the North County area, which uh, is in the upper left-hand corner, where, as you can see, we have um, a very low, our lowest rates of vaccine distribution, notwithstanding the Mountain View site, uh, which I think has been a real uh, boon to the effort. And what's interesting is it contrasts to some communities which might have similar demographics in the West Valley. So I'm, I'm looking at the 
much higher rate of vaccine delivery in, say, Saratoga, Cupertino, uh, Montessorino, even Los Gatos, as compared or contrasted with Mountain View, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, and uh, Palo Alto. Um, and so it's, it's not just a function of you know, more prosperous communities needing less help because we see that we're delivering more in the West Valley. What should I conclude from that? Or what can I conclude from that about who's accessing county shots uh, and not? Because it's clearly not just income related given the West Valley, North County dichotomy. Well, as you point out, this is uh, really just uh, reflective of the residents who are using just the county health system and doesn't include Kaiser or PAMP or Stanford. Um, so um, it would probably be best before I hazard a conclusion that we include Stanford since we do supply Stanford with um, vaccine and I would imagine by including Stanford there would be a larger volume uh, in the um, Palo Alto, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills area but since we don't have that number in front of us uh, I would just say that we'll have to get back to you with uh, updated slides that include Stanford. All right. Well, again, it, it's uh, I'm, I, I just think, you know, we've made a concerted effort, which I think all five of us have supported to get into lower income communities where opportunities may be more limited. And I at first thought, well, that'll be the explanation, except, as I say, I look at the relatively prosperous West Valley communities of Cupertino, Saratoga, Montessorino and Los Gatos, and they are uh, appreciably more. Uh, served apparently by our health system than the North County. Uh, so that's the question I would like to, I just, that's the chart I'd like to understand a little bit better. And um, can, I, can I ask for that uh, within the next five business days, Dr. Smith, is that reasonable? Sure, I'm looking through our website. I think we found something that'll help, but um, we'll get you something off agenda. And I should also point out that this map does not include the community clinics. So you would also see a blip of high density around the uh, community clinics that are not included. So um, we'll definitely get you something off the agenda that um, is reassuring. All right. Well, I'm just, as I say, I just, I, I don't have a, uh, an opinion or a, a viewpoint about it. I'm just trying to understand what is that reflecting? Um, and then on page 14, let me just follow up and uh, uh, underscore the request that Supervisor Chavez made uh, about the um, uh, 65.5 um, uh, percentage uh, for uh, the Asian American community, 65 and up. Um, I, I would, I do think we're going to need to find a way even if it's imperfect, Dr. Smith, to uh, break that out uh, with more refinement as to uh, different uh, communities within the larger Asian American community. I, I just think that's uh, gonna be essential. But I do wanna ask a question, which is, has anyone in our organization with everything else that uh, you've been up to had the opportunity to ask, uh, why is that number as high as it is? And is there something we can learn from that? I mean, is there, is there, you know, is there something happening in the Asian community in terms of uh, accessing the vaccination that we should know and uh, consider as we do our work among other parts of the community? Well, we can learn from the Asian uh, community uh, health assessment that was done a number of years ago that, um, the community in general is values uh, medical care significantly, seeks out medical care often and frequently. Um, so we're uh, making the presumption um, that that has something to do with it, although we can't say definitively what the issue is. But we know that um, previous studies of the Asian community 
have shown um, considerable uh, positive utilization of the health system. Got it. Mr. Chairman, I have just two more factual questions, if I may. Uh, looking at page 12, uh, I just want to make sure I understand the, uh, the data references here. On page 12, it says that 64.4% of residents 75 and up uh, have received at least one dose, and 60.1% uh, of residents 65 and up uh, 65 plus re have received at least one dose. I just want to be clear on that 65 and up uh, number. Is that 65 and up including the 75 and ups or is it just the 65 to 75? I think I know the answer, but I want to be sure. Hi, Supervisor. Um, it's 65 and up all the way. You, if you look on our dashboard, we do break down the 65 to 74 group. But if you look at the 65 and up, it includes it's all inclusive for everyone. Uh, 65, 75, 85, 95. Got it. Thank you. That's so, what I thought. Okay. Be sure. Yeah. And then um, just uh, looking at the breakout on page 13 that follows, uh, and it shows the disparities, again, for 65 and ups uh, in uh, North County and West Valley, um, the appreciably higher percentage of folks there who had at least one dose of the vaccine. Uh, am I reading that right? That uh, it looks to me like 85 to 90 percent of the folks in the North County and West Valley who have um, who are 65 and up have access to vaccine. 85 to 90 percent. Am I reading that right? You are reading that right. Well, that's a, an extraordinary accomplishment. Uh, obviously, I know that's, that is and should be our aspiration for um, other parts of the county who are identified in lower tiers. We've gotten to a pretty good chunk of folks there, uh, looks like ranging from sort of 60 to 75 percent, but uh, I, I know everybody wants to push the numbers uh, up higher, 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 and uh, I support that effort. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that's all I need to ask right now. Thank you. And before we go back around to Supervisor Lee, Supervisor Chavez, did you have a comment to make? Can I interrupt for a second uh, for Supervisor Sumidian? This is a, a map of total vaccination in the county. Doesn't includes all vaccinators. So you can see that it's significantly different than just the county alone. But yeah. we'll still give you the op agenda. Thanks. And part of the reason I was asking through the chair is I, I'm just trying to figure out what's happening because we're uh, looking at these numbers. It's clear that the relative rate of vaccine vaccination is higher. And that's not happening in Palo Alto, according to the, the charts we've got today, that's not happening in places like Palo Alto, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, or Mountain View because of county delivery. So, I'm, and we've talked about the shortages that Sutter slash PAMP and Kaiser have had. So I'm trying to figure out, well, how, 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 where and how are so many folks getting access to uh, the vaccine? Glad they are, but I'm trying to figure out how is that working? Understand how is that working? Because if the private providers are having a problem and we're not uh, doing as much there as we are in other places, but we have these very high numbers of folks who've been vaccinated, I, I'm just trying to make sense of all that. Is 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 my search for clarity and understanding clear, Dr. Smith? Yes, um, I, I think the big differential is Stanford and the community clinics, but we'll have to dive down and get you more information to be sure. But remember, we send uh, our vaccine, uh, quote R, we send vaccine to Stanford in very large numbers as um, compared to the um, PAMP and Kaiser numbers that were previously delivered from the state. And also we have community clinics. So we'll have to dive down in. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Actually, I was gonna pull this map up and I was gonna make a point, which is that um, if you go on our website, and you look at all of these census tract data, um, one of the other things that you'll, you'll note is that 
early on um, when we were when we were um, starting with testing, we opened testing sites all over the county and um, more affluent uh, communities access testing sites in the east side and even out to Gilroy. And that's actually part of what's happening even with vaccinations is that higher income, more educated, almost irrespective of age, are, um, are frankly more skilled at using the tools that we have available to access these different services. And the second thing I was just going to ask um, Dr. Smith is that when we, um, in the past, when you presented maps of all the locations that are receiving uh, county vaccine, we have really focused on the high need uh, census tracts. And I think for the next meeting, it's going to be important to have all locations and to the extent we can, the, the um, vaccine made available uh, by the county and or other partners to the extent that we know it, because I, I do think that, um, you know, I, I think that's just a very important uh, data point for the board to better understand, uh, especially as we're going to be short of vaccine for some period of time. But if the pattern stays the same, even with more vaccine, we're going to have a hard time reaching that parity goal. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, you want to just continue? With, uh, nope, I'm, I was, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, I mentioned this um, previously, but I just want to mention it again uh, right now is uh, the issue of the 40% um, plan that the governor has laid out last Friday of how he's reserving the vaccines for certain zip codes uh, of highly um, affected area around the state. Unfortunate thing is when you look at those zip codes, there's not a single one in Santa Clara County. And my question is, is this a time that we should write a letter or send a message to the state uh, to ask them why are we not in there and how we could do better so that they would make sure that we're not being forgotten? Dr. Smith? Yes. Yes, Supervisor, uh, this is an extreme concern um, on our part. I'm sure the board's extremely concerned also. The way that the um, um, plan was developed at the state level, we mm -hmm. think uh, excludes lots of need in the county and for that matter across the entire state because the HPI index was designed to measure census tract level um, indicators of health risk, particularly related to poverty. And so if you have a zip code, which is made up of more than one cens census tract, which has um, lots of poverty in one part of the zip code, but lots of wealth in another part, part of the zip code, probably the best example being in the um, East San Jose area where the flatlands are much different socioeconomically than the highlands. That brings the zip code numbers out of the lowest quartile. And therefore, um, because you happen to live close to someone who's um, got financial security, you're ignored as someone who doesn't have financial security. Um, the other thing that's troublesome is that the plan at the state level, mm -hmm. uh, which they're calling an equity plan, is a plan that they're only planning to implement for two to three weeks. So it's sort of nonsensical to think that in two to three weeks you can solve an equity problem of years and years, decades of creation. Um, that's why we would argue very vigorously that we shouldn't use artificial measures like zip codes. We should have the local entities, which in this case would be the county and the providers that are dedicated to the safety net population deciding how uh, equity distribution should occur. One of the reasons why we're so upset with the concept of the third party administrator because they don't have the local on the ground experience um, to know where populations live and which people are at risk and how to get to them. 
Thank you, Dr. Smith. And as the presentation has shown that uh, the Clark County has not signed, is not willing to sign with this uh, third party um, administrator's contract that's been presented. Uh, should we should we drop a letter? Uh, and I guess I'll ask the president, Wasserman, do we might have a consensus from the board to uh, direct our uh, staff to gen up this letter because it's urgent and it really is life and death issue, right? If you withhold thousands of vaccines to our residents, this will affect us in many ways. So I, I, would, I would urge if we could get this out, I really appreciate it. Dr. Smith or James, what, what sort of letter has already been sent? I think it would be a powerful addition to have the board sign on to a letter that affirms, uh, you know, affirms that perspective and position. I, I think it would be helpful. Super. If you could draft that, we'll get it signed. Right. Thank you. Right. And that's all I have. Thank you. you. Supervisor Lee, thank you very much. <laughs> Supervisor Ellenberg. Supervisor Ellenberg, you are muted. Am I mute? <laughs> I have no further questions. I appreciate uh, James's suggestion, and I would be happy to sign on to the letter. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. You're good. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. I just, um, I, I, I want to just uh, go back to the uh, observation that Supervisor Chavez shared. I, I know the narrative is out there about folks coming from, um, quote, other parts of the county to access testing. But, uh, you know, I'm looking at slide 46. And uh, the, which is the indication of the testing at Santa Clara County Fairgrounds site. And, you know, the four communities of Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, Mountain View, and Palo Alto are um, just 3% of the tests that were administered from February 10th uh, to March the 2nd, uh, even though they represent uh, more like 10% of the county population and 70% of the folks using the site, I think understandably and predictably, are from San Jose, um, which, you know, you would hope and expect if you put a site at the fairgrounds in San Jose. I, you know, in the 3% that were from those four communities, may well uh, have accessed the site because they work close by and, you know, I'm glad they were able to. I just, I, I think, I think some of this is um, taking on the, uh, the I, I just want to make sure that the narratives that take hold are uh, grounded in data. I'll just let it go with that. All right, Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, I don't disagree with Supervisor Simidian that um, that data is really critical. And that's partly why I'm very interested in us being fulsome in our um, in our presentation of the of where vaccines have been um, available throughout the county. And in particular, whether that's the private sector or the public sector, but in particular Stanford, which I think just really did a good job early on of being, um, you know, on the on the job. By the way, both in testing and in vaccinations, I think also that as the staff looks at this, I, I also would think there would be value in looking at the particular timelines in um, as to when. Uh, vaccines became available just as if just what as we did with testing because i do think that early adopters to understanding the technology are just going to be early adopters and so you may see some changes over time as well including the act the outreach that our staff did so robustly to get people to start accessing tests and uh you know and i'm i'm hoping that'll be the same for vaccination so both timelines, locations, and availability, both in the private sector and the public sector, I think would be helpful to know. 
Thank you all very much for excellent questions as usual. All I'll say is the County of Santa Clara has more people in it than 25% of the states in the United States. And for, we are set up effectively to have herd immunity in 12 weeks by June 1st, if we got the vaccinations. That's the big if. But if, pe if there's an outbreak in Santa Clara County with 2 million people in 1300 square miles, okay? It's not the same as Montana and Idaho and Wyoming and other areas like that. So I look forward to the letter, uh, James, that you'll give to us that we'll sign, that we'll, we'll send on. But we're set up to do already 100,000 vaccinations a week plus, maybe 120,000. And the proximity, the number of people per square mile here compared to those other states that I compared to, there needs to be somebody making some sort of prioritization where the vaccines go. And I hope our letter is persuasive. I hope your previous phone calls are persuasive. I hope our assembly and Senate and congressional and other Senate representatives speak up for Santa Clara County. You know, that the size, the, the number of people, the fact that we are set up to do the right thing as fast or faster than anybody else, that should be encouraged and supported. Not, oh, well, they're, they're doing a great job already. We can cut their supplies. That's all I have to say. Thank you. We'll consider item number 11 received. Oop, Supervisor Lee. Your hand yes. is up, sir. There you go. Thanks, Professor Osman. Um, the number you just mentioned, I just want to confirm with Dr. Smith. Uh, when I asked him earlier regarding our capability, he actually told me that we can actually beef up to close to 30,000 vaccinations a day or 200,000 vaccinations a week yes if the vaccinations is if our vaccines are limited so i just want to mention how amazing that this cap capability has been uh, has been has been risen uh in such a short amount of time thank you yes that's best case scenario would be done by may 1st i threw in june 1st hoping that we'll get more vaccines in a couple of weeks and very glad that johnson and johnson is negative 21 degree freezer and one dose but I'm telling you, Governor Newsom, if you got any extra vaccines, they should go to Santa Clara County because we know what we're doing. And because of the density of people in certain areas in our county, if somebody gets infected there as compared to other places in the nation and in the state, and no offense to my sister in Calusa County with a population of 35,000 people, but they need to use a little more common sense up there in Sacramento. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll consider number 11 received and we now move on to 12. Dr. Smith, are you or Martha taking that one on? I think I'm gonna try this and then we'll turn it over to Martha. Any um, comments you need? Yep. This is a response to a referral um, regarding community uh, organizations who have developed plans or reports or suggestions or models uh, to deal with uh, the, re the uh, pandemic response. So what we did was we put it into a uh, spreadsheet, um, 30 pages of uh, issues or actions that are suggested with um, our discussion about what our understanding is of the recommendation and where we are with regards to them. You can see that many of them are active and, and the board has either already directed us to do something similar or exactly the same. Um, many of them uh, are in progress or some are, have been finished. Um, there are some uh, recommendations that are outside of the board's control or authority, um, others that uh, we're still beginning to work on. Um, so with that, I think um, questions would be appropriate. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy first. I see we have one speaker. We'll go there and then back to the board uh, for this item, which is to receive report for any questions or comments. And are we allowing two minutes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
John Pedigo, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, I just, I'm Father John Pedigo from Catholic Charities. I just wanted to kind of actually comment on the previous section, but uh, I'll comment on this one about racial parity and the concerns around um, uh, around the Blue Shield plan. And um, I think I've already sent a letter about that. Um, I just want to applaud the uh, supervisors for make, you know, making this letter, making things go forward. Uh, I think it's really important that, um, that the state and other entities recognize the hard work that the county has done in working with community leaders and continue to work with community leaders in providing um, uh, equitable access to vaccination. Um, we are very concerned on the ground that the vaccination process is becoming more gentrified as um, as, as time goes on. Uh, we do feel that we need to um, move towards uh, stabilizing our community. Um, and the only way that we can stabilize the community and move forward is really to uh, get vaccinations into neighborhoods and would really encourage the board to explore how might we work together with communities to get people into the, that are in the neighborhoods. Uh, the reason that Baptist Emmanuel, Emmanuel Baptist was has been popular with, with the folks on the east side is because it's in the neighborhood. People see it, they know it, they trust churches. Uh, we would like to uh, to to look at that as a possibility as we move forward. Uh, it, you know, as the, as the vaccination process moves forward, that we would uh, uh, put resources to make this uh, make this happen uh, for our communities using community resources such as existing trusted institutions like uh, Catholic parishes that are in immigrant neighborhoods uh, to be su uh, supportive services uh, to to the effort. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, John. Nancy, I think that's the end of our speakers. That's correct. That concludes Board. our public comment. Thank you. Board members, any comment on this item? We don't need a vote. Yes, a uh, couple of seconds. Oh, Supervisor Lee, there you go. Yes, thank you. Um, one, oh yeah, first of all, a very good uh, report from staff on this. Uh, There's a lot of great work that our county clearly is doing. A um, couple of questions uh, regarding uh, the food distribution. Um, I just want to make sure that the food distribution and meal delivery for the at-risk populations is also being um, medically tailored uh, by having some type of a, a registered dietitian within the CBOs uh, to help provide these services. And I just want to see if this is already done uh, or is this something that not being mentioned at all? Dr. Smith. Sorry, I only heard part of the question. I think what it was, was that it, are we working with CBOs to make sure that food delivery and distribution is appropriate in the communities? And uh, the answer to that question is yes. We've been okay. working with the cities and uh, CBOs with multiple right. relationships and with the food banks. Okay, very good. Um, the other issue is the, uh, the, uh, the conductivity. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure we have uh, connectivity uh, with all uh, all areas, <clears throat> uh, and and trying to see if there's any type of financial tools that we we could use to help offset the cost for the internet services uh, or devices for low income areas individuals. I know the county has already partially implemented some of these uh, activities, right? The effort regarding um, so-called uh, Wi-Fi uh, free zones has been uh, spearheaded along with uh, the Office of Education via support to uh, children and families in order to facilitate access during the pandemic, particularly in order to facilitate uh, distance learning. And we've uh, contributed finances as well as uh, iPads and computers, um, but um, we're not there yet. I mean, there's still a whole lot of work that needs to be done. But I really want to thank uh, the Office of Education for all of their commitment to that effort. Great. Um, and then the other issue is also financial uh, concerns, especially in some of our uh, Latinx and African-American communities. Uh, regarding COVID. Um, and I really think that we need to try to find some type of a multifaceted approach for the financial remedies to help stabilize our families enough so they do not lose homes or uh, integrate into remedies to help the families to 
for the emotional well-being, uh, such as mental health and physical health as well. Uh, it says that this is currently in process, um, and I just want to see if there's anything you want to elaborate uh, on top of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Supervisor, Ellen, whoop, Supervisor Ellenberg, yes, there's your hand. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank staff for the report and for the chart. Um, I really appreciate the snapshot of our COVID response activities over a, over a wide variety of issues. I was hoping to see some recommendations regarding how we're going to keep the conversations going with our partners and some plans for future needs as part of the referral that was uh, approved last month. I'm talking about items three and four specifically. Uh, and I am sensitive to the concerns previously raised by Supervisor Wasserman uh, when this referral was introduced uh, to not detract from the critical vaccination effort underway. Um, however, our county's organization is evidenced by today's meeting agenda alone is still maintaining core services in a number of areas and has continued to balance COVID response with ongoing operations for now one year. Uh, this is one of the challenges of the ongoing nature of this emergency, the demand to continually respond to changing urgent conditions while also balancing other critical community needs. And we need to be able to walk and chew gum and also bounce a ball at the same time. We have to continue to meet immediate needs for COVID and also county essential duties and begin to look to the future of long-term organizational and community needs in dialogue with our partners. Um, Supervisor Chavez thought, thoughtfully noted in the, in the last item that we need to begin pivoting from response to recovery. Uh, and I want to express the first strong agreement um, with that sentiment. Our current, these current COVID uh, reports at board meetings focus on what we are currently doing to respond. Um, and they are full of very, very useful information. I would like us to also balance that need to look ahead, especially as we continue to have hopeful discussions around vaccination, returning to classrooms, and the loosening of restrictions. Um, so I'd like to, um, Supervisor Wasserman, you said we didn't need a, a vote on this item. Correct, it's your but I, report. Okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna make a motion though, um, to, with the, with a couple of requests, okay. in addition to to acceptance, um, so maybe we could take a vote on that. Uh, my motion would ha has two requests. First, that the county disaster management recovery team provide an overview of their structure, activities, and how they engage with external partners on community recovery needs at our first April meeting, and on a recurring schedule thereafter, either every other month or, or perhaps quarterly, um, that they re report back on that work. And second, between now and that meeting, I'd like administration to circle back with the organizations that submitted uh, recommendations to affirm um, that they are in agreement with the responses provided on the grid or determine if there are any outstanding items that, that still warrant county response. And I would hope for a, a second on that. Thank you. Was the second to the monthly or the quarterly in your motion? I, I'm happy to leave that to administration. And, and, and it was every other month or quarterly. Every my, other my guess month. is they'll choose quarterly, but I want, I'm happy to keep it open. Got it. Left to them. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Supervisor Lee, you seconded? Yes, please. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez? Yeah, um, thank you. I am. Um, I would like to make a slightly different recommendation. I do want to thank uh, Supervisor Allenberg for the the um, referral. And it was it was really helpful, I thought, to be able to look at this all in one place because I I like you probably have these reports all over the office. But what I um, would like to recommend is that um, that the that there be a discussion in one of our committees, and, and I would offer to have this happen in FGOC to look at what we want to prioritize, and then make that recommendation to the full board, uh, Supervisor Allenberg. And the reason I'm interested in this is that I think you're right. There are probably a number of areas that it would be good to reach back out to the groups to see if 
if they concur, but I think the other than question is of, of what is outstanding should be prioritized and what should the board perhaps that it hasn't done lean into versus perhaps let uh, local jurisdictions take on. I think that's particularly important now that the federal government has these stimulus uh, packages coming out, because I think that perhaps what cities weren't able to do, they will be able to do, and they wanted us to do. And, and also I'm very interested in, um, as I know you've raised this a number of times in better understanding um, the long-term implications for significant partners. And in particular, I'm thinking about the County Office of Education as one that we, that we, you know, that we're doing behavioral health with, and we're doing these other kinds of activities with. Um, so if it's okay with the maker of the motion, um, prior to the, prior to, well, I think that the results of this should be shared with everybody who sent us a report and get their feedback. I think that's great. But I do think that there ought to be some prioritization. I'm recommending it go to committee because I think that will just help it help refine the discussion before the board. Uh, but I like the direction. It's just more of a a framing of it that I'm interested in in better understanding. Is this a friendly amendment or a substitute motion? Uh, um, it, it would be a friendly amendment, but really I, I'm interested in what Supervisor Ellenberg thinks about it before I would offer anything formally. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, I think it's it's a great idea. I just want to understand um, the timing. I think it, imp would you like this to go to FGOC for review before we hear from the partners or? Oh, no. I think they okay. can go concurrently. Like, I think we should ask oh, the partners for their feedback because I think that would actually inform the committee because I think it would help us be able to say, oh, this makes sense. And then mm -hmm. for us to bring it back to the board on your quarterly um, report out timeline. Absolutely fine. That's and great. You guys are me. Are you well with that as well? That's right. You're the committee chair. That's <laughs> well, right. He was also the second. Oh. <laughs> yes. Supervisor Lee, were you okay with that? Yes, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further comments? None. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor and a second. Supervisor Smitty, I'm not seeing a hand from you, so I'll presume you're okay with it as well. Nancy, would you call the roll, please? Supervisor Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you very much. Item 14 is our report from our county executive, Dr. Jeff Smith. Did you want to do 13 first? I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Vice President. I turned my page over. That was item 12. Let's go to 13, which is adopt a resolution denouncing the ongoing anti-Asian sentiment and violence against Asian American community members brought forth today by Supervisors Lee and Vice President Ellenberg. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, very good, yes. First of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, indulging me on this uh, topic on item 13. Um, as we have all seen, um, uh, the amount of the Asian um, hate crime uh, that has been coming around this, not just our county, but our na na nationally, has been amazingly uh, high. Uh, this actually started way back last April, I believe. Uh, Supervisor Chavez introduced a referral that denounced xenophobia and anti-Asian sentiments due to the COVID pandemic, and the board adopted the resolution. It's been a year now, and the issue is still persisting. I'm certainly extremely appalled by the recent surge of these attacks against Asian Americans and condemned these acts of census violence, and I'm very troubled by this as the only API member on this board. Santa Clara County is home to over three quarter million of Asian Americans with deep roots for many generations. Our county is rich in diversity and has a long tradition of being a welcoming community. The increase of violence, attacks, harassment, and intimidation against Asian and Asian Americans is absolutely unacceptable in justice to all of us. The face of hate will come in many shapes, but we must always stand in rejection of hate and ignorance, no matter the form. We must fight any effort to harm someone because of the color, their culture, the language, or any part of identity that's rooted in the community. Or to the right, to the right to be themselves as every soul in America is definitely entitled to do. I see not only my parents or my children in the face of Asian Americans, 
that have been attacked for this identity. I also see my neighbors being brutalized like so many have been in our streets for so long. Unfortunately, our country's history has been marred by incidents like these, and the COVID pandemic has only exacerbated this long-standing anti-Asian sentiment and xenophobia. We may wish that this rhetoric does not incite violence, yet when the violence matches this dangerous rhetoric, how are we expected not to connect them? We must hold those who use this rhetoric accountable because we must end this violence. Freedom of speech and thought are no longer an excusable defense of being held accountable for bigotry or inviting violence against others. As we enter 2021, we must call for unity over division and to stand up to all forms of racism to protect one another. I know that if we work together and continue to stand up, speak up and take action, America will fulfill our brightest dreams as a land of the free for all. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. Uh, I am all too familiar with what it means to be treated disrespectfully or be met with violence uh, because of who one is. An integral part of my Jewish identity is my obligation to stand with and for others who are targeted because of their religion, ethnicity, race, gender identity, or sexuality. While we don't, when we don't stand up in defense of one another, we run the very real, real risk that no one will stand for us. I believe that we are all responsible for one another and that we must not be silent in the face of hate, discrimination, bigotry, or racism. Silence is tantamount to violence. Supervisor Lee, thank you for inviting me to bring this refer referral forward with you. I join you in condemning vocal, physical, and emotional violence against members of the AAPI community, and I will always have your back. Thank you. Mr. Raj Chavez. Thank you. I, I, um, Supervisor Lee, I, I really appreciate the meaningfulness of you bringing this forward, and so thank you for that, and Supervisor Allenberg for, for co-authoring um, co this. Um, I think you're right. I mean, it's interesting to look back at the time that we put that um, that early resolution forward and to see, to your really important point, how little has changed and really, frankly, how it's escalated. And so I appreciate very much you, you bring this forward. I also just wanted to say to my colleagues that you may recall that we established a, a county hate crimes task force that we recently um, kicked off. And I'm, I'm raising that mostly to say that I'll look forward um, to bringing forth recommendations um, to, from that committee and that we had at our first meeting, we had a really, really robust discussion. Um, and it's a very active board. It's huge and it's active. And um, our task force will meet again on March 26th and uh, we'll look forward to bringing recommendations forward. I, I think we're not probably gonna bring them in one uh, action, but bring them as they uh, become available to us. So thank you very much, both of you, for putting this uh, both in the public's, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the public heart and mind, but also just as a reminder for us as elected officials to see what more we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Sumidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank both the maker and the seconder, uh, both of the co-sponsors. I want to associate myself with uh, Supervisor Lee's uh, comments. Uh, they capture my views and values as well. And I would like to thank uh, the views and values of the folks we represent. Um, I suspect uh, many of us have at some point or another used the phrase, uh, that's not who we are. Uh, and regrettably, uh, the frequency with which these incidents occur suggests that uh, perhaps we need to take another look. Uh, I, in addition to associating myself with uh, Supervisor Lee's comments, I, I was struck as I listened to Supervisor Ellenberg because uh, in uh, sort of everyday parlance, she captured the sentiment of, uh, I, I can't remember, it was an invocator, uh, but uh, we, we had a a guest in the chambers who some years ago uh, quoted Rabbi Abraham Joshua uh, Herschel, who said that in, in a free society, uh, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Uh, 
And I just think that so captures um, my feelings and I think the feelings of our whole board about this issue. Uh, so uh, too easy to say, uh, you know, gee, uh, that's uh, someone else's bad behavior, perhaps, you know, some are guilty, uh, but all are responsible. And I think the measure today underscores the importance uh, of that notion. And um, there's more all of us can do. Uh, and I uh, do what we can to foster some understanding, try and uh, put these kinds of behaviors. Supervisor, thank you. Thank you all very, very much for your comments. Supervisor Lee, thanks for bringing this forward and Supervisor Ellenberg for joining on. I, I know each of you well enough to know that each of you cares and respects the rights of each individual, man, woman, child, race, creed, color, sexual preference, whatever. I have not seen in now my 11th year anything discriminatory amongst any of the supervisors I've had the privilege of working with. And I know this board is as fine as they come. So on the one hand, it's a shame that we have to bring such a re resolution forward. But on the other hand, I think it's important that we do so that we recognize the imperfectness that exists out there. We call attention to it. And we vow to do whatever we can to make things as good as possible and as right as possible in Santa Clara County. And I know that's part of our core mission is equity, equality, treating people right and with respect. And again, thank you, Supervisor Lee and Ellenberg for bringing this forward. Uh, oh, we do, we have one speaker now, Nancy. Yes, two minutes on the yes, timer. Yes. Okay, our next speaker is Kian Do. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. Then you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. I am very honored to be able to speak to you, and I want to thank the two supervisors for introducing this resolution. Um, my name is Hien Do. I'm a faculty member at San Jose State University. I've been teaching here for 30 years, um, and it's um, a little bit disheartening to see the rise of anti-Asian, especially in the Bay Area um, in this moment in time. And I think that a lot of the symbolic um, intervention that you are all doing is wonderful. It gives us the possibility of thinking about how to build communities, how to build bridges with other communities and how to let people who are doing this kind of um, acts um, know that we're not going to tolerate it as a community. Um, I think the leadership that you're providing is tremendously important. Um, I think that the idea that we need to make sure that everybody is treated equally and that we will speak out um, against violence no matter where it is. So on behalf of um, San Jose State, on behalf of my students, and I think that there are 40% of my students who are Asian American at San Jose State, um, this is very, very important and I, again, um, appreciate your taking the time to introduce this resolution, pass the resolution, but also to make sure that as a community that you are listening to the voices um, of all of us, uh, in this case, the API community. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate all the work that you do. Um, and it's a very courageous, important, um, and I applaud you with all my might. So thank you. Thank you very much. Half of my staff went to San Jose State. Go Spartans. Our next speaker is Gabriela Garzon Gupta. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Gabriela Garzon Gupta and I am with the Asian Law Alliance. First off, thank you to Supervisors Lee and Ellenberg for bringing this resolution to the board's conversation. Um, I'm calling in to urge you all to adopt this resolution because our AAPI community needs protection and acknowledgement. This means our students, our elders, our families, everyone. People should feel safe to go to the park, go grocery shopping, go to school, and just go through their everyday activities. They should feel safe to wear the clothes they want, speak their language, and just show their culture without fear of retribution, especially in the Bay Area, which has such a deep history of being accepting and more progressive. This uptake in anti-Asian right racism has been disturbing and no doubt has been incited by the anti-Asian rhetoric, but we need to take action and we can. 
I urge the county to adopt this resolution at this turning point. We need to stand with our AAPI community and denounce racism in any form. This resolution is a great start towards taking action and supporting our most vulnerable communities. When we denounce racism here, we're denouncing racism for all groups as well. So I think it's symbolic in that sense as well. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kiana Rodriguez. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I'm Kiana Rodriguez. Thank you to Supervisors Lee and Ellenberg for bringing this resolution for the board's consideration. Santa Clara County's population is nearly 40% Asian. Since the start of the pandemic, there has been over 700 anti-Asian hate crimes reported in the Bay Area alone, compromising 25% of reported hate incidents nationwide. We ask the county to reaffirm a clear message of solidarity opposing hate, violence, and xenophobia. It is important that our elected leadership continues to raise awareness and publicly condemn anti-Asian sentiment and violence, invest in culturally competent resources and cross-community education, and protect vulnerable communities from further violence. Please continue to demonstrate that an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. We thank you for joining us and, shared, and joining me in a shared commitment to serve and protect our elders, APIs, and immigrant communities. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our public comment. Thank you very much. We have a motion by Lee, a second by Ellenberg. Nancy, if you could please conduct our roll call vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you very much. Now I'd I'd item number- the, uh, Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Supervisor, Supervisor Lee? Yes, I'm sorry, uh, uh, President Wasserman. I just want to first say uh, thank you to my colleague for the unanimous support on this resolution. Uh, as, as they said, this is just the beginning and we are looking forward to potentially come up with some action items, whether we through referral or other ways, and I will be uh, working on that uh, in the next, uh, before the next meeting, hopefully. And the second thing I do want to mention is want to really thank uh, 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 Vice President Allenberg for the co-sponsor for this uh, resolution. Uh, I still remember about two and a half years ago, uh, I was standing there uh, at the San Jose City Hall uh, Rotunda uh, right after the Pittsburgh mass shooting where she was speaking because that mass shooting was taking place literally across the street where she grew up in. Uh, these are the type of uh, incidents that we absolutely is not tolerable and we absolutely need to stand up together to fight these issues and sad that it's still happening today. And I want to thank her for her courage and her commitment on fighting a uh, bigotry and justice. And uh, we, we are always together and, uh, and I'm look forward to, to all of our board and, and our county to do better and make sure that our county is safe for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doctor, Ada. Dr. Smith, County Exec Report, item number 14. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit of an update on uh, moving parts in the budget uh, this year. As the board knows, um, quite dramatic actions were taken by the board to um, delete uh, 1,200 plus positions in the county. And um, at the same time, we had uh, significantly higher uh, revenue in property tax and sales tax than would reasonably be anticipated because of the K-type recovery, which uh, we've talked about before. Um, because of that, the so-called structural deficit in the budget has been greatly narrowed and uh, we um, have positive news coming from uh, the state and the feds in terms of recovery and rescue act um, fund, funding that will be forthcoming. I do uh, wanna make sure that the board and everyone knows that it's anticipated at this time that uh, at least the majority, probably all of this money will be one-time funds. So will not solve our, any ongoing structural deficit. However, obviously it'll pay for many of the expenditures that have been made regarding uh, COVID. Uh, we're still waiting for analysis of the uh, version, the Senate version of uh, the Rescue Act at the federal level. And obviously the state budget, even though it anticipates or the 
I should say the governor's budget, even though it anticipates new revenue, is not approved until it's um, approved by the legislature. And then we'll have a May revise, which will update um, our projections. That all being said, um, we are working on um, a recommended budget. We're talking with all of our departments. We initially gave them targets of uh, $60 million reductions. Those will be unnecessary. And so I'm quite confident we'll be able to come up with a recommended budget that is sort of stable, abnormal in the sense that after major reductions that already occurred over this year, I don't see any major reductions on the way. Um, but um, we'll let you know as soon as we have our recommended budget in May. Um, and as I said, we're working with all the departments to um, make sure that we have a reasonable budget and trying to comply with all of the requests and directives and referrals from the board about being as open and transparent and program-based as possible. Thank you, Dr. Smith. That's fantastic news. Any questions from the soups? Nope, looks like we're all right. Now on to James Williams, County Council number 15. At the March 8, 2021 closed session by a vote of four to zero with Supervisor Ellenberg absent for the item, the board authorized the county to initiate litigation to challenge a federal U.S. Department of Health and Human Services rule that if allowed to go into effect would retroactively add expiration dates to almost all of the approximately 18,000 regulations issued by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services over more than six decades. The uh, litigation is now on file and is available uh, to any person upon inquiry. That concludes my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. That includes, do we have any questions, County Council? Seeing, well, yes, a hand, yes. Yes, Supervisor, Vice President Ellen. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to um, explain for the record that I, I was absent for that vote uh, because I was in a uh, NACO uh, legislative conference meeting. And had I been there, I absolutely would have voted yes as well. Thank you. We appreciate that. We now move on to items 16 and 17, which at the beginning of today, we uh, voted to hear together. Mr. Mills, I assume you're here to answer any questions we may have. Yes, President Washerman, I'm here for item 16. Um, can you hear me okay? We can hear you just fine. And member 16 is to receive an item and 17 is as well. We have Mr. Mills here for item 16. And we're gonna have Mr. Drapley and uh, Leslie Crowell here for 17. Actually it'd be David Berry instead of, Les instead of Jeff. So there David you go. Barry, I've, I've got you in place of Jeff. Thank you very much. John, I cut you off. Is there something you wanted to say on 16? I'm happy to give some opening comments and then I'm not sure um, if Dave has any for the FAF item, item 17. Okay, um, we'll, we'll address that. Um, we're hearing them both together. Anybody in the public who wishes to speak on these items, please register electronically. And board members, we've got John here and David here. And Leslie here is my understanding. Yes, that is Leslie here. I knew David in place of Jeff. David is Leslie here as well, or are you subbing for um, She was here earlier. Uh, let me check. Don't know. We'll make do. Let's move on. <laughs> All right. Let's. I like that attitude. All right. We'll do that. And Nancy, I see no guest speakers from the public on either of these items. Do you confer? Yes. Confirm? Yes. Concur. That's correct. <laughs> Each one of those words will work. Thank you very much. Supervisors, any questions for, um, for David and, uh, and John on items 16 and 17? Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the staff and the consultants for the comprehensive uh, staffing report and feasibility study. I was very pleased to see that my previous request for a comprehensive report to include our county's effort to address child care needs was included in this report. Um, and additionally, I have a screen freeze. Hold on, sorry. 
<laughs> I'm additionally highlighting uh, for the public and my colleagues that we were able to provide child care to 221 essential employees during the pandemic. And I want to recognize Leslie Crowell and her team, along with First Five, the County Office of Education and Healthier Kids, in addition to district uh, provider partners, direct provider partners, for getting that program up and running in record time. As we've all seen, the pandemic has laid bare the need for quality childcare options in order to support our essential workers. I would like for us to become the standard bearer of supporting our workforce in this way on an ongoing basis. The report reinforced many things that my colleagues and I already know about the value of providing options to our workforce around childcare and paid family leave. We know that it's a win-win-win, a win for our employees, particularly women. And I did notice that more than two thirds of our workforce are women and the overwhelming majority of participants in the focus groups were women. It's a win for the county in terms of productivity and being an employer of choice. And of course, it's a win for children with all of the lifelong benefits that come along with access to early high quality care. The surveyed employees overwhelmingly reported the need for financial support for childcare, access to before and after school options for programming, and on-site or near-site childcare to our county properties. Given the well-documented economic impact of childcare on business productivity, we should be acting with urgency. When our employees are absent due to breakdowns in childcare arrangements, we cannot provide optimal services to the tens of thousands of clients who rely on county programs and services every day, and we need to focus on providing those services, particularly now. One of the recommendations that the consult consultant outlined is how our county administration should better inform employees of existing options. I want to say a couple of things about that. Um, first, I didn't appreciate uh, throughout the report the use of the phrase quick wins. This is not a political gain, um, game, uh, but, a pro but a policy priority where I'm seeking real and dramatic impact. There certainly are some short-term strategies as well as mid-term and long-term, but our goal should always be to maximize impact. It was also concerning to read of the number of employees who aren't aware of our existing services. I would like to direct staff to please create a plan to fully and clearly inform all employees, current and during onboarding of future employees, of their options regarding childcare, including the promotion of the DCAP uh, program, or the Dependent Care Assistance Program. If employees need support in applying for this benefit, that support should be made available to them and ultimately the county will save money due to the, the FICA reductions. Suggestions regarding sharing information and offering seminars, just wanna be clear that's not childcare. Um, what our employees need are real solutions, financial support, available spaces in high quality programs that are convenient to their homes or workplaces and a family friendly work environment. Um, through the chair, I'd like to ask uh, Supervisor Chavez as chair of the Children, Families and Seniors uh, Committee and as someone who has joined me in these referrals and has been a long time champion of these policies. If we could bring these reports back to the March uh, CFSC meeting where we can have further discussion on this and perhaps make some recommendations for next steps. Are you open to that? Thank you. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. That's all I have for today then. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Um, I would just say, uh, Supervisors, I, this is an area we've all weighed in on. So I know we all feel like we own this and I, and that's exciting to me, frankly. Um, what I would be asking is if, if that's action we could take with 16 and Supervisor Ellenberg, were you saying that for 17 also? Yes, please. Yes. Thank yes. you. Um, with that, I, I would second that motion and, um, and very quickly reaffirm that what Supervisor Ellenberg said about making sure we're informing our employees and also that we're instituting the baby box program right away. I don't think that takes a lot more discussion. Thank you. And Supervisors Ellenberg and Chavez, we're trying to deal with 16 and 17 together. Um, both are received reports, but I heard the motion made in the second. So we will have a roll call vote on this. 
We also just got word Leslie was having trouble zooming in. So she has called in and she is available by phone should we have any questions for her besides Mr. Barry. I don't see any other hands. Oh, Dr. Smith, I see your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. I um, wanted to just uh, give the board a heads up as we bring these issues back to committee and further mature them. Uh, the new Office of Children's and Family Policy will take over a coordinated approach to the child care and family issues um, as we get uh, Rocio up to speed on all of the work that she has to do. So you'll see a number of faces involved, but the uh, trajectory is to coordinate it in the new office. Understood, thank you. All right, um, are the motion makers making the motion? We'll say to receive 16 and 17 along with the motion you made? Yes. Yes, yes and yes, okay. And again, just to double check on any late, no, we have nobody else speaking. Thank you very much for your comments. I think this is an exciting development, the direction that we're heading, uh, making us, as we've said for half a dozen years, Supervisor Chavez, more of an employer of choice. Yay. Um, I think that's exciting. I also look forward to not only where um, facilities will be located, but how we will pay for them, reduced rates, credits, what, whatever, whatever it is, to see the information coming back and making a decision at that time, what we're able to afford and do at that time. But I'm, I'm glad to see the support that I've seen over the last year or so uh, for this item. And if not any objection, I'm gonna ask Nancy for a roll call vote. Thank Supervisor you. Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you, Nancy. That took care of items 16 and 17. We now move on to item 18. Is our SEPA director, Joe Zintek, here? Hi, yes, Supervisor, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Anybody who wishes to speak on this item from the public, please register electronically. Supervisors, any comments that need to be made? Um, we've got some recommendations. Perhaps look, if it's looking all right. for some direction. Is that Joe? Yeah. Is that Cindy? Who's talking? Oh, sorry, it's Cindy. I was just going to say if we could hear from the public first. Yes, I don't believe. No, we don't. We do. We have three members of the public. Nancy, if you'll let them in at two minutes each. Sure. Thank you. Our first speaker is Nathan Ulsh. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, Honorable Board of Supervisors. My name is Nathan Olsh, the Director of Policy and Operations at the San Jose Downtown Association. We serve over 2,000 members, and we are also a member of the Greater Downtown San Jose Economic Recovery Task Force, convened by San Jose Council Member Raul Perales. We greatly appreciate Supervisor Chavez and Ellenberg's initiative to bring this item before us, and thank you to the county staff for putting the time to get this recommendation together. We ask that you approve county staff's recommendation to reduce or waive up to $5.5 million of permit fees charged to small businesses and establishments for the calendar year 2021 as proposed. As you know, these are very challenging times and our business community gravely needs any support they can receive. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ray Romero. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. My name is Ray Romero. I'm a business owner of Siam Thai Restaurants in Morgan Hill, along with my wife, Dow Romero. <clears throat> Behind the scenes, um, there's been several people uh, that don't know I'm making these remarks, but I'm going to go ahead and name them. I think Mike Wasserman, uh, I believe from an initiative that I put forth from the beginning of January about small business and free relief. <clears throat> uh, during this time in the last year, it's been very difficult for uh, many businesses. I personally know several, probably half a dozen or so uh, restaurant owners that can't even pay their rent, let alone some of their personal expenses. And 
through my local contact with the city of Morgan Hill and several others that have uh, supported my initial efforts about uh, fee relief. Uh, I believe they were able to, con to connect the dots to several people. I believe Mike was one of the people that early on uh, <clears throat> heard of my initial request and some draft emails uh, that I was advocating for with this uh, new idea to help small businesses. I believe Mike and some others that I'd like to mention for the record, uh, Rochelle uh, Gaddy, she heads up the Department of Health um, for the County of Santa Clara. And I can't name uh, others uh, just because I don't know, but there are many others that have helped support this. And I wanted to express my uh, thoughts and um, to appreciation for their work. So many times these elected officials go unrecognized uh, for much of the work they do behind the scenes. And I urge all the board members to please support uh, a small business fee, re fee relief to help many of the small, small businesses, their employees uh, for this. And I can't tell you how happy uh, I am for all of what you guys have been doing. So please support this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Tran. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, uh, Honorable Supervisors. Uh, David Tran, Policy Legislative Director from uh, the Office of San Jose Council Member Raul Perales, uh, representing downtown San Jose and the surrounding neighborhoods. I am here uh, today to ask that you approve staff's recommendations to uh, provide fee relief to small businesses during this time. Uh, a letter from the council member was also sent to your offices and is available in the public record. Our office would especially like to thank Supervisors Ellenberg and Chavez for bringing this initiative forward. Small businesses and local community organizations in the greater downtown area uh, continue to struggle economically. During the many meetings from our Greater Downtown Econo Economic Recovery Task Force, business owners have shared explicitly that every dollar helps and that relief from permit fees can assist with a number of unexpected expenses that continue to pile up as a result of the pandemic. We appreciate the county for listening to our small businesses and your willingness to, to utilize this one tool among many to support our local economy. Thank you for your time and consideration. That was our final speaker. Thank you very much, Nancy. I appreciate that. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to appreciate uh, Supervisor Chavez and hope that all of our colleagues will consider these recommendations today as we take another step towards supporting local small businesses during this very challenging time. Uh, I would like to recommend support for the, the proposed uh, fee credit option as this broad relief criteria improves the efficiency in which small businesses will receive the relief while also maximizing the number of small businesses that qualify. I also want to be clear that this effort will directly result in more than five and a half million dollars remaining in our local economy, helping our smallest businesses remain in operation, retain their employees, and begin to rebuild after an extraordinarily challenging year. Their stability means the economy's broader stability. Thank you. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm still here. The proposed, the proposed fee relief will provide targeted financial assistance to our smallest, most vulnerable business owners, many of whom are women, immigrants, and people of color. The proposed criteria target restaurants, grocery stores, some fitness facilities, some personal care services that have been the most impacted and endured the hardest financial uh, hardships during this health and economic crisis. And they're designed to support those who are experiencing the greatest need while excluding the big players who are not facing the same degree of financial vulnerability. And I fully support this opportunity to address the imbalances that are present in our economic, political, and social structures so that we can continue to work toward a more fair and equitable system. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I'll, I'll second that motion made by Supervisor Ellenberg to, um, in, to go in that direction. And, um, and I just had a quick question for staff. And, um, you know, and if we don't know the answer today, that's okay. Well, actually, two. One is, 
it would be great to, um, as you're moving through this process, just to better understand what works with the process and perhaps what could be improved. Um, and in particular, how the communication will work with the small businesses. Um, and perhaps you will know that already and you can respond to that. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Chavez. Um, we were anticipating communicating the small businesses, obviously the standard ways on our website, but also um, with all the invoices that go out showing the credit and then potentially uh, direct mail um, also to the small businesses. We're finalizing those plans uh, this week. So if I could make um, two recommendations, I, one would be um, if we could send something out to all of the uh, business associations that we do work with all of the chambers because they have such good lists with their own members. Um, and then the second would be if, if possible, I know we have a number of phone banks that are going up to remind people to get in line to be vaccinated. And if in fact we have to slow down that outreach, um, whether or not we can partner with the Chibet team to do some outreach to the businesses they've already reached out to, because many of them were relatively small, that might be um, a good use of, of their time and or making sure they have the written material when they're going uh, going face to face with businesses to leave that, you know, a flyer with them, if I could recommend those steps. Sure, thank you. We can look at implementing those things. Thank you. And then the second question I had is, um, I'm just, I'm curious about this, and this may not be an off the top of your head question, but I'm curious, um, what do we charge when we adjust weights and measures, like for grocery stores or gas stations or any of that? It's about uh, $200 a year. And is that, um, will that be covered in this program for the small businesses? No, those aren't per, their device registration fees in um, our agricultural department. So we did not include those. I think um, just as a as um, perhaps an informational request would just be if we did cover the same scope of businesses, you know, from a size perspective, um, what would the the cost impacts be? And you know, I, I'd be curious about that. Okay, yeah, we can do that in an off-agenda report. Perfect, thank you. All right, we've heard from the public. We've heard from the two supervisors here. I don't see any other hands. Nancy, a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Allenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes, and Joe, if you're still there, I wanted to thank you and all those in your Department of Environmental Health for all that they do for businesses in Santa Clara County each and every day. I've often received compliments from business owners who've had visits or communications with your staff members and said they were professional, helpful, educational. Um, you're, you have such a, a myriad of departments under you. Um, I, I just appreciate the diversity of departments that, that you manage. Good, good work, Joe. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, board members, that was item 18. Item 19 was held previously. Item 20 we dealt with previously. 21, I said we were gonna hear last, but let's take it now. And then our last item will be item number 43, which was pulled from consent, I believe, by Supervisor Simidian. So you'll kick that off at that time. We now go to item number 21. And bear with me one second here, please. Item 21 is the anticipated impact report on security cameras for the alcove. And we have uh, Sherry Terrell, our Behavioral Health Services Director. Actually, uh, Supervisor, I think uh, the question here was about um, the surveillance options, so. Oh yes, in the inside, outside, wiring, et cetera. Right, so we have Rob Coelho to be able to answer Supervisor Simidian's question. Supervisor Simidian. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, that uh, working during the course of the day, we've been able to find a, a solution here. And if I may, through the chair, just ask Please. Mr. Coelho to uh, help walk us through it. Uh, one of the challenges we had earlier today was that there was no um, surveillance policy uh, in, in place. And my understanding is that staff has uh, identified a uh, uh, surveillance policy already in use by our county uh, for a, another venue and is prepared to essentially say, we can use this uh, policy, but with Alcove obviously uh, uh, substituted uh, in the policy. Mr. Coelho, do I have that right? Uh, you essentially do, uh, Supervisor. There There's is a part of it that's not essentially uh, or even non-essentially right. Please do clarify and correct. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon. Um, on October 22nd, 2019, the board approved a surveillance use policy for security, security video cameras at uh, Santa Clara uh, uh, County uh, Health and Hospital System facilities. In fact, that's what it's called. The cited issue is uh, part of the HHS system. And so the existing board approved surveillance use policy uh, would, and administration confirms, uh, be one that would apply uh, to that facility if the board approves that as part of today's agenda. So what I would suggest that the board consider as, um, as essentially uh, recommended action item D under item 21 is uh, moving to approve that the existing board approved use policy for HHS facilities apply to the Alcove Center security cameras. Uh, during the break uh, between when this was called this morning and now, we asked the clerk of the board to upload that item as part of this agenda. It is uploaded as item 21C so that the public can view the already board approved use policy. The board can look at that as well and feel satisfied that the essential provisions that the board's already approved for other health and hospital facilities would apply here, including supervisor, the um, annual auditing provision that is in section 10 of that board approved policy. And I know you made a reference to that as it related to item 20, it's already in this board approved policy. And so that addition would not even need to be made here. And through the chair, just to clarify, Mr. Coelho, we're talking about uh, using that policy as well as the uh, surveillance impact report uh, and um, for, uh, and the findings of benefits, uh, cost benefits, only with respect to the outside camera at this point, yes? That's my understanding of what the board was uh, teeing up for discussion this right. morning, and, and that would be the scope of the motion that I All would right. anticipate. I, I would, uh, you anticipate correctly, because I'm gonna make that motion uh, through the chair, if I may. Uh, we'll use the uh, policy as you have described it and attached it. Uh, it will apply only to the outside camera. Uh, that applies, that limitation to the outside camera applies to the anticipated surveillance impact report uh, and uh, to uh, the cost benefit finding. Um, and after I get a second, I'll speak just, to, if I do, I'll speak uh, to it just a little bit more, Mr. Chairman. Sure, Supervisor Chavez, do you want a second or I will? Sure. Thank you. And uh, the reason I was being as explicit as I was about the anticipated surveillance impact report applying only to the outside camera is because it, it sounds like both Supervisor Chavez and I won't speak for her, of course, but we both voiced concerns earlier uh, about that inside camera. I, I thought that was a place where, frankly, the uh, anticipated surveillance impact report did not address uh, those concerns the way it might have, and in my view, should have. So I hope that if it ever comes back to us again, it will. Uh, to everybody's credit, that the issue was raised and sunshined in the report from uh, Ms. Torreo. So um, thank you for that. But uh, I also want to be explicit in the motion, uh, Supervisor Chavez, that uh, the wiring may go forward, but cameras will not be placed inside the facilities without that uh, item coming back to our board if either one or both of the facilities thinks that's advisable uh, at some point and that that would be a separate determination. That is my long-winded motion for the afternoon. 
Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. And I'll second it. I, I do just want to acknowledge, I think on the key site, there are more than, there's more than one external camera. So this would be inclusive of all external, external. cameras. Agreed. And then second, I would like to include um, uh, staff giving us uh, a report back on the safety door um, uh, issue that I raised earlier today. And Supervisor Simidian, it, one of the, um, one of the concerns I had about the co-location, which I raised with staff, um, was that there there are a number of there's a there are some we're having some uh, safety challenges in that area right now, and um, you know oh maybe uh, Jeff, did you have a response to that Draper Jeff Draper? I just saw his hand up. No. Oh okay. Uh, uh Yes, I do. And we will be able to complete the safety door uh, buzz in uh, mechanism before the projects are completed, so to speak. So we're good. Great. Thank you. That that makes me feel a lot better. I, I just wanted to say that um, the staff informed me of the location. I raised concerns about the uh, safety of the site. Um, for this use, rec but recognize that it's also an area that that um, has a high need. And so I, I will look forward to better understanding um, if there are other safety improvements that need to be made. So in any case, I'm happy to second the motion along with the, um, the improvements to the door with a confirmation that there may be more than one external camera and that the buildings will be wired, giving us the option if necessary. Thank you. For sounds, sounds good. Thank you very much. And before we take a vote on the motion by Sumidian and second by Chavez. We have one member from the public, Nancy, for two minutes. Yes. Our speaker is Stephen Adelsheim. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, I'm Stephen Adelsheim with the uh, Stanford Psychiatry Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing. And I've been working with this wonderful group of people from the county and many of you supervisors on the uh, ALCO program now for a number of years. I, I just want to say how grateful I am to all of you for coming up with a potential solution that I think many of our young people also will be very supportive of in terms of uh, having the safety of the outside cameras and the potential to explore um, how the facility will be used over time and come back and review the necessity of the indoor cameras within that flexible space. And uh, I think many of us are just grateful that you've been able to come up with this interim solution and hopefully it will just add to a level of comfort for all of our young people and families as they utilize this critical space. So we just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Stephen. All right, that concludes our public speakers. So we have a motion on the floor and a second. I don't see any other supervisorial hands raised. So Nancy, if you'll take a roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. And that brings us board members to our final item of the day, which was pulled by Supervisor Ellenberg. Earlier today, it's item number 43. And just for the record, it's consider rec recommendations relating to fiscal year 2021 budget process regarding the workshop schedule, budget related request for information process, and budget modification inventory item process. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you very much. I will be, I think, very quick. Since I've joined the board, I've asked administration to make our budget process more transparent and friendly for the public. And I'm really pleased to see that we've done a good job in reforming the inventory process, um, moving toward a, a more transparent budget. But I was disappointed and concerned that there are now new processes to the budget participatory portion that we as a board have not been able to weigh in on. Um, through the chair, Dr. Smith, can you explain why we are removing the past practice of transmitting the proposals through the board's five policy committees uh, and moving to an off agenda? We did this uh, last year at the board's request. Uh, we can certainly change that 
if you'd like, um, but the problem is that uh, this year the department uh, proposals will not be, uh, very few of them will actually be in the recommended budget. So it um, will be spending a lot of time talking about things that won't be in the recommended budget. I appreciate that. I, I don't remember um, having done that last year, which is fine. Um, but but I'm curious to know if my colleagues want to maintain that policy. My my concern, just in general, although I understand that why it may or may not be be critical this year, but overall, I'm concerned that this action could really further reduce transparency and eliminate a critical step for board budgetary oversight um, at a at a committee level. But if my if my colleagues don't mind weighing in, if if you are comfortable keeping this at least for this year and then revisiting, I'm open to that. Um, but as, as you can hear, my my concern is overall increased transparency rather than decreased. Sure, Supervisor Chavez, then Supervisor Smith. Thank you. Um, I, I think that the, I, I don't recall the board taking the action to remove this. I will say that um, because of COVID, there were a number of issues that were raised by the staff in order to alleviate um, some bodies of work from the budget process. And I will also say that um, there were, I, I had significant disagreements with the staff about the budget process. So normally the, the letter on the budget process came from the board chair and I, I asked it to come from staff for exactly that reason. So what I, what I would just say is I, I think the process of departmental budget requests um, is still going through the the committees is actually very helpful um, because it's a good way for us, especially those of us who are on committees, to better um, understand what the needs from the department's perspectives are. And I think making sure that those are, are public is actually very uh, helpful. So I would like to still have them go through committee. Um, and I don't, I don't know, Supervisor Ellenberg, if you had other issues you were going to raise or if I should continue. No, that that was that was my question and the reason that I pulled the item. Thank you. Um, I I just have a couple of couple of more that I was interested in, and I'm I am a little bit um, concerned about the also the way the administration is recommending that we handle the Harvey Rose budget report, and um, what. What it appears this file is saying is that any policy or substantive recommendations from Harvey Rose would not be considered during the budget and that we would get the request off agenda on recommendations from Harvey Rose after the budget has been enacted. Uh, so first of all, let me just clarify, it, it, do I understand the, the recommended process from staff? Dr. Smith. Um, no, we always consider the Harvey Rose uh, reports during, before the adoption of the final budget. Um, we can clarify that in language to make sure that that's true. Pre President, oh, sorry, President Wasserman, if, yes. if you want, I can speak to that as well. This is Greg Ituria, County Budget Director. The, the intent is for us to, to have a, a response to to all of the recommendations from the um, management auditor. There's just a note that there may be some significant complex operational changes, uh, programmatic changes that could be uh, proposed by the management auditor, where in an overnight, uh, you know, return uh, with with a administration response, um, you know, may not be complete, and where additional time may be needed. To do a good research uh, uh, for the for the board and to be able to come back. So the intention isn't to not address it. It's just recognizing that sometimes there's a complex uh, proposal that uh, requires some research for the board to be fully informed of operational and, and uh, impacts. Thank you. So, that's helpful. Um, so two recommendations that I, I would just want to make sure that we're considering. One is that um, I understand this would not, your recommendation is not to change the the current practice. Is that accurate? That's correct. correct. 
Yeah, okay. The intention is to keep the same practice that we've had here for, for many years in a row. It, it's just trying to be transparent about uh, sometimes there's a complex proposal that requires some study. So in that instance, what I would recommend is that that the response to the board um, come back with the scope that, it, that the staff has to consider instead of just having it come off agenda and that it be assigned directly to a committee if it can't be considered as part of the budget. Because normally if, um, if, the, if our auditors, and by ours I mean the, you know, the board's auditors are making a recommendation, um, then that can't be considered as part of budget for any reason, but it comes up as part of that process. I wanna make sure that it's reviewed carefully. And it may make sense to have those audits either go to, to whatever the appropriate committee is or go to FGOC. Uh, but I would not want them just to be handled in an off agenda matter, manner and I'd still want a scope response that says, here's what the scope is and here's when it would be coming back. But again, I'd be interested in what my colleagues think is useful. Thank you. We can refer it back to FGOC as part of the budget action. So the board would see an initial response and a scoping of a complete response and a timeline um, but refer it to FGOC for final action. That's helpful, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, just to clarify that last point, uh, forgive me, Supervisor Chavez, were you talking about the Harvey Rose uh, response, not the inventory item anymore, which had I was, been? Yeah, I was speaking about um, the Har Harvey Rose, uh, Har the role of Harvey Rose in our budgeting. Yeah. Let me let me just say, and I, I think this is consistent with Supervisor Chavez's comments. Uh, I, I think I think it's important that the Harvey Rose organization play a robust role in evaluating our budget. Uh, I think that's a, a key assignment for them. It's one I personally value as a board member. I know those can be um, hard conversations, in part just because there's some difference of opinion. Uh, and, and in part because they're hard, they're complex. They, uh, you know, uh, uh, they are interminable on the one hand, on the other hand, kinds of conversations sometimes. Uh, that being said, I think they're important. So uh, I did want to underscore that. Uh, going back to the inventory items, and I, I, I may regret this, but um, two things. One is I, I don't have strongly held opinions about whether or not they should go through committee or simply be submitted by a date certain uh, with um, an off-agenda report. Uh, Dr. Smith, let me just confirm with you, if it was an off-agenda report, our current practice is that off-agenda reports are uh, available online to members of the public, yes? Yes, all off-agenda reports are available online. Yeah, so uh, I, that being said, I'm, I, I'm sure someone would uh, opine that they're probably not uh, all that... Um, typically accessed by members of the public, nor quite as uh, transparent as when you put it on a, a committee agenda. That being said, my experience colleagues over the last several years and different colleagues may have had different experiences depending on the committees is that the committees pretty much uh, had the items on uh, their agenda, typically put them on consent. That was a, a, a good way to sunshine them, I think, but uh, I, I personally uh, don't think that committees have worked uh, as a vehicle to um, provide uh, deliberation, consideration, modification. Uh, so I think it's really just a question of uh, how you make sure that these things get sunshined. Um, and, and here's the part that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm just waiting to see what my colleagues have to say. We, we had quite a lively conversation uh, last year about um, whether or not there should be limits on inventory items or whether uh, we would go into the process without a established uh, dollar amount limit uh, and just let uh, projects stand on their own. Uh, I know different colleagues had uh, different views on the subject. Uh, as I read it, Dr. Smith, Mr. Aturia, through the chair, right now there is no stated dollar limit on inventory items. We're all just left to our own best judgment in terms of what we would propose and ask our colleagues to support. Is that correct? In this particular budget uh, process suggestion, staff has not 
recommended a limitation. The board has adopted an ad hoc committee or informed, I should say, an ad hoc committee of supervisors Ellenberg and Wasserman who are tasked with deciding whether there should be a limit or not and making a recommendation to the board. That's a separate um, issue from the budget process. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, for you or for uh, Supervisor Ellenberg or anybody else, I I had understood that uh, committee to be looking at the sort of the issue of sponsorships. Uh, I, I, I think if it does apply to inventory uh, items, uh, that was something that just went past me candidly. Uh, but uh, I don't know what the content and uh, calendar is of your deliberations. And I do think we um, want to get this one sorted out uh, well in advance so that all five board members know what the rules of the road are, can comply with those rules of the road, and also to help uh, community groups who are trying to figure out um, how they can access the system. So why don't I stop there having stirred this issue up and see if somebody else wants to wrap their arms around it. Thank you. Supervisor Ellenberg and I, uh, we have conferred. My plan is we bring forth something next week. I'll turn to Supervisor Ellenberg now. You're muted, Thanks. Vice President. There you go. I am? Now you are. You're okay. Okay. Um, first, just to, uh, to respond to something that Supervisor Smidian was saying a, a few minutes ago, I just want to make clear that when I brought up the, the committee budget review issue, I was talking about departmental budgets um, only. I'm not sure if that was clear. As was I. I wanted okay. to just make that point. That that's okay, what great. Doing. Thank you. It was clear to me when, when I was listening to you. Um, but also, uh, Supervisor Simidian, to your question, um, no, we hadn't included the inventory um, discussion. The, the, our, you all directed us to look at the sponsorship referral. So that was all we did. Um, but it is my understanding that last year, it was a one-time decision. Um, because I think that was the best we could we could get past. It was a it was a one year uh, limitation on items, presumably with the hope that we would come back this year and say that worked, we can live with it, or that was terrible. Um, but now it's not on the agenda, so I don't know if we can talk about it now. But certainly, we should make a decision very very soon. Yes. Ruben. We'll have a draft ordinance coming to the next board meeting. With the... Um, the, the sponsorship item. Right, but with, with the inventory item as well. I didn't think that was part of our direction. You and I have not spoken about that yet. Right. But I think keeping it the same as last year, but I don't want to get too off topic here of what's agendized. So I, I think you and I should probably confer as, as we are, we're empowered to do. Okay, we'll use our power. Thank you. We're good. <laughs> Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, your hand raised? Yes, my hand was raised, sorry. Thank you. My mute was on. Um, oh, okay. Just uh, two things. One is um, maybe I misunderstood, but um, when I understood the subject matter for the subcommittee, it was sponsorships and grants. And since the board has decided that we're gonna do grants as part of a referral, what was typically called um, inventory items and then referrals for ongoing items, I was understanding that that was gonna be included. But certainly from a staff perspective, we're not gonna put limits on grants or inventory items. That'll be up to the board to decide Thank Secondly, you. and we're bringing um, a referral forward for that, Dr. Smith. I'm sorry. And we are bringing a referral forward for that. Okay. And then, secondly, in terms of bringing the um, department recommendations to the subcommittees this year, I do want to remind the board that um, very few of the department recommendations will be actually part of the in. Regu recommended budget. So there is the possibility of spending a lot of time on things that won't end up in the budget. And since we asked for $60 million of reductions, 
the proposals can consider reductions that we won't actually be um, recommending in the final budget. So there is uh, certainly high potential for confusion this year, but obviously we'll do whatever the board wants us to do. Thank you. I don't see any other hands raised. I believe we had two additions that came from supervisors Chavez and Simidian that dealt with going through the committees and having the Harvey Road response at FGOC. I am afraid I don't recall if I had a motion to that effect or not. From I would make that as a motion. And the motion would be to include the departmental budgets coming to subcommittees. And second, yeah. that Harvey Rose be treated the same as always. And if there's going to be um, something that leads past the budget, that the scope of work and the timeline come to the board before the end of budget and the outcomes of those go to FGOC. Thank you. I'll second that. So we have a motion by Supervisor Chavez, a second by Vice President Ellenberg. We look to our speakers. We have no speakers in attendance. If there's nothing else to say, I'll ask Nancy to call a roll call vote. I don't Supervisor. Thank you. Go ahead, Nancy. I'm sorry for the interruption. No problem. Supervisor Lee. I'm really sorry. Yeah, I. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. I as well. Supervisors, that brings us to the end of today's calendar. If I look on my calendar, our next meeting will be on Tuesday, March 23rd. I expect sunshine and more vaccines by then. Is there <laughs> anything else that any of you wishes to add? Thank you. See thank you, everyone, and thank you, Nancy. We'll consider this meeting adjourned at 5 10 p.m. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Night. And that concludes this meeting. This room will be closed.